If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 76 Chapter 17 Shadow over Rurik's Dead Part 4 A short search leads me toward a very worried and panicked-looking Loker. He is looking around frantically, practically shivering, and the moment he spots me he lets out a long sigh of relief. I place a finger over my mouth and signal him to follow me. We make our way to the gate where in one of the dark corners Iraleth and three of her colleagues wait for us in full combat gear. I take a moment to look at the house Carls. Two are tall Nord men, one with grey hair yet still vigorous and the other a bearded blonde, the last one is a young woman who I recognize as Lydia. Evening gentlemen. I say and quickly add with a nod ladies. Iraleth smirks slightly you came quickly, good. I nod yes. Allow me to introduce Loker. He will be our guide tonight. Said Nord bobs his head, still panicked but to a lesser degree now why yes I will show you where they usually go, just please make sure they can't hurt anyone else. The grey-haired house Carl smirks viciously oh you don't need to worry about that. They won't be hurting a fly from now on. He then turns to me and offers his hand in honor to fight beside you flame tongue. I accept the handshake and say Riley while I can see you are quite the warrior and the honor of fighting together is evident I am afraid we were never introduced. He guffaws oh, no need to be so polite. We house Carls avoid entangling ourselves with visitors. I can see how that would be wise. I nod to myself. Name's Adar Greymain. He says and points an open hand to his other male colleague this here is Ungrim Battleborn. We share a polite nod. Adar then points to the last one present and this here is Hrongar's kid, Lydia. I turn to her with a raised eyebrow is it really wise to have you come with us? No offense, but I don't want to spend half the battle trying to not get Hrongar pissed at me. Iralith palms her face lightly while the other two house Carls chuckle. Lydia's face grows red and she almost shouts I earned my place here. I can fight better than you, elf. I raise my hands placatingly while keeping my smirk oh yes, but you can also yell while we are trying to be stealthy. Her face becomes even more red. Real mature there. I snort. I am not a child. She fumes. Oh yeah, I can see that. I say dryly while visibly checking her out. I think the poor woman might die of embarrassment but my teasing is interrupted by Loker's light cough. We all turn to him and he says shakily excuse me, but could you please save your flirting for when you are done with saving my wife's life. Irelith takes this opportunity and quickly cuts in yes, lead on please. He quickly leads us outside the town and toward the hills to the south. During the entire walk, I can sense Lydia trying to burn me to death with her glare. Oh she is fun. Loker leads us further into the hills and we soon enter a sparse woodland. We start making a lot of noise by stepping onto leaves and twigs but I soon solve that problem by casting a muffle spell on everyone. You sure you should be wasting magicka right now? Ask Sungrim Battleborn I ain't a mage but I know you lot become quite useless without it, no offense. He quickly adds. I wave him off don't worry, I am quite capable of fighting in melee and I am not known as a respected enchanter for nothing. He raises an eyebrow I know that much about you, but I don't see any items on you. I smirk and snap my finger theatrically, suddenly replacing my mundane clothes with my full regalia and staff I can't really be walking around a town wearing this while trying to blend in now can I? I ask jovially. He smirks back and nods I, excuse my curiosity. You are excused. I say overly pompously and we share a chuckle which is joined by Grey Mane. Loker soon stops and points us to a narrow passage carved into a hill this is the furthest I ever followed them, I once took a peek inside and it looked like some kind of grove. Thank you for your help. I say and then ask are you capable in a fight? He shivers and quickly shakes his head. Understandable I nod and pull out a potion of regeneration. He looks at me confused and I explain in case we die and your wife is having issues, this should save her life. He thanks me and runs off. We all stand in silence while looking at the entrance. That's a good thing you did. Greymane says with approval in his voice. 
can't have him doing anything stupid I shrug. There is realization in his eyes as he nods ah I see. What is the plan? I ask Irelith. The Nords will go in front. She says slowly yet decisively I will follow behind them, and you will be in the back. I will focus on assisting while you provide long-range support. Ungrim clutches his heart dramatically oh Irelith. How could you be so cruel as to use your friends as meat shields? The Dunmer woman merely rolls her eyes and almost as if just remembering her, says Lydia, you will be behind Revine guarding his back. The young house Carl goes from merely annoyed to furious what? I can fight, why would I hide behind the mage? And if said mage is tied up in melee we are all at risk. Irelith says evenly. A dark cuts in don't worry about us lass. You are still young and shouldn't risk your life like us. Ungrim merely grunts his agreement. Lydia lets out a defeated sigh and positions herself behind me. I smirk behind my mask oh the woes of being young. She goes to respond but a raised hand from Irelith and her serious expression halts her. The senior house Carl says the time for jests and levity is gone, prepare for battle. We all quickly gather ourselves and prepare to delve into the Didric Shrine the feeling of anticipation making my heart dance in excitement. We slowly march into the grove, my spell work making sure that we aren't heard. The two Nords leading our formation are armed with shields and axes and seem to be used to moving together. It is really odd seeing those of their clans being this close, but the civil war hasn't happened yet so it shouldn't be all that surprising. We walk into the opening and what awaits is a sight of beauty. Think white bark trees grown in such a way to create a natural canopy of orange leaves, the ground below is covered in said leaves making it look like the most opulent of carpets. The site is unfortunately marred by the vile aura of the place, to my magical senses it felt like someone covered a beautiful painting in pitch. At the center of the clearing is a shrine made of rocks, made in the likeness of the old shrines of kine, but it is covered in didric symbols probably drawing power from the desecration. The twenty or so cultists immediately notice our approach, and Jowana steps in front of their group. The old Breton sighs I see that my spell had no effect. I scoff you know where you can shove that amateurish work. Yes, I should have known better. He goes on I guess you aren't here to join our peaceful congregation. I resist the urge to face palm, but this whole situation feels suspicious and I activate my third eye to see what is going on. I notice a flow of magic leaving the shrine and slowly suffusing the woods around us, before Jowana can continue with his distraction I yell he is buying time. And launch a fireball at the cultists. The Breton manages to protect some of them from my spell and snarls in my direction, obviously furious that his plan failed. Unfortunately, he did still buy some time as soon two corrupted sprig gans come out of the trees and start launching their noisy swarm-like spells at us and making me spend some effort on warding them off. The house carls waste no time and charge into the cultists, with Irela throwing lightning bolts and the Nords cutting through them like grass. Lydia ignores her orders and charges in as well. I am totally going to annoy her to death for that. The sprig gans press their attack and focus on me. Thinking quickly I summon Scorch and send him to attack one with his fire cloak and talons. Since when can birds cackle sadistically? I turn to the other one and shout wood appearing before it and spearing it with my staff, setting it on fire immediately. The creature dies within a couple of very painful seconds. I see Jowany rushing toward the shrine away from his overwhelmed followers, the house Carl's butchering them without a hint of mercy. I launch a lightning bolt at him but he abruptly stops, making me miss. He suddenly starts shaking and falls onto the ground, something leaves his shadow and rushes toward the shrine. I feel a hunch as to what that might be so I quickly launch a sunbeam at it and the shadow creature stops abruptly, soon turning into a black blob that starts growing and turning into a humanoid shape. I go to hit it with another burst of sunlight but suddenly a cultist throws himself at me out of nowhere and I am forced to fight him off. He dies within moments but alas, that is all the time that our true enemy needed. The black blob coalesces fully into what looks like a pitch black skinned human with two pairs of goat horns and far taller than even the house carls, with massive clawed hands and sharp looking fangs. The battlefield grows quiet, 
mostly due to all of the cultists being very dead, and we prepare for what is to come. The Dudra spreads his arms and speaks in a powerful and unnaturally soothing voice be welcome honored guests. To what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? Filthy demon! Adar shout and charges at him, but the Dudra sidesteps him and kicks him to the side while making it look like he was simply stretching. Rude! He goes to say something again but Irelith shuts him up with a lightning bolt and the house carls attack him again. Scorch who was finally done with ripping the Spriggan to bits starts healing the disoriented Adar, and I start launching lightning bolts of my own. The Dudra is fast, very fast. Every strike he dodges with ease and the spells do barely anything to him. I throw a bolt of sunlight, striking him in the chest and making him cry out in surprise while looking at the smoking wound. He snarls and throws a massive fireball at me but I merely smirk and cast resist element on myself making the fire feel like a morning breeze. The Dudra looks at me dumbfounded, and is surprised just for long enough to get axed in the face by a snarling ungrim. He swings his massive clawed hand at the Nord's head, but it is in turn impaled and stopped by Lydia. Unfortunately her heroic attack doesn't make her immune to physics and she is launched away by the force of the strike. I continue peppering him with sunbolts but even if they are effective he seems much too strong to be hurt meaningfully by my low-level solar spells. Getting an idea I yell out Irelith, I need him distracted for a while. Irelith is POV. I hear the sorcerer's request and almost start cursing him then and there. Distract this thing for a while. I guess there is really no choice, I yell a hurry up, back at him and continue pressing the attack. I swing for the creature's arm and manage to cut it while Adar stops another of its swings. It strikes back at him, hitting him right on the shield with enough force to make a crunching sound come from the hand holding it. Ungrim quickly intervenes and strikes at its legs. The creature kicks him away and attempts to stomp on Adar's head, as he was clutching his broken arm. An arrow hits the Dudra, and I turn quickly to see Lydia who had pulled out her longbow. I cannot hold back my smirk at seeing my student stand bravely against a strong foe. I prepare to stab the thing one again but instead hear Ravine shout now. Ravinza's POV, just when he asked for time. I pull out a potion of extra magicka, and one to empower my restoration. I summon up all of my reserves and start constructing a magic circle once again, fitting every possible rune of power I can think of, not even trying to make the spell efficient. As the spell itself is finished I focus on the desire to purge this filth from the world and channel all that into my spell, further focusing it. And just because I am feeling a tad cruel I add a Dovahzal rune of Shul for good measure. I signal Irelith and focus on my enemy. Wood. I appear in front of him and point my blindingly glowing palm at his heart. He has a moment to realize what is going on before my spell explodes outward blinding everyone present and causing the Dudra to scream in unimaginable pain, said screams last for but a moment as he is turned to dust. Chapter 77, Chapter 18, Shadow over Rurik's Dead, Part 5 Slash Finale I feel like a flashbang just went off in front of my face, combined with the sudden expulsion of so much magicka I almost pass out on the spot. Thankfully I have been through a similar experience so many times at this point that I managed to pull out a potion on reflex and down it in one long swig. A wave of relief hits me and I lay down on the ground with a contented sigh. Wah what an oblivion was that. I hear the pained voice of Adar to my left. The spell or the demon. I snark. Yes. He deadpants, making me snort. I slowly get up from the ground and approach the Nord who is still clutching his arm. Wordlessly I start casting a healing spell on him and he mutters a thanks. Ugh I hear to my right and turn to see Irelith getting up, she shakes her head and breathes deeply in an attempt to clear her vision. She looks the battlefield over and asks are you certain that the Dudra is defeated? I can see why she is the leader of the Jarl's guard, not letting her guard down even now. I finish healing Adar's broken arm and take a look over the place. It seems like the Dedric aura has all concentrated on one spot, leaving even the desecrated shrine clean of its influence. The only thing remaining from our foe is a blackened skull, still bearing the massive horns of the creature, 
and in this skull is held its remaining power, likely awaiting the next time it would reincarnate. All is clear I say and while the rest are catching their breath I walk cautiously toward the skull. Equals 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 equals. After making sure there is nothing nefarious waiting for me I grab the skull and am once again encased in a vision, I do not worry however as I learned that the Didra cannot really do much when projecting like this or I would have been eaten alive when Namara tried to influence me. In front of me in a fetal position lies a tiny satyr shivering in fright, he looks at me with fearful eyes and I feel a tiny influence in the back of my head attempting to make me pity the creature. I roll my eyes and ask are you trying to insult me at this point? The satyr scoffs and gets up slowly, he looks me over with a mischievous expression and shrugs it's just a little prank, no need to get mad. Right. I drawl and was making Rurik sacrifice people to you for thousands of years also a prank. He nods enthusiastically yes, my best one yet. Yeah, I am so killing this bastard. He raises a finger I would like to offer you a deal. I feel like punching him in the face, but I might as well humor him before I ruin all his hopes and dreams. I wave my hand as if to say go on. He smirks my master the great Clavicus Vile can offer you much for letting me go. He clasps his hands conspiratorially all you need do is tell them I am dead and my master will offer you whatever you wish for, even immortality. Never in my life has my bullshit censor blared this loudly. At first, I pretend I am tempted and see his eyes gleam victoriously, but then my mouth distorts into a disgusted sneer I think I have a better idea. A hint of worry appears in his eyes and I pull out Mephila's pendant. Suddenly the vision is overtaken by a sea of spider webs and we both hear chittering behind him. He shivers in absolute terror. My face is overtaken by a vindictive grin, I might not be the biggest paragon of virtue in the lands but these kinds of creatures are something I always hated in stories and now in my new life, and seeing the pure terror he is now showing makes me more contented than even my small mountain of gold back in Winterhold. Have few and I say in a sing-song tone. Wait. No please. No 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 he is covered in a massive horde of spiders and devoured. I hear a purr in my ear you give me the nicest things and am once more back on Nirn. Equals 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 equals. I quickly stuff the skull into a bag and turn to the others. They all seem to have their wits about them again. Adar and Ungrim are going around checking if anyone is alive. Irelith and Lydia are busy tying up the surprisingly still breathing Jowani. Remembering Mephila's words about something useful waiting for me here I search around the edges of the grove. I quickly find a small cave at the opposite end of the passage and after making sure there isn't anything dangerous inside I enter. The cave is small and mostly empty, save for a medium-sized old chest, looking it over I feel a bright almost blinding aura. Please don't be what I think you are going to be. I approach the chest and open it cautiously, and what I see inside almost makes me weep in pure despair. Why Mephila? Why must you curse me so? It takes me a couple of long minutes to accept my fate. I let out a determined grunt and grab the accursed item waiting for me. The moment I touch it an incredibly loud voice blares in my ears a new hand touches the beacon. Balgru LF's POV. As soon as we see the gates open and quickly close once again, signifying that the rest have left for the shrine, we burst into action. Throng R and I leave the house and head toward the lodgings provided to my guards, the Dunmer agent left by Ravine disappears from sight but my gut tells me he is nearby. The guards seem confused when we arrive to wake them up, but I quickly explain what must be done and they all get ready in moments. Once everyone is armed and armored we burst into Rurik's home, my men detaining everyone inside. I walk into the central room and see the leader of this town sitting on his chair, sharpening his blade, he looks up at me and there is a hint of realization in his eyes. Despite this, he still decides to pretend why are you attacking my home Balgru LF? I have always followed your law without question. You know what you did you filth. My brother shouts. Rurik scoffs and what did I do? Enrich your hold by providing a massive amount of food and wealth? Hunt down bandits and trolls that plagued your lands? 
should I apologize for doing so? Have you been consorting with Didrerik? I ask, sounding less tired than I felt. He sighs so we have been found out then. How did you figure it out? I laugh without any humor if it weren't for Revine traveling with us we would have noticed nothing, but the moment he approached the place he felt it. Rarik chuckles with mirth a yes, it would take one to know one. What do you mean? Asks Hrongar. The mage you traveled with also consorts with Didra he sneers. Wa wait, he is probably trying to do as much damage as he can out of spite, I will not distrust my allies at the word of a traitor. I shake my head and say with steel in my voice your word means nothing Rarik, you have betrayed your kinsmen and will face the appropriate punishment. Such willful ignorance he grabs his sword and gets up from his seat very well, if you wish to kill me you will have to defeat me first. I unsheathe my sword and prepare for a fight. We stare each other down. Both he and I know that there is only one way this ends. Rarik gathers all his determination and prepares to charge, he takes a deep long breath. And suddenly collapses onto the ground. In his place stands Davos with a soaked cloth in his hand. We stare at him, dumbfounded and he shrugs boss said we need to kill them in a specific order, best not to risk it. I guess you are right. I deflate. So unmanly I hear my brother mutter to himself and thank all the gods that he didn't inherit the hold. Revines POV. As we are walking back to Rarikstead I think I hear something next to me. I turn to see Lydia trying to say something, but merely point to my ears and shake my head. She seems to get angry and stomps to the other side of the formation. Dear God's Meridia has no mercy. Finally after a bit more walking the potion I drank kicks in and my hearing returns. I let out a sigh of relief. Evine. Sorcerer. I suddenly hear from my side and jump away on reflex. Losing one of your senses and then having it back is incredibly disorienting. I see Ungrim looking at me worriedly you all right there. I nod and wave him off yet, just some backlash from overcharging a spell, no need to worry. It would take something like that to take down that big bastard. He agrees as we continue walking. Were your weapons able to do anything to it? I ask. He shrugs we did manage to cut it or pierce it but it seemed like it didn't even feel our blades. So physical resistance but no immunity I nod to myself. A dar cuts in it's really annoying that we need magic to deal with such creatures. You really don't I say offhandedly. Oh. Yet I nod just use silver weapons, they usually ignore didric or undead resistances. They both seem intrigued by the idea and we spend the rest of the walk discussing the best way to kill demons. We arrive at the town some time later to see a large crowd gathered in the center, with the guards making a circle to keep everyone away from the Jarl and the tied up Rarik. We are quickly let through just in time to avoid the townspeople who start panicking once they see the tied up Chawani. Is it done? Balgruelf asks. Irilith nods yes my Jarl. He nods gravely and turns to the crowd people of Rarikstead. They all quiet down and he start explaining what transpired. Every word he says seems to have been chosen after long deliberation and I am surprised at how well spoken he can be. Once he uncovers what Rarik and the rest have been doing the crowd almost goes feral, but he manages to keep the peace. Finally we get to the crux of the matter so tell me my dear subjects, is it worth selling your own for a bit of bread? Should I not remove the heads of these fools that dared sell out their brothers and sisters? The answer is the expected roaring condemnation. He approaches Rarik who is glaring at me for some reason and says Rarik of Rarik's dead you have been found guilty of the highest of treasons, the sentence is summary execution. Hrongar doesn't wait for even a moment and swings his great sword splitting the man's head from his body. The same thing happens to the now awake yet delirious Chawani. The Jarl turns to me and soon the crowd's gazes follow his own. I pull out the cursed book and lay it on the ground. A fire appears in my right hand and so ends the curse of Rarik's dead. I say dramatically to the crowd and set the book aflame. Quest completed. An ear-piercing scream erupts from the burning book, but only lasts for a moment. Everyone is quiet for a couple of long intense seconds, before the crowd erupt in cheers. 
another feast is prepared, even if the occasion was a somber one this time. We are once more seated in the local tavern, with everyone sharing drinks. This time, however, we can actually relax and enjoy the evening. Adar and Ungrim are busy telling the tale of our battle to everyone, leaving out how they basically butchered twenty townspeople of course. Lydia is currently getting a dressing down from Irelith while Hrongar is laughing his ass of at his daughter's suffering, a little bird might have told on her about her lack of discipline he he he. I feel someone tap my shoulder and turn to see Balgruelf offering me a pint of ale. I take it and clink it against his own. After a bit of silence he says you have helped my people twice already, I honestly don't know how to reward you at this point. I roll my eyes just do what we already agreed on and I will not complain even a bit. He sighs it feels too little when compared to what you did. I shrug if you are so insistent just help me out when I need it in the future. A favor then? He asks and I nod. As long as it isn't anything dishonorable you will have the aid of White Arun. He says after some more silence. My thanks I smile now enough of this serious talk, let us enjoy the feast. We share a toast and the night turns into a blur. The Jarl's entourage left the next day after the townspeople selected a new representative. I remained in the town for a couple of days to keep my promise to Loker. In the meantime I went to the grove and cleaned up Kine's shrine, since she has blessed me I might as well do something nice in return. The grove's aura now turned from the cold and gloomy feeling of Adidra to the welcoming embrace of nature. Resting there made me feel like a baby sleeping next to its mother. A couple days of waiting later, Loker's wife birthed their daughter without any complications. I didn't even need to be there but they still thanked me profusely and forced me to take at least some of their food with me. I said my goodbyes to everyone I met during my wait here in Davos and I set out on the road toward Dragon Bridge. Finally done with all of this didra business. If I never have to deal with this kind of thing again it will be too soon. I hear Davos grumble as we walk. I stop and turn to him with my most radiant smile. The poor mare merely whimpers. Chapter 78, Chapter 19, Solitude Following our scuffle in Rarikstead, Davos, and I spent the next two weeks in relatively peaceful travel. I say relatively because no matter where one finds themselves in Skirim, Getting jumped by starving wolves is a constant of life. At least they weren't cliff racers. The settlements we passed on our way north were mostly just smaller fortified homesteads or mining villages in the hills. They were all far more welcoming than their eastern cousins, clearly showing us the disparity of ideology between the two sides of Skirim. Asking around in the taverns I heard the usual complaints about changing grain prices or bandit attacks but what did worry me were the whispered rumors of a leader among the forsworn leading raids upon the Nords further to the west. Something told me I would be hearing a lot more of that. When we weren't walking, we spent our time hunting or talking with other travelers, merchant caravans were very common on the road we were following as it was the safest path from southern Skirim to solitude. One such caravan happily welcomed us when we arrived at a scene of them being attacked by a pack of wolves and dispatched the animals within seconds. We shared stories of our adventures and they of their trades and profits. Their reaction to me being a mage was at first rather confusing, if not unwelcome. Instead of the usual disdain a group of Nords might have, they were surprisingly respectful to me and I incidentally learned why. Apparently, mages were rather rare outside of a few select places, and if the rumors are to be believed we never really care enough to show ourselves outside of serving the local lords. I never even considered that fact as I was always surrounded by at least someone magical during my entire lifetime here, but it did make sense as using magic was a very complex and time-consuming practice, and that is without even mentioning the expenses. We happily joined the caravan when offered, and I spent the rest of the trip to Dragon Bridge reading up on E. Orland's rune-carving method while trying to perfect a spell that would allow me to move quickly using telekinesis without breaking every bone in my body. This had the neat side effect of improving my control, but the spell was still far off. The small town of Dragon Bridge was completely unremarkable, save for the eponymous bridge and a somewhat well-kept stone wall surrounding it. We said our goodbyes to the caravaners as this was their stop and left for solitude after a night of rest. 
I checked the map I got all the way back in the college and realized that we were minutes away from the city, even if it couldn't really be seen from here, but even though I couldn't see the place I could definitely smell it. We crested a final hill and what awaited on the other side was a sight both beautiful and disgusting at the same time. The beautiful fortified section on top of the hill looked pretty much the same as in the game, mostly because that wasn't the actual city but the noble section meant only for the most influential and rich. Below it, attached to the docks was the main district, or the industrial district as it was known. Here lived most of the actual citizens and it was also the place where trade was done outside of the biggest transactions. This part of the city was renowned for its ironsmiths and clothiers, making it one of the wealthiest places in Skiram and the province's center of exports. The docks themselves were a mix of orderly storehouses and colorful taverns, waiting to service the rowdy crews returning from another voyage on the Sea of Ghosts. Docked there were ships of all sizes, including a comparatively massive flagship of Skiram renowned across the lands as the Jagged Crown. And finally, the slums. The sprawling melange of houses and tents spreading all the way into the marshlands east of the city, housing all manners of people from Dunmer fleeing Morrowind in hopes of a new life, to destitute Bretons fleeing this year's attempt at a reunited Orsinium, and the most numerous among them the different Imperials and Nords whose families fled the places attacked by the Dominion and were since unable to return. The slums of solitude eclipsed even the Blue Palace in their fame, and not for a good reason. They were renowned throughout Tamriel as the place where hope goes to die and where one must fight for every grain to survive just another day. Prostitutes openly practiced their craft on the streets and the numerous orphans trained in the pickpockets' art. Among those in the know, it was rumored that the slums were the second headquarters of the Thieves' Guild. They were formed during and after the Great War from the fishing district when High King Torridge's father foolishly, or generously, depending on your worldview opened the city to all refugees that were seeking a new life safe from the Aldmeri Dominion. The administration was overwhelmed within months to the point that food could barely be distributed among the populace. This led to a rapid decline of order among the population and turned the hopeful settlement into a prison for the poor and destitute. After repeated failure to restore order, even the guards stopped any real attempts at pacifying the slums allowing them to form into a lawless cancer in the heart of Skirim. I heard about the solitude sprawl, but seeing it with my own eyes really does feel different I hear Davos mutter. I wrinkle my nose in disgust I am surprised they managed to not get pillaged by those living down there. At this point the walls are more to stop the poor from killing everyone than they are for invaders. Thankfully we won't ever need to go on there. Davos says, and then slowly palms his face in realization we will probably have to go down there won't we? We? I ask with a shit-eating grin and start walking toward the noble district. Davos looks like he wants to curse my entire family, but he is far too professional for that and he merely spends the rest of the walk grumbling about asshole noble kids. I approach the gate of the city, wearing my basic clothes as I didn't want to create a scene on my first day of work. A guard notices me and raises a hand halt. Who goes there? I say nothing and summon the papers given to me by Savos. He slowly approaches while another guard takes his place and starts reading. A part of me is surprised that he can read actual documents as most Nords learn only the most basic of words, but then again being a guard of the noble district might come with extra requirements. After a minute he says everything seems in order sir, welcome to solitude. I give him a grateful nod and unsummon the papers, much to their surprise. And head into the city. Just as we are about to enter Davos is stopped and the guard turns to me again he wasn't included in your invitation. I raise an annoyed eyebrow he is a retainer I hired on the road to solitude, just note him down as a servant and be done with it, I have been walking all the way from Winterhold and I do not want to spend another moment standing around. There must have been something in my voice he recognized as he immediately got to work and wrote something down, quickly handing the paper to Davos he said there you go sir, everything is in order now. I nod and summon a couple of bottles of mead for them thank you for expediting everything, have a drink on me. Both the guards thank me, but surprisingly leave the bottles to the side for when they are done with their job. Actual professionals, who would have thought? We are quickly let through the gate 
and almost as if by magic sniff no scratch that, definitely by magic, the smell of the slums disappears. The streets of Solitude's upper district are pristine, not a speck of dust out of place. The shops dotting the central street all seem to be more like noble homes than mere shops and the guards patrolling the place all wear armor that was given basic enchantments. I make a beeline to the local clothes shop named the Radiant Raiment. The door opens with a pleasant jingle and the Altmer woman waiting at the counter says in a dead tone oh, what a delight. Another charming customer. Well I sure feel welcomed Davos snarks from my side. I roll my eyes and say we are on our way to the Blue Palace and I need something presentable to wear colored in black and purple I point an open hand to Davos something for my retainer as well. She goes to say something but I raise a hand, a pouch appearing in it and greatly surprising her money is no object. I get a satisfied nod and ask if there was a proper barber nearby. She, now far more respectful directs me to her sister's shop a stone's throw away. Both Davos and I get a quick shave and I get my hair braided in a Nordic style, first impressions, and all. An hour alter our clothes are finished and I am pleasantly surprised by the finely embroidered noble suit that was prepared for me in such a short time, it consisted of pants, boots, a tunic, and a coat. I was also offered gloves but refused as I always found that ridiculous. Davos on the other hand now wore a butlerish suit, only more medieval looking, and let me tell you the mayor rocked the look with his now sharp goatee. We left the shop behind after promising to buy here again, much to the satisfaction of the owner, whose name I learned was Enderi. We headed deeper toward the Blue Palace. On the way we passed Castle Dewar, its courtyard full of men undergoing harsh elite training. After the castle came the Temple of the Divines, the center of worship for the imperial cult in Skirim, which also stood above the grand catacombs of solitude housing the city's numerous rulers. Finally we arrived at the heart of it all, the actual noble district. This part of the city was separated from the rest by another inner wall, making it a literal gated community. The only kind of house here was a manor, many of them larger than my own home in Winterhold. We made our way to the massive Blue Palace, and the seat of power in Skirim was indeed as resplendent as it was rumored to be. Beautiful blue tiles covered the different roofs, giving the monument its name. Most of the windows were made of stained glass and were works of art by their own. The view was quite breathtaking. Literally in Davos' case as I had to actually slap him awake to stop him from gawking for too long. Our approach was stopped by a guard wearing full plate Nordic armor, the enchantments of which were nothing to scoff at, he had us show our papers and we were let in without any issues. The inside of the palace was even more opulent than the outside. Beautiful vases from Hammerfell with paintings from the renowned artists of Weyrist, even the palace guards themselves were works of art as each armor was carved with a story of some heroic deed or another. I was woken up from my admiration for the place by shouting coming from the throne room, a nearby guard sighed and I gave him a quizzical look. He shook his head it's the Thanes meeting today, they always end up like this. Whatever you are here for it would be best to come back tomorrow. Well, I am here for the position of court mage so that is unfortunately not going to happen. I answer. I can practically feel the raised eyebrow from inside his helmet you flame tongue. I nod. An honor to have you here then. You might want to enter immediately then, could do something about the commotion if they are distracted by something new. I snort you speak as if they are children. He doesn't say anything but I can feel the smug aura coming from him. Shaking my head, I take a calming breath and push on the ornate door of the throne room. Let's just hope I won't get stuck in whatever political mess seems to be happening. Chapter 79, Chapter XX, Court I enter the throne room of the Blue Palace only to be completely ignored by everyone but the king and his guard who eye me for a bit, but don't otherwise react. The rest are still busy shouting at each other at an ever-increasing volume. I am starting to understand why the Greybeards might have decided to withdraw the voice from their people. I note a hint of recognition on the king's face so he must want to see how I will behave. Surprisingly prudent for the boy king. Taking a moment to look over those present I get a gist of what is going on here by doing what I do best, cheating without a hint of remorse. 
On one side there is a group of nobles under Thane Bryling, from my understanding they are the traditionalist faction of the city, well as traditionalist as one can be in the most metropolitan part of Skirim. They are the reactionaries to the other side, usually meaning that they don't really do anything but oppose any kind of change, which is a big no-no in my books. On the other are the influential merchants under Thane Arakur, the pragmatists as they like to call themselves, but that is usually just an excuse to exploit any opportunity to get rich, they are the Hlalo of Skirim, also a big no-no. I also notice a representative of the East Empire Company among them which has all manner of implications. My apparent new colleague, Sybil Stentor is sitting in her own corner, completely uninterested in what is going on reading a tome on some kind of restoration magic. Remembering a rather important detail about her, I decide to look her over. So this is what a vampire feels like? Not as dead as a lich but close, yet somehow still filled with life. Weird. She seems to notice the slight glow in my eyes and smirks but doesn't react otherwise. My musing is interrupted by Arakur shouting so you want us to just do nothing and let the entire city continue to rot just to save your fragile sensibilities. Bryling bristles at his words of course I don't want that, I just don't want you using this as an excuse to enrich yourself further by selling the people into slavery. He scoffs it isn't slavery. No one would take them otherwise. Oh, and the nice bonus you were offered has nothing to do with your sudden willingness to help the people. Bryling rolls her eyes. Irker takes a deep breath, seemingly counts to ten, and says patiently by the god's woman, it is merely a contract of work for five years and then they are free. How is that slavery? And when the contract gets lost on accident? She snarks. How am I supposed to control that? He shrugs, exasperated. I loudly cough to get everyone's attention, it seems to work as I am currently feeling the furious gazes of dozens of nobles on me. Naturally, I ignore them with zero shame and say in a faux polite tone while the debate is most riveting and my lowly self is inspired by your visionary ideas, I am afraid that my servant and I have travelled long to get here and would like to get our business done sometime this month. The king shakes his head, and Sybil has to keep herself from laughing at my audacity. Bryling's eye twitches, but she doesn't react hoping to get some dirt to throw at her rival, and he promptly delivers. The wealthy Thane slowly turns his head to me in some kind of childish attempt at intimidation and asks and who are you to force yourself into a meeting of the royal court? I raise an eyebrow if I wasn't supposed to be here, do you think I wow? You could be a servant and still get in. He interrupts me with a disdainful smirk. My eye twitches and I go to ignore the literal man-child, I turn to the king and prepare to give him the customary bow, but of course, it doesn't end there when spoiled nobles are involved. I wasn't done talking to you. Arakur snarls while getting up from his seat. Okay, if you can't take the hint I guess it is time for violence. I turn back to the fuming Arakur and whisper wood appearing right in front of him and grabbing his shirt. I look down at him with glowing red eyes and growl out slowly interrupt me again and I am throwing you out the window. He starts shaking in fright are we clear? I ask after a moment and he nods frantically. Good. I drop him and return to the center of the room as if nothing happened. The king's guard gives me a bemused look but still says no violence in the throne room you have been warned. I nod politely to both him and the king but of course, do excuse my behavior. I have been traveling for a month to get here and my patience has been strained by the land's dangers. Torij smirks yes, Balgru F did inform me of your deeds in his hold. Skirim is lucky to have you. It is my honor to be of service, King Torij. I incline my head. Excuse me. I hear Bryling's voice from behind me while it is obvious that the king is aware of who you are, it would be a great relief for the rest of us if we knew who was the one speaking. Oh, I can practically sense her own annoyance at my behavior, but she seems to have taken her etiquette lessons very seriously judging by her self-control. I smile without a care in the world do forgive my lack of manners, as I said it has been a trying time. She smiles thinly, but I can feel the glare at my non-answer. I smirk and mock bow revine flame tongue, high enchanter of winter hold. 
At your service, madam. She raises an eyebrow the tongue. I scratch my chin, hum, never really liked that title, sounds dirty. She blanches, but I hear Torridge let out a very quiet snort. Ericur has no such subtlety as he laughs loudly at my implication. Did he forget I just threatened his life or does he just not care? The young king shakes his head and says Revine here, has graciously accepted my invitation to serve as an extra court mage due to the turbulent times. He is renowned across Skyrim as a great battle mage and enchanter, so treat the newest member of the court with respect. The angry gazes turn calculating in mere moments, and the place starts to actually feel like the nest of vipers that it is. Deciding it is time to skedaddle I say to the king thank you very much for the introduction your majesty, but as I said we have travelled long and would prefer to get some rest before I can get to work. He gives me a nod of understanding of course, Sybil will show you the way. The court mage gets up from her seat, the book she was reading nowhere in sight, and signals for me and Davos to follow her. We exit the throne room and head toward the southeast of the palace. I think I saw a tower in this direction. My suspicions are confirmed when we reach a tall blue tower, otherwise featureless, making it highly contrast with the rest of the palace with its lack of artwork. My guide, a tall Breton woman with slightly glowing red eyes and long dark brown hair, finally speaks in a voice far too youthful for someone her age this is the mage's tower of the palace, both of you will be staying here for the duration of your employment. Do not fear there is more than enough space for everyone. She doesn't wait for any response and after opening the iron door leads us up a narrow circular staircase without saying anything. Once we are halfway up the tower she points to a small doorway and says patiently these are the servants' quarters, they were mostly left empty as I prefer to live on my own but the palace steward still had them cleaned regularly. Make yourself at home. Davos looks at me and I shrug. He nods and enters the room quickly making himself at home. We walk further and further up the stairwell. Please don't tell me that our rooms are all the way upstairs. I grumble. I don't see her face as she is in front of me but I know she smirks then I won't say anything. Why this? She giggles into her hand ah is the young mage too weak for stairs. Not all of us have nigh infinite stamina woman I snark back. She doesn't react at all and asks as if discussing the weather whatever could you mean by that? Did you see something I did not? Yup, she definitely noticed at least something. I smile brightly and ask whatever could you mean by that? Now it's her turn to grumble. I throw myself onto the floor, almost hugging it while breathing heavily. Oh come on, it wasn't all that bad. I hear from above me. I slowly sit up and lean onto a nearby wall wasn't all that bad? Woman I have enhanced myself far beyond the strength of an average person and that was the most grueling experience of my life. She shakes her head now you are just being dramatic. Yup. I smirk but this tower is still unnecessarily tall. On that we agree. She sighs but it does keep the annoying sycophants away. A worthy sacrifice then. I nod seriously. We both turn silent for a bit and I take a moment to look over my temporary home. There seem to be five apartment-like rooms encircling small hall. The rooms themselves seem very well equipped with everything a mage of some means might need. I turn to Sybil we have more colleagues. She seems a bit surprised by my question but quickly realizes what I am on about oh no, the rooms are kept furnished but I was the only resident for years now. That young Altmer. Melaron had the potential to join me but Ericur snatched him too quickly. Right, that reminds me. What do we actually do at court? I ask. She sighs listen to the fools bicker and then give a bit of advice when magic is involved. My face pales slightly and she smirks or that is what I have been doing, but with the rising tensions in the hold I expect we will be doing much more field work especially with the rumors of undead and forsworn rearing their barbaric heads. Oh yeah, fighting those might be fun I mutter. She hears me apparently as she asks fun. I shrug at, I may or may not have gotten addicted to fighting other mages. There is a hint of realization in her eyes as she gives me a look of a fellow victim oh, let me guess. Feral da taught you. 
I stare at her with dead eyes you as well. She seems to be going through some kind of episode but quickly snaps out of it and also says in a dead voice yes. After a bit more silence I decide to handle the most important question here how long have you served as court mage here? She hums about 25-ish years, why? I give her a blank stare you don't seem a day over 20. Her lips thin in annoyance is this going to be a problem? She asks frostily. I shake my head not if you don't make it one, just make sure you don't make a mess and I am not associated with whatever you end up doing. Try and show your fangs anywhere near me and I will show you how I earned my name, deal. She seems a bit conflicted, a part of her is very offended at the child that just dared speak to her like this, while another seems rather intimidated by my magical presence and fortunately the more rational part wins out as she sighs very well, it's not like I would be really changing anything anyway. Quite I drawl, and then clap my hands and ask with the subtlety of a worm or so. Care to tell me how vampirism works? Chapter 80, Chapter XXI, Vampires Sybil gives me a long blank stare and why, pray tell would I tell you anything about that? Because I asked nicely. I smile cheekily. She scoffs amusedly if you want to study vampirism I am sure there are many tomes back in Winterhold that would more than satisfy your childish curiosity. I wave her off ah but that wouldn't be coming straight from the source now, would it? It would be mostly interpretations and conclusions, nothing concrete. She doesn't seem moved by my thirst for knowledge I reiterate my earlier question, what do I get from telling you anything? I hum for a bit well, I am at least an adept in most schools of magic I am sure I could help you out in some way as thanks. She blinks how old were you again? Close to eighteen I smile. Then you must be lying. She immediately says. Now it is my turn to stare blankly at her why would I lie about something that is easily tested. Her annoyance with my apparent lie slowly turns into disbelief as the truth of my words rears its ugly head, one must merely feel my magical presence, if I let them, to know I am unnaturally powerful for my age you are attempting to become an archmage then. She asks after her some silence. Oh. I assure you it is far more than a mere attempt. I say dryly. In fact, that was merely the beginning, but she doesn't need to know that. Her gaze turns calculating at that statement, she doesn't shut my claims down immediately which implies she at least somewhat believes that I could achieve such a feat, meaning that having my favor in the future could be very useful to her. Clever girl. After some thought, she nods to herself very well. I don't mind providing you with the basics. Before I can give my thanks she interrupts in return, you will help me with an alteration spell, I have been having trouble strengthening my already empowered flesh with magic ever since I stopped aging. That seems fair. I nod of course, you scratch my back and I scratch yours and all that. A quaint turn of phrase if not an incorrect one. She hums and then moves toward her own chambers if we are to discuss I would prefer it not in the hallway with you on the floor. But of course, madam. I drawl and get up. What a polite young man. She coos foppishly and we share a chuckle. Her chambers are surprisingly bright for a creature of the night, containing a rather vast amount of artwork and other luxuries. Seeing my curious gaze she explains if one is to live forever they must find a way to enjoy the little things in life, you will find it harder and harder to rouse any form of excitement after a time. Sensible. I say as I sit across her at a very well carved table though I do have a bit of a leg up on that, seeing as we elves are wired to live a lot longer than humans. Wired. She asks with a raised eyebrow. I smirk explaining the deeper meaning of that would need a lot more than merely a lesson on vampirism. She seems curious but quickly lets it go now, tell me what do you know about vampires? I scratch my chin in thought, what did I know? A vampire is someone blessed by BAL, they are weak to sunlight and fire and do not age, in turn, they are immune to poison, and disease and are highly resistant to frost. I think for a bit more they gain a high affinity to blood magic and regeneration in most cases and there are multiple clans with differing powers. I hum and then shrug yeah, that is about it. 
she nods along with my explanation you are quite informed about the intricacies of vampirism, almost makes one wonder why you would even seek the information at all. I roll my eyes I wasn't asking about your powers, those are well documented. I was more curious about how a vampire functions, you know, how much must you drink, how vulnerable are you to the sun, how does vampiric aging work, and the like. Oh? Preparing for the future then? She asks intrigued. I shake my head no. While I won't question your life, or unlife choices for that matter. I personally consider vampirism to be one of the cheapest paths to immortality with far too many drawbacks. Her eye twitches, but she doesn't refute me. We spend the next hour or so discussing the topic, while also going over the known clans of vampires. Surprisingly, the Folkihar were the sole clan of Skirim, with almost every vampire in the province being of their blood, this also included Sibyl. Either Harkin keeps his domain under a tight leash or there is some other reason why the other clans tend to avoid this place. After the talk about the clans, we arrived at the one I was most interested in. So, how does vampiric charm work exactly? I ask curiously. She mulls it over for a moment and says think of it as a mixture of illusion and a drick blessing. You focus both onto your target and attempt to impose your will upon them, this too grows in power as a vampire ages. I raise an excited finger ah. So you take the concept of domination from BAL and focus it on the target with instinctual illusion magic, and if the target is too weak of mind they fall under your control. She gives me a dry look you got all that from a mere introduction. I pretend to stroke the beard I don't yet have and say while I don't like to toot my own horn. Her look turns drier than the desert I am pretty talented. I say with a sunny smile. Want to try it then oh talent of talents. She smiles challengingly. I immediately shake my head there is a border between curiosity and idiocy, so no thanks. She smirks too late. I am about to fight back but I suddenly notice just how beautiful her face is, those blood-red eyes. I could lose myself in them, truly this is something worth dy cease thine simpery. I blink and feel reality smashing back into my mind, only to see Sybil slowly approaching me. I sense that she only wished to teach me a lesson about arrogance so her punishment won't be annihilation, for now. Before she can react even with her vampiric reflexes I am standing in front of her and pointing a glowing golden hand at her face, quickly I move it to the side launching a sunbeam instantly disintegrating her left ear. She snarls in pain but seeing me with two additional spells prepared decides to stay put and merely glare at me. Slowly she calms down and I notice sharp claws retract into her fingers. While angrily while clutching the stump she snarls I wasn't even trying to do anything for Giuliano's sake. I smirk and drawl out while doing my best impression of a certain chancellor have you heard the tragedy of Master Duran of House Telvany? He too wished to play with my mind, and was met by a grisly end. Her eyes widen for a split second and she seemingly prepares for a fight. Before this can escalate further I deactivate my spells and shake my head if you were really trying to do something I would have turned you into fine ash already. Before she can sigh in relief I send her another glare do. Not. Attempt. This. Again. She swiftly nods and pulls out a bottle of what I guess is blood, she takes a quick swig and her ear starts reforming slowly, while she hisses in pain why did you have to use sunlight? To make sure the lesson sticks I shrug and she sends me a half-hearted glare. We sit in silence for a good while and I ask slowly I do hope this little altercation didn't ruin our possible cooperation. She shakes her head no, I should have known better but my curiosity got the better of me. I get up from my seat well then, my thanks for your hospitality but I think it best if we shelved our conversation for later. She nods stiffly and I leave for my own room. After checking up on Davos and seeing the mare happily dozing off on his new bed I made myself at home in my own room. The moment my back touched the luxurious mattress of my bed I felt the entire month-long walk hit me all at once and passed out near instantly. Almost as if woken up by an alarm, my eyes snap open exactly as the sun rises, my travels having made my internal clock rather robust at this point. I get up, 
much to the protest of my sore body, and go to wash my face. As I exit the bathroom still drowsy from waking up I notice a letter sticking out at the side of my door. I scan it, because paranoia for the win, and open it. They couldn't wait even a day hi? Hi Enchanter Revine Flame Tongue you are hereby cordially invited to join His Royal Majesty High King Torridge on a small banquet hosted in your honor this evening. His Majesty hopes that you will use this time to foster good relations with the rest of the court and find a way to work together. Signed, Ingvar Firebeard, Steward of the Blue Palace. Feels like I just got invited to team building. Well I can't really find any excuse not to go so I guess I will have to deal with a bunch of self-assured fops tonight. Joy. Before I start with my day I decide to finally check my progress since I left Winterhold. Unfortunately, I didn't really have the time to learn any new spells but I have been doing quite a bit of casting so hopefully that would have made me grow at least a bit. Dex, 16 equals 16.5. VIT, 19 equals 21. Mag, 280 equals 300. Whistle surprisingly good progress. The dexterity is evident as I have been getting faster at reacting to attacks due to all the fighting and the magicka also made sense since I have been overcasting like mad. But what the hell is up with that vitality? Did kind bless me again while I wasn't looking? I did fix up that shrine of hers after all. Shrug well not like I really mind being more resistant to death, that is always handy. All hail the wind mommy. I think I might be lynched by a mob of angry nords if I ever say that out loud. I cackle at the thought as I leave my room and head to Davos quarters. Chapter 81, Chapter XXII, Torage I walk down the stairs while humming one of those tunes you can't ever remember the name of but they still get stuck in your head anyway. I knock on the servant quarters door a couple of times and after a minute I hear grumbling on the other end. Not long after a tired and disheveled looking Davos opens the door and lightly glares at me couldn't wait a tiny bit longer boss. I give him a cheery smile come Davos, where is your sense of adventure? We are in the greatest city of Skirim, of course we are going exploring immediately. I think I hear him grumble something about over-energetic kids, but as the gracious lord that I am, I ignore his words and wait patiently for him to get dressed. When he is ready we head to the exit. On our way there I almost bump into a still drowsy Torage, his bodyguard right behind him. I quickly bow and say a pleasant morning to you King Torridge. He wipes the sleep from his eyes and mumbles yet, yeah, morning. While waving with his other hand. I suppress the urge to snicker and look at the bemused guard I don't believe we have been introduced. Balgir Bearclaw. Is all he says, his tone stiff but the bemused expression remains on his face. I guess that is all I am getting a pleasure. I nod politely. The king seems to have finally woken up, and after realizing that he just spoke to me he seems to get some kind of idea and says I was just going to get my morning coffee, you could join me if you wish. Naturally, I accept immediately finally someone with proper taste in these lands. I say proudly. He nods vigorously truly, the tea drinkers will use any means to suppress the one true beverage. Our two guards give us deadpan looks and we share a short laugh. He waves for me to follow him and I do so. We are led onto a terrace that gives us a perfect view of the entire city. Unfortunately, that view is spoiled by the massive slums, they really do look like a cancer from here. Torridge seems to notice my gaze and says melancholically truly a shame. What exactly is stopping the place from being brought to order? I ask, genuinely curious. The king takes a seat and I follow suit. He looks down at the city for a good minute before saying there are many factors, but the most pressing ones are the complete lack of trust from the populace and the gangs that seem to have established their own criminal governments. Why not just forcefully establish order? I already know the answer but that wasn't the point of the question. He sighs the death toll would be enormous and I refuse to be a king that slaughters his own people. Before I can respond a servant brings us our drinks and we take a moment to enjoy it. After taking a sip of some of the best coffee I have ever drank I continue my testing that is an honorable viewpoint, 
but do you not think that killing some now might be worth it if it meant saving everyone else in there? From what I hear living down there really shouldn't be called as such. He lets out a humorless snort you sound like Sybil. Then Sybil must be one smart woman. I smirk. He shakes his head and says while you are right that it would improve the situation it would also open us up to the criticism of others. Realization quickly dawns on me good old Ulfric would go right for the throat if that happened wouldn't he? Without hesitation. He says immediately and mumbles to think I once respected the man. He then decides to change the topic with a hand wave enough about that for now, I am curious, why did someone of your talent decide to accept this position? You could have stayed in Winterhold and just amassed riches and power for the next decade without anyone bothering you. I could have, yes. But what would be the point of that? He raises an eyebrow oh. I shrug staying in Winterhold was the safest option, yes. But I am young and I refuse to spend that time stuck in a room if I could be traveling to new places, learning new things, and finding new foes to defeat. He seems both surprised and slightly envious just like that. I nod seriously it is the reason I pursue magic after all, so I could do what I will. Not to mention the fact that I can use my considerable power to help people. He takes another sip of his drink and says at least your goals aren't entirely selfish. I shake my head oh trust me they are, it's mutually beneficial, I help people and they spread my name making it easier for me to make connections. He blinks and shrugs well as long as you are helping people I guess I cannot truly complain. His gaze then turns to Davos and what about your follower there? Why would he see a... Ah, I see. Hiding my smirk behind my drink I ask Balgruelf has already informed you of everything hasn't he? The king of Skirim quickly hides his surprised expression and nods with a wry look yes, he made sure to give me all the details he had on you, including your follower. Quite prudent of him. I say with genuine approval but you need not worry, I assure you that neither he nor I will do anything to damage your hold or your reign. There is a glint in his eye as he says I see you omitted the other nobles from that statement. I shrug if they play stupid games, then I cannot be blamed for awarding them stupid prizes. He doesn't seem to approve, but neither does he refute my words so I guess I will just have to make sure to watch my steps. After a bit of silence, the king asks since we are already here, would you mind telling me your opinion on the current state of the realm? Anything specific? I ask. Just your general thoughts, I am merely curious. Well, here it goes it doesn't paint a pretty picture honestly. He winces slightly the Concordat is attacking the people's traditions while Ulfric is rousing their rebellious spirits, and then there is the economic decline caused by the war. And let's not even mention our dear friends the Thalmer. All in all, it is a volcano waiting to erupt at any moment. He lets out a long sigh you got it all in one, what would you recommend? I raise an eyebrow you ask me for advice during our first ever conversation. He waves me off it isn't like I am giving out state secrets and you might have a different perspective. Besides, you are an advisor even if you are a new one. Hmm. There is an idea. You should get an heir. I say, completely serious. Balgir actually laughs from his spot near the door to the terrace, and Torridge visibly blushes and sputters how am I supposed to get an heir? I am barely twenty summers old. Well, that came out of left field. I stare blankly at him as if to say and your point. He flushes I am not even married for God's sake. My judging stare shows no mercy at his excuses. He slumps why do you even think that would be a wise idea? I decide to spare him from any further teasing until we become a bit more friendly, accidentally insulting a monarch is never a good idea. From my research into human history, the populace and direct subjects tend to be more content and trusting in their leaders when they have an heir. I do not know why this is but it is a mostly confirmed fact. I say in a lecturing tone. He blinks truly. I nod with all seriousness. He seems to be deep in thought but before I can guess at what he is thinking a wheezing sound distracts me from nearby. Balgir is barely keeping himself from laughing his ass off, there has got to be a story there. 
I slowly turn back to Torij whose face seems to be constantly shifting between embarrassment and determination. Oh, I get it now I see you already have someone in mind then. He coughs into his fist in an unsuccessful attempt to hide his blush and says yes, yes I do. Then what seems to be the problem? He shifts in his chair uncomfortably her father isn't very fond of me. I raise an eyebrow not fond enough to even deny his king. It doesn't work like that. He slumps deeper into his seat Harold Fairhair is a thane under my house that rules over my westernmost territories, he considers me an unworthy heir to my father and refuses any advances I make on his daughter. Then your path forward is rather simple. He jerks his head in my direction so quickly I feared he snapped his neck tell me of this path then. I blink, a bit stunned by his sudden intensity, and say are you aware of the rising tensions with the force worn to the west of your hold? He seems confused rising tensions? I was informed that there were bands of bandits wearing poor dress attacking people, not forsworn raids. Hmm, could someone be downplaying their impact or is it truly a false alarm? No. Savos wouldn't specifically say I was here for the Forsworn if that was the case. Time for a bit of a gamble during my journey here I heard rumors of a new leader among the Reachmen leading raids into the west of Hofinger. True, it could be just rumors and they are just bandits, but something tells me that this problem will inevitably escalate. His eyes widen for a split second but he composes himself, apparently only talk of his crush can really shake him you are certain of this. I shake my head as I have said, they were rumors. In fact, the Archmage said that I was specifically called here to assist the hold against uppity Reachmen, is this not why you requested another mage? His brows furrow no, I called for another mage due to the repeated sightings of undead and necromancers within the hold's borders, I had no idea about any force worn. I guess old Aaron wanted to play a bit of a prank with me. I shrug but the problem still persists and will grow if left unattended, he wouldn't joke about this. The king groans if it isn't one thing then it is another. Very well, I will send scouts to confirm your claims. It won't hurt to survey the surroundings in the best case scenario. I nod indeed, let us pray I was wrong. And what is this about necromancers? This is the first I am hearing of it. Your archmage really was pranking you then. He smirks as I have said there were sightings of undead and rogue mages to the north, but they haven't been doing much so we are observing for now. In any case, remind me to thank the archmage if your claims prove true. Of course. As eccentric as he is, he is mostly well-intentioned. Torridge scratches his cheek with a sheepish expression umm, not to sound uncaring, but how exactly is the forsworn situation helpful in me getting her Rick's approval? I blink well you obviously gather a bunch of your men, go smash the force worn to pieces and proclaim eternal glory for yourself while getting the girl. Isn't this how Nord culture works? I hear a snort from the king's guard and the young man has stars in his eyes yes, I must prove myself by defeating them with my own hands, it was indeed a very good idea to call you here. Out of context. I would have thought he just doesn't give a shit about the whole a bunch of cultists are attacking his people thing, but the poor boy is so in love it is blinding. He gets up from his chair in excitement. And where exactly are you rushing to? I ask carefully. He blinks well to hunt the forsworn of course. This is going to be a long couple of months, isn't it? Chapter 82, Chapter XXIII, Bards it took me an uncomfortable amount of time to convince the supremely enthusiastic High King that no, he cannot rush off to hunt random ass Reachmen right now. After calming down and realizing just how foolish he may have looked to a new important subject he made some excuses and left with his now very smug guard, the stoic man even gave me a grateful smile before he left. Now finished with that, in lightning meeting I left for the city to finally start exploring. My first destination was the Bard's College, and while I don't remember a thing about it from the game I was curious about how good the musicians were in these lands. Most I've listened to were traveling bards and my own hirelings, who were pretty good in their own right, just not virtuosos. The college was built in the same style as the rest of the noble district, 
which was honestly kind of disappointing but to be fair the hideout of the local artists didn't need to be wacky and creative to look good. As I entered I was surrounded from all sides by the echoes of different musicians practicing their instruments, and while some of them might have actually been good the unholy mixture that could be heard at the entrance almost made me summon Meridia's beacon so I can blow out my eardrums again. A bearded elf came through one of the doors just in time to see me wince, I could sense his irritation at the bad timing of my arrival as he approached me. He quickly takes on a practiced cheerful mask and greets me ah, Master Revine. He bows theatrically in honor and a pleasure to have the new court mage visit our humble college, I am Headmaster Viermo, at your service. He forces a win see I do hope that you don't mind the cacophony. Our students are rather vigorous in their exercises at this time of day. Well, at least the OLE rumor mill is still up and running. I return a polite smile the honor is mine headmaster. He nods and signals for me to follow him into another room. I continue while we walk though I am sad to inform you that I am not a master yet. His own polite smile cracks just a tiny bit and I hear him quietly mutter to himself yet I still feel as if you could crush me with nary a thought. That seems, untrue. The mare is obviously magically adept, not nearly as myself of course but enough to not get crushed instantly. He did recognize me rather quickly meaning it is probable he wants something from me, one look with my blessing tells me I am right but not exactly what it is that he wants. Might as well play along for now. How very perceptive of you. I say and he suppresses a win C.E yet now that I pay more attention it seems just slightly forced, as if he wanted for me to hear him. I continue playing along if you are able to tell that much then I take it you received some instruction in the arcane. His mood shifts and he looks up proudly indeed, our college prides itself in all arts, that includes the magical ones. Oh. So some kind of magical request then? Magic in its entirety, or merely its more artistic expressions? The artistic ones principally he explains smoothly while summoning the illusion of some small fireworks in his hand we are after all creators first. Though we do learn how to defend ourselves of course. These lands are quite unforgiving as you know. Intriguing. I hum so I guess you make great use of alteration and illusion then. There is a glint in his eyes that wasn't there before as he answers with well practiced ah truly you are as brilliant as they say. Yes we do mostly make use of those two schools for everything from sculpting to theatre to music. Right, I can see how that could help. I nod and add conspiratorially and even if people start bothering you that something isn't handmade you can always just say magic takes just as much skill and get more patronage that way. He smiles wryly as we enter a hall leading into his office I am certain I have no idea what you are talking about. Time to end this little play of ours was there anything you wanted from me, Headmaster? I wanted to explore a good part of the city today and we have already chatted for a while. I notice the slightest twitch in his left eye as he says I was indeed hoping to acquire your aid in a certain matter. I wave for him to go on. You see. He scratches the back of his head my nephew has been struck with a great wanderlust and is constantly pestering me to let him out to travel. He sighs keeps telling me that a true bard must experience a worthy tale to actually write anything proper. The thing is he is completely incapable of defending himself save for knowing how to swing a rapier, but we both know that is not enough for someone to ensure survival. I nod along and casually add my own two septums true enough, just a pack of wolves can rip apart a lone unarmored traveler, no matter how skilled with a blade. He seems happy with my agreement yes that is exactly what I have been telling him for the past month, but the fool boy persists. He scowls I promised his mother I would keep him safe, how am I to do that if he runs off? I cross my arms so what is it exactly that you want me to do here? He loses all of his previous theatricality and states seriously I would like for you to keep him around while you go about your duties during your stay here, take him with you when you travel so he can get experience actually fighting and most importantly teach him some combat magic so that he can actually survive his foolish ambitions. I raise an eyebrow and while feigning annoyance ask while I am impressed by your willingness to let him chase his dreams, what do I get from babysitting someone's weak brat? 
Before he can answer I hear a silent annoyed grunt from behind one of the statues in the hall we were standing in. Viermo slowly palms his face and says come out boy, no point in hiding now. A young, tall Altmer with long black hair leaves his hiding place with a very annoyed expression, he goes to say something but the sound of Davos sheathing his dagger stops him in his tracks. Viermo stares at my follower and turns to me with a worried expression. I shrug what? Is it that weird to have a bodyguard these days? He shakes his head no, excuse me. He turns to his nephew so boy, what exactly do you think you are doing eavesdropping on us? The young mare raises his nose at him you have been looking for someone to shove me off to for weeks now, of course I was going to listen in. Viermo shakes his head and says to me please excuse him, sir. He is not quite satisfied with anything right about now and tends to forget himself. Forget myself now, do I? The young one scowls and speaks to me mockingly should I curtsy as well sir? No, but an introduction would at least make me not want to launch you into a nearby wall. I deadpan and sense Viermo still for a second. His nephew apparently doesn't get the message and continues speaking to him what would I even learn from the likes of him? He looks as young as I am. He smirks maliciously in fact, he probably bought his way into his position. Very well, I have indulged you long enough. I raise my hand and a green glow emanates from it, before the young mare can react he is up in the air flailing like an idiot and slowly floating toward me. I tilt my head and ask Viermo and what could you possibly offer me that would make me accept someone this spoiled and idiotic under my tutelage. He sighs and pulls out a roll of paper and hands it to me. I open it up and start reading slowly while the floating young mare flails and curses at me, ordering me to put him down, naturally, I treat his words as a passing breeze. I knew there was something odd with Viermo the moment he started talking but this just proves it. The note contains a warning about Ericur planning to off me for threatening him, some information about the views of the different factions in the city and a basic overview of the factions that have taken over the slums. What truly proved the value of his info however was a tiny warning about leaving my doors open if I sleep anywhere near Sibyl. I burn the note to ash immediately after reading it and turn to Viermo you are surprisingly adept at gathering information if you know to warn me of my colleague. He says nothing but there is a hint of surprise in his eyes, I go on however. If you thought that this is enough for me to deal with this brat for the foreseeable future you are dearly mistaken. He smiles with just the tiniest hint of smugness oh that was just the appetizer. I will provide you one of those each month during your stay in the city if you agree to my request. Oh? That does seem like a very attractive offer, but someone able to get this information cannot have pure intentions can he? I decide to look at him with my blessing only to find that yes he is really just worried about the last of his family and will do pretty much anything to ensure that the boy is happy. Gods do I love it when my cynical ass is proven wrong. I hum, pretending to mull it over even if I already made my decision. Viermo seems to grow more uncomfortable by the minute and I decide to stop tormenting him very well, I accept. He seems relieved but I go on I will teach him to survive and thrive out there but I will not consider coddling him he will not enjoy it when we start traveling. Viermo waves me off oh don't worry, so long as he learns to defend himself and hopefully some damned respect I will honor my side of the deal, could you, could you let him down now? I think he is getting a bit green and am quite certain he doesn't have any Orsish ancestry so that can't be healthy. I blink oh and deactivate my telekinesis with a flick of my hand, making the brat crash onto the ground. Viermo claps happily excellent and helps the dizzy young mare up now my boy, I have secured someone to teach you how to not die, be sure to listen to him or I will be cutting your allowance. Allowance, really? His nephew scowls but I don't want to. Viermo scoffs my boy, you are 19 years old you need to stop being so childish. He exhales fi-e-e-e-in. I clap my hands with that rather pathetic display out of the way I am going to explore the city and am in need of a guide you will do brat. The brat scowls at me again my name is Marco, not brat. Yes yes it is your honor to meet me I know, let us go. His eye twitches, but he appears to be a quick learner so he keeps his mouth shut. 
It was a pleasure meeting you headmaster but we really should be going now. I say to the older mare. He smiles the pleasure was all mine I assure you. Then says to Marco with a wink good luck my boy, and remember to have fun. The young elf groans and follows after me dejectedly. Chapter 83, Chapter XXIV, Marco We leave the Bard's College and head toward the less extravagant part of the upper city. So, Mark was it. I asked my new punching bee cough follower, damn well knowing it wasn't. It's Marco. The very annoyed young Altmer exclaims with a red face. Ryee it I drawl so Maro would you care to recommend some of the interesting sights in the city while we walk? It's never mind. He sighs I am guessing you have already been to the palace. I nod yes, it was quite the sight. Though it did feel a bit over-decorated. What do you mean over-decorated? The Blue Palace has been a monument of art for the entirety of the Septim dynasty. It has works from all over Tamriel. His words carry both insult at my own and pride for his city. I wave it off like it is the least important thing in the world at, it at some points feels like a bunch of thrown together pieces that are there just so people can say that they are and not for any tasteful decoration. He huffs and what would you know about art? I smile conspiratorially there is only one art that I need to know of for my opinion to matter more than yours. Davos chuckles but goes otherwise unnoticed. Oh? And what is this art? His voice turns disbelieving. Did he genuinely think there was some secret here? I shrug why the art of killing people of course he box and I go on kill enough people and even kings will give you the time of day. But. He seems shaken but that is barbaric. I nod sagely indeed it is, but it is also true. Before he can sulk further I interrupt now come on I don't have the whole day and want to see as much of the city as possible. I have to deal with stuffy nobles in the evening. Now it is my turn to sulk. All right he stammers and composes himself well then, follow me. He leads me to the Temple of the Divines, then proceeds to explain the history of the building, the one who financed its construction and so on. The young mare is surprisingly knowledgeable. Maybe he can still be salvaged after all. I do have to admit I mutter as we walk through the main hall of the temple, he perks you and I go on the lack of the Talos shrine is rather jarring. His eyes widen and he asks carefully and why is that? I smile why because it destroys the symmetry of course. Look at them, it totally doesn't add up with how they are arranged. What did you think I was going to say? He looks supremely uncomfortable and shifts his feet for a bit then seemingly gathers his courage and asks are you sure you should be saying that in the open? You know what happens to those who say such things. Ah, we just met and you already worry for me. I cackle quietly and he glares, indicating his seriousness. I raise my hands placatingly fine, fine. The reason I don't fear mentioning Talos is because first I am a filthy Didra worshipper from Mora Wind. He winces and I hear an old priest cough loudly from nearby, completely ignoring the old man I say secondly, remember my earlier argument about killing people. Marco sighs so it is always might makes right for you. I shake my head and raise my finger no. It is like that for anyone with said might. His shoulders slump and what about the rest of us? Do we just crawl while you all kill who you wish? I laugh loudly at this earning multiple glares from the temple goers. Pretending to wipe a tear I say of course not you dolt. The face he makes earns him another laugh when you feel like the world is oppressive you don't lie down and accept it, you become strong and fight against it. You say it like it was easy. I shrug things worth doing rarely are. He seems deep in thought and an older voice cuts into the conversation wise words young man. A bearded Nord priest approaches us. I incline my head slightly good day to you elder, sorry for the noise. He chuckles oh no need for that, I am just happy that the temple is so lively today. Have you come to pay respects to the divines? All are welcome in the house of the gods, even if you are a filthy Didra worshipper he adds jokingly. I smirk just one of them I am afraid. The old man smiles of course, I will leave you to it. I walk over to the shrine of Kynareth and summon some coins and flowers, 
placing them on the offering altar. I return to my followers and we leave the temple. As we walk Marco asks so Kynareth at? I'd have thought you to be more of a Giuliano's worshipper with how much everyone seems to talk about your magic. I raise an eyebrow oh? So you did hear about me and still decided to be a brat when we met. He shrugs I was looking for any excuse not to be taken out of my comfortable life, I meant no offense. Besides I didn't expect you to do something as crass as dangling me in the air for five minutes. My smile is all teeth well now you know me to be crass and won't make the same mistake will you? He shrugs again the risk I took was calculated, but I never was good at numbers. I snored at the familiar expression to answer your previous question I pay tribute to Kynareth, or more precisely Kyn because she blessed me when I started using the Thursday um. I generally don't do worship but paying my respects when I can find the time is good. So you really can do it. Do what exactly? Use the Thursday um of course. I blink you actually know of it. He rolls his eyes of course I know of it, basically any old Nordic tale or ballad has some tongue or another battling a great beast with his mighty voice, it would be weird if a bard didn't know of it. I give him an appreciative nod hum, I am honestly surprised that none of you tried to learn it. After all, every bard worth his salt is an adventurous person, right? His response is as enthusiastic as you would expect yes if one is to be a proper bard they should experience the world and not hide in their libraries. His enthusiasm dims as for learning shouts, well the last time someone tried they blew out their own throat and no one was as brave since. He sees me wince slightly and I explain what happened when I first used a full shout. So you are telling me. He starts in a disbelieving tone that you almost burned yourself to death on your first attempt. I nod how in oblivion did you survive? I shrug at, I had potions and both my colleagues and I are healers. He stares at me I thought you were a destruction mage. I chuckle the official title is High Enchanter but I am at least adept in every school except illusion, making me everything from a bat lemage to a mystic. Well, shit. He just now seemed to realize who he came close to offending. Quite I choose not to tease him further. We spend most of the rest of the day walking around. We visited the renowned Winking Skeever Inn and perused the different shops on the streets. I tried some street food and surprisingly it was pretty damn good for the time period. I left the upper city while receiving dumbfounded looks from both Davos and Marco after I stuffed my inventory with roasted mystery meat. What can I say, I missed my greasy fast food. The industrial district was a lot more colorful than I first thought. Most of the houses had some kind of color scheme going, usually being a combination of white and some brighter color like red or blue, and the people seemed quite well off. Though unfortunately the stench of the slum was not warded off here but it was at least bearable. I visited the ironsmith's section and ordered a sizable shipment of different Anamoncullis parts I designed recently to be sent to Winterhold. I spent a year perfecting the spider design and would like to start experimenting with more potent models as soon as I set up my teleportation circle. Next came the docks, and they were exactly what you would expect from the meeting place of rowdy sailors and wealthy merchants. I met some of the captains that stayed at my inn and they were all very welcoming and introduced me to their friends once again netting me some contracts. As I thought all those months ago, presentation really was everything. Evening approached and we found ourselves looking at the entrance of the slums from atop the walls of the common district. You aren't going to go down there to sightsee are you? Marco asks cautiously, his face a bit green. I shake my head no. Until I am forced to enter this mass pigsty I am not going anywhere near it. He winces do you have to be so crass about it? If it smells like one and sounds like one. He sighs but doesn't press. Now then, what is it that you actually want to learn from me? I finally ask. He claps his hands excitedly oh, I would love to be able to call down lightning from the heavens, it would make for such a great song. I stare blankly not even I can do that at the moment. He goes from energetic to dejected in half a second oh. I snort well you've got to start somewhere, so sparks it is. I raise a hand crackling with lightning. His eyes are filled with barely hidden oh how do I do that? 
I dispel the magic and say firstly you will need to learn how to draw upon your magicka. He listens with rapt attention so I explain further before you go to bed, I want you to search deep inside and find something that will feel to your mind like a puddle of something thick and immovable. After you do I want you to draw on the feeling and will it to make a light in your hand. He nods vigorously and I force him to repeat all of the instructions, the enthusiastic bard even writes the whole thing down. Extra points to you then brat. Davos pipes in is it a problem if I try it as well boss? I give him a blank look if I didn't want you to hear this you wouldn't have heard it. He smiles sheepishly and goes back to whatever it is he was doing. Well it is high time we head back to the palace. I say after a minute of silence I have to get ready for that banquet Torridge forced me to attend. We? Marco asks. Yes, we. But why do I need to go to the palace? He stammers. Because dear Marco, I need an errand boy. His face is ablaze once again and he is just about to explode, but forcefully calms himself and turns to Davos isn't he your dog's body? Before I can respond Davos smirks no, I am Sarjo Ravine's personal assassin. Marco pales and we head up without waiting for him, he notices and starts running after us. I hear Davos let out a quiet cackle you were right, this really is fun to do. Hat. Chapter 84, Chapter XXV, Banquet As we approached the palace Marco kept getting progressively more nervous, suspiciously so after a point. Why so twitchy Marco, you wanted by the crown or something? I ask teasingly. He stops for a second wa and quickly shakes his head of course not. Then why do you look like you are about to start shaking like a leaf? He shifts uncomfortably you see the thing is. He starts and then says loudly and dramatically we really should hurry up, you could be late. I blink, alright dude if you don't want to tell me then don't, there is no need to make a circus of yourself. Followed by the still hesitating Altmer we make our way back to the palace. The moment we enter I feel something moving in the air through my connection to the wind and quickly turn to see a shoe flying toward Marco's face. The impact is so crisp and perfect that I get the sudden need to applaud whoever threw the piece of footwear, an urge I indulge of course. Not long after I notice a rather pissed off looking young woman in maid's clothing strutting toward the poor lad. She walks over to the groaning Altmer and puts her shoe back on while glaring at him what do you think you are doing here you dog. Marco smiles shakily oh, hey there Marie. It is lovely to see you. It is lovely to see me, is it? She asks sarcastically what did I tell you about coming to the palace? Not to. His smile would be blindingly bright if it wasn't for the quiver in his voice. Yes, that is what I told you. So what in oblivion are you doing here? I choose to interject that would have to do with me I am afraid. Her head snaps to me and who the H.O., why would you associate with this dog Sir Mage? Such a swift change of attitude, gods I do love being untouchable that is between the two of us I am afraid, though I am curious what he did to earn your wrath. She blushes slightly and gets angry at the same time I am sure you don't need to waste your time with my stories sir, just please make sure that he doesn't bother any of us if he has to be here. My smile promises great pain as I say oh I will make sure he is a good boy. I notice Marco shiver in the corner of my eye. Marie returns the same nonverbal promise of violence I am so glad to hear that sir, a good day to you. I help the young mare up and ask so what is the story there? He scratches his head wheel. I may or may not have seduced three of the palace maids, at the same time. Ambitious I snort and idiotic. He winces. He sputters well, I am a mare with a big heart, who could ever blame me? A big love for getting beaten up more like. Davos snarks. Before he can defend himself deeper into the hole he was digging, I say just make sure to keep control over whatever beast you imagine you have inside of your loins, you are associated with me now and I will not have you ruining my good name. Davos almost falls over at the mention of my good name or I will be teaching you how to fly again. Marco turns serious immediately of course. I am the perfect image of restraint. My disbelieving look was all the commentary I needed for that statement. 
we made our way to the palace steward's chambers and were quickly let in by the guard. Inside sat a young brown-haired Nord scribbling something down a moment please he says without looking up and finishes up whatever he was writing. Finally, he raises his head ah, hi enchanter it is a pleasure to meet you. I am Ingvar Firebeard the steward of the palace. I incline my head the pleasure is all mine. He nods quickly, and I sense that he is rushing through the greetings almost on instinct, he quickly proves me right I do not wish to be rude but I am drowning in work at the moment so if you would kindly state your business promptly I would appreciate it. Of course I point to Marco this is the nephew of Viermo, the headmaster of the Bard's College. I am aware. The slight glare is quite telling of his opinion of my new companion. Right, I need him to be able to enter the palace during my stay. I can see the mental shrug in his eyes as he asks reasons. Personal tutelage. I surmise. He looks at Marco I see you finally decided to make something actually useful of yourself. Marco huffs not all of us are born into a cozy position fire beard. Ingvar's eye twitches I may be the son of the hold steward but I work harder than any other to prove myself worthy of the trust given to me by the king. Something that cannot be said about you, you useless womanizing brat. I'll have you know I work just as hard on my art. Marco fumes. The young steward huffs yet, sure. Say that again when you aren't leeching off your uncle at nineteen summers old. Marco looks just about ready to blow but my raised hand stops them while I can understand that the two of you have a shared history I would appreciate it if you solved it on your own time. Ingvar deflates back into his previous professional demeanor of course, please forgive my outburst. He writes something down on a slip of parchment and hands it to me he is to show this to the guard if he isn't with you, and if he persists in his womanizing ways he will be thrown out, invitation or not. I leave, followed by Davos. Marco stays behind for a moment and says thanks Ingvar. Out. The Nord says calmly. General POV. The time for the banquet arrived quickly after they were done with their business with the steward. It was being held in the throne room which was now filled to the brim with chairs and tables almost turning the opulent palace into a Nordic drinking hall yet still somehow retaining its original elegance. The thanes and their cliques were slowly filling up the hall with the host already being present. High King Torridge looked as dignified as a young and fresh ruler can, and perked up when Revine arrived with his group. Revine gave the king a bow and he was quickly signalled to take a seat close to his own, as this was a banquet held in his name. I am glad you didn't decide to forget this little gathering like most mages tend to do. The king said jovially. Revine smiled well, I am still young and not yet completely tired of everyone. Wait a couple of years and no party will see me. The king chuckled oh if only I could do that. Oh how heavy is the crown. Revine said drilly causing the Torridge to snort. They continued with their idle chatter until Torig decided to ask I see you have Viermo's nephew with you. Already making connections. Revine merely shrugged you never know when a favor here and there can come in useful. I am counting on me bringing him here being looked upon as one. The king nodded prudent. And then gave him a slightly impressed look I am honestly surprised that you care enough to do this, I know I said already but mages rarely care about the opinions of others. The Dunmer took a swig of some very high shelf meat and said well to be fair I was raised in a household of high standing, so I did have some lessons in these things. Then quickly shaking his head added not that I like politicking it's just that it gets me something for doing nothing so there is no reason not to. Deciding to change the topic he asked is the target of your affections going to be visiting tonight? The king immediately blushed and with a barely controlled voice said yes, she will. Oh. Revine raised a teasing eyebrow and who is she? You never did tell me plainly. Her name is Elisif the bashful Torridge quietly said and added dreamily she is by far the fairest woman I ever laid my eyes upon. Elisif the fair then. Revine asked chuckling at his inside joke. The king's eyes widened yes, that is what she will be called. You truly are a better adviser than I hoped. Revine merely rolled his eyes at the young man's childishness. 
Their conversation was interrupted by Arikur approaching the high table a good evening my king he bowed and turned to Ravine and to you court mage, I hope that our little, altercation earlier didn't sour any possible cooperation. Ravine shrugged honestly, at this point I consider insults and threats to be some kind of Nordic greeting so no, there are no hard feelings. Both the Nords he was conversing with chuckled awkwardly, but made no attempt to correct him. The trio of young men were soon joined by the other Thane of the city, Bryling fair greetings to you honoured friends, and Arikur. Arikur bristled, while the king wisely decided not to comment. Ravine had no such compunctions however and snorted into his drink, almost spilling it dear gods, I have heard the two of you speak only twice by now and you already seem like an old married couple to me. Both the Thanes glared at him, but the king could be seen thoughtfully scratching his beard completely ignoring the glares now pointed in his direction. A crisp laugh distracted them as Sybil suddenly appeared in her seat, cup in hand I keep telling everyone that but they just have to keep at it. I swear the tension between them can cut the white gold tower. Bryling, always the patient one said I see that you have all indulged a bit too much with the meat if you think anything of the sort could ever happen. Arikur immediately agreed I am not so tasteless as to have anything to do with this woman. While they were sputtering their denials, Ravine used his slowly developing mental senses to probe their thoughts and saw that something was definitely being hidden there, but there was nothing concrete so he would just have to shelve those thoughts for now. He did share a quick look with Sybil, but she merely smiled conspiratorially and said nothing. Curious. The male Thane cut off the line of conversation in any case I came up here to make amends if needed, I wish you all a pleasant evening and left for his table. Bryling quickly followed suit. I do wonder what their game is. Ravine muttered. A bit too loudly as he heard the king sigh. Their goals are as mysterious as the N8 divines. A slip of the tongue or a test. Ravine chose to completely ignore the implied subtlety so, curious of my opinion of my distant supremacist cousins are you. Torridge narrowed his eyes if you wish to be so blunt about it. Yes. Ravine shrugged they had my father killed, you can conclude the rest. A faint smile graced the king's face as he returned to his drink. Sybil cut in dramatically ah, to be so easily forgotten. Woe is me. Oh please. Ravine rolled his eyes you couldn't care about the topic if I forced you to. She merely nodded happily and returned to the, wine. She was drinking. Torridge raised an eyebrow I see that the two of you already got to know each other. Ravine nodded of course, if we are to be colleagues we might as well make sure to know how best not to step on each other's toes. There you go again with your oddly specific expressions. Sybil said a bit intrigued. A mere shrug was her answer I am a poetic mare, what can I say? Right, poetic. Her voice drier than the elicar. While the higher-ups were having their talks, Ravine's two followers were enjoying some free high-quality service while they could. So, how did the two of you meet? Marco asked Davos excitedly. Davos took a sip of wine he hired me to kill overly curious brats. Marco snorted if you don't want to tell me then don't, no need to come up with absurd stories. Davos stared at him while playing with the butter knife in his hand twirling it dexterously and saying nothing. Realization slowly dawned in Marco's eyes why are you so open about it then? He asked fearfully. Davos shrugged you will be following us for quite a while if my hunch is right, and will obviously end up in less than heroic situations. I don't want you to make problems when we are in a pickle. The young bard looked at him in surprise but why would you trust me with that information? Davos' smirk was extremely relaxed because Marco, you blab you get the stab as it were. Oh. The young mare gulped. The banquet lasted for a couple of hours, after the meal was done the musicians arrived and it turned into a proper party with Nords singing and dancing like they were in a tavern instead of a palace. Once Elisif arrived Ravine had a fun time teasing Torridge into asking her for a dance, it took a good ten minutes of goading but the king gathered his courage and left for his glorious conquest. As he left Sybil quipped not going to ask me for a dance oh dear colleague of mine. Ravine rolled his eyes and offered his hand well then, 
would the lady grace me with a dance? Gladly she smiled. They danced for a while with Sybil attempting to tease him, expecting the usual reactions from a teenager but much to her surprise, Revine merely teased back. After the song was finished they sat down for a drink and Revine shared some gossip about the goings-on at the college. Some time later their conversation was interrupted by a drunk-looking Eric Cooler ah, if it isn't the mayor of the hour. Revine greeted him with a polite smile and if it isn't the Thane himself. Said Thane proudly rose his chest indeed, the Thane. He offered Revine a cup of mead and took one for himself I know I already said it, but I hope we can work together. Come let us share a drink. Revine took a look at the cup and smiled, picking it up and clinking it against Eric Coors. They both took a deep swig from it and Eric Coors' smile turned a bit feral behind his friendly mask. Revine smirked back and a ring appeared on his left hand and let out a gentle green glow right spicy this drink he said as he happily stared at the now very worried Thane I think I might want more. Eric Coors gulped fuck. Indeed Revine smiled I don't know what gave you the idea that such a shitty concoction would even have an effect, but I will count this as a promise of a favor from you, unless you want me to react in a more appropriate manner. The Thane nodded quickly in defeat right, of course. Ta-ta. Revine waved happily and returned to his conversation with Sybil who was now glaring at the Thane's back, he was positively surprised to see an ice spell fizzle out of her hand when he decided not to escalate the situation. So protective already. He smirked. She merely rolled her eyes and said jovially oh please, I can't have the honored position of court mage threatened by the likes of him. Revine nodded in any case, you still have my thanks. Another dance then? Sybil asked. Of course. Chapter 85 Chapter XXVI, Court Mage and Preparations Revine's POV The banquet went on without any further mishaps. Honestly, I was surprised by Eric Coors lack of subtlety, a small part of me hoped he would be some hidden mastermind just because a brat in power annoys me more than him possibly being a true threat. My evening spent with Sybil was altogether quite pleasant, we had a lot to talk about when it came to magic and she was obviously interested in doing more than talking by the end of the banquet. We left for the wizard's tower after the party died down and the damn woman simply wished me a good night and closed the door to my face. Damn tease! The following day was my first time participating in the king's court, and dear kind I was close to shooting an ice spear through my head as it looked preferable to listening to a bunch of petty nobles shouting their even pettier grievances. Most of the session I spent just sitting around with Sybil, who looked like she wasn't even paying attention to what was being said and just dozing off without a care in the world, while I had to actually listen in case someone tried to throw a curveball my way. She seemed to know it too judging by her mocking smile. I only got one opportunity to actually do my job during the entire court session and that was to determine a fair tax on soul gems, an item used by less than 1% of the population. Naturally, I advised the tax to be as low as I could get away with. If I have to sit around and listen to a bunch of medieval not Vikings try and make decisions I am going to get something out of it. Besides my sizable salary, of course. After the court meeting was done I was held back by the hold steward, Falk Firebeard who invited me into his office. We took our seats and he questioned me about the information I had on the force worn, possible locations, and numbers. I responded as best as I could but seeing as the source of my information was second-hand rumors from taverns we really didn't get anywhere except me marking a couple of hills and ravines that might hold encampments. Falk nodded along my explanations pretty much having already expected this result, but then we arrived at a topic that might be within my actual expertise so, Flame Tongue what do you know of their magic strength? Their warriors are weaklings compared to our own but their witches are usually the ones giving us the most trouble. I decide not to comment on the warrior statement, believing it to be mostly true, and search my thoughts for a while. After some thinking I say I am aware of two general types. Falk urges me to explain with his hand. I raise a finger the first one would be the witch, general magic casters focusing on ritualism and curses. Most of them are your local potion makers and the like so they aren't all that much of a threat in combat but can still be a danger with their poisons. 
he is writing every word down with impressive speed. Their ascended versions I almost spit the words out are known as Hagravens, which is who through communion with Didric Prince Namara and human sacrifice attained greater power and longevity. Falk raises his head abruptly we are dealing with Didric cultists now. I nod yes while some would say that it could be considered more of a cultural religion akin the reclaimed tribunal of Mora Wind, these communities are far more cult-like in nature and practice less than morally acceptable rituals. Fox eyes and I guess this gives them some very unfortunate powers. Once again I nod in confirmation indeed, you can expect fleshy monstrosities or reanimated corpses they didn't consume. He blanches on the other hand the hags themselves are capable of destruction magic but mostly focus on poisons, curses, and healing. Odd that they would be good at healing with them being cannibals and all. Falk mutters, but something in my look makes him regret it. I stare into the distance oh, butchering the bodies of men and mare is surprisingly useful for understanding how to put them back together. He goes a bit green forget I said anything and returns to the point you said there was another magical threat from them. Yes, the Briar Hearts. And mind you the name is quite literal as well. They are the brave Reachmen that undergo a ritual done by the Hagravens, usually including human sacrifice as well. He does not look happy to hear that. They have their hearts replaced with an enchanted Briar that grants them great strength and power at the cost of some of their sanity and free will. You may look at them as elite soldiers or even champions in some extreme cases. Falk quickly writes that down any recommendations to our scouts. I shrug I don't know too much about their culture but they usually do leave bone effigies to mark their territory so tell them to be extra careful when seeing those. After he finishes his notes, Falk unrolls a different parchment now for the necromancy issue, we do have the general idea of what they are usually capable of so there is no need to ask you that, this is in fact more for your benefit. He pushes the parchment over the table and I see a map of Hoffinger with the mountains being marked as possible necromancer bases, most importantly I see Wolf Skull Cave among the marked locations. These are the locations where necromancers or undead have been sighted in the past month, they seem to be slowly gathering toward a specific position, but we were unable to confirm anything. Wolf Skull I say. Pardon. Wolf Skull Cave. I say without clarification. Falk frowns could you elaborate on that? I nod and say nothing. The poor man sighs are you going to elaborate on that? I merely smile. Damn mages I hear him whisper and almost burst into laughter, he shakes his head and asks this is no time for jests, how can you be certain that is the location? You are no fun. I huff wolf and skull, tell me who is famous around solitude for those two specific things. His eyes widen after a moment potma septum. I nod sagely. But would they gather there just because of the name? He asks. I shake my head obviously not, the cave was likely named because some grand dark ritual was performed by potma inside it, making the entire area a good focal point for performing necromantic magic thus making it a perfect base for our necromancers. He starts frantically checking the map and writing something down, I stay silent and he goes at it for some time probably even forgetting I was there. Finally, he sits back down and sighs it does make sense, their movements have been slowly encircling the place. A sudden thought makes me ask I am sorry if I sound ignorant, but why exactly do you not hunt down the undead whenever they are sighted? Falk frowns most of those that do see them are local guardsmen and they are not capable of fighting dark mages, and before any stronger forces can arrive the necromancers simply slip into the darkness. Unfortunately not that out of the realms of possibility, Skirim is a big place and settlements are distant from each other. I see. So when do you plan on marching on them? Falk flips some more notes and says if your suspicions are confirmed by the scouts it would take us about a week to organize everything and prepare the local legionaries for a fight with necromancers. He looks at me seriously you will naturally be included in those forces, your voice alone will invigorate our men. Of course. I agree without hesitation. He smiles in appreciation and asks do you have any advice on how to better fight them? 
I immediately list off what I know magic resistant armor and silver weapons for your best men, and solar magic scrolls if you can get some. He notes it down and gives me a curious look are you able to inscribe those scrolls? I look at him like he is an idiot high enchanter, remember. He chuckles what I meant to ask is are you willing to inscribe as many as possible while we prepare? The crown is naturally willing to pay a fair price for them. Of course I nod immediately just remember that I will have to journey out of the city for a day before we depart. It seems I needed to visit Miss Sunshine sooner than expected. Oh? Whatever for? Hmm, to tell him or not to tell him? Fuck it, it's not like I am bargaining with Dagon I will be cleansing the Temple of Meridia on Mount Kilkriath. His eyes widen you would bargain with Adidra. Adidra known for its hatred of the undead, and also known for an artifact renowned in their destruction. I say gravely. He looks at me appraisingly and then nods very well, I will give you the benefit of the doubt since you decided to inform me and won't record this. I hope you don't do something foolish on your quest for that blade. I smirk do not worry, I am perfectly capable of evading the more, wily tendencies of the Didra. Very well he nods slowly, some doubt still lacing his words thank you for your time and I hope you are prepared for what is to come. I incline my head and leave for the mage's tower. The inscribing of scrolls is a surprisingly simple process when you are skilled in enchantment and the arcane script. You take a high quality parchment, write down a spell formula, usually a circle, and charge it with either your own magicka or soul gems when in bulk. I chose to use my own reserves because I might as well train while toiling away for hours. Currently I was standing in a closed of courtyard near the tower, a tall writing table in front of me. While I was scribbling away Marco and Davos were sitting on the ground, their legs crossed and both frowning in concentration. Surprisingly Davos managed to call out his magicka faster than the young Altmer, but that may just be his age giving him an advantage to be fair. Marco stands up abruptly this is far harder than I expected, how do you just call it up? He asks me. Not looking up from the scroll I was writing on I respond patience and focus, your magicka should be heavier than the usual novice since you are Altmer, just keep at it and you will manage it. The first time is always the hardest and the younger the mage the harder it is. He throws his hands up but you are younger than me and can do it with ease. I shrug, still not looking up I come from a long line of immensely powerful sorcerers that stood above the Telvani themselves. Do not compare yourself with me as I have a very unfair advantage. He sighs, sits back down and gets down to work without further complaining. Good decision too as if he were to throw a tantrum I would show him a bird's eye view of solitude. Davos suddenly asks hey boss, I think I got this down. Think I can start with actually useful spells now. I frown the candle light spell is very useful I will have you know, but yes you should start on minor pyromancy now. Minor pyro what now? Pyromancy, think of it as fancy noble speak for fire magic. You sure I should go with fire? I finally look away from the now finished scroll of Solar Cloak yes, being descended from those that lived under the Red Mountain offers far more than gravel in your throat. He chuckles all right, what do I do? Channel Magicka into your palm. He starts to do so while staring at said palm and I quickly yell not while pointing at your face you dolt. Marco jumps in fright and Davos face palms yeah, sorry about that. I shake my head never mind. Point it at the target, channel magicka, and will it to become flames. Davos frowns that sounds really simple boss, something you aren't telling. I shake my head novice spells are ridiculously easy compared to higher ones, just get to it. He follows my instruction and after frowning for a bit, a weak gout of fire leaves his hand azure as tits. He starts waving his hand around, probably fearing he set it on fire. I raise my own hand and hold him in place, making the fire die out don't worry, you cannot set your hand on fire, there is a bunch of magicka flowing behind the fire protecting you. Oh. And please for the love of all that is sacred, do not speak Azura's name like that, her royal pettiness might set her sights on you for the slight. He chuckles oh don't worry about me boss, I am just a nobody. 
she is more likely to look at you with you being who you are and all. I frown and suddenly feel like someone is watching me, quickly I check my system and there is nothing. Probably my paranoia acting up. Hopefully. Chapter 86, Chapter XXVII, Back to Winterhold It took a good three days of focusing on my work for my paranoia and twitchiness to die down after that event. I knew Azura was going to show up at some point and make some outrageous demand from me, even if she somehow wasn't the proud and vain prince I expected her to be, she had an excuse to make a demand so she would do it. I just hoped she would be kind enough to wait until I was ready for whatever she wanted. And make no mistake, I would likely have to accept her demands as denying her would just paint a massive target on my back for the wrath of the Morrowind Dunmer. The two other good Didra expected defiance, almost enjoyed it even. But not Azura, she was the mother of all Dunmer and if it were ever known the last Dagoth defied her I would never be able to enter Morrowind, not without having to resort to a massacre at least. Deciding to put those thoughts to rest for now, as overthinking would just give me a headache and no real solution to the problem, I informed Sybil and Davos of my absence and made my way to my chambers in the wizard's tower. Today I finally got around to inscribing the mark and recall circle into the floor of my chambers, and it was time to revisit Winterhold. After checking and rechecking the ritual circle a good ten times, you really don't want to have accidents while teleporting, I stepped into the center of it and channeled the spell. It felt as if the air itself was twisting around me, quickly disappearing after that, then as if being yanked by a massive invisible hand my entire being was twisted and what felt like getting spaghettified, I suddenly vividly sensed another location in the back of my mind and the same invisible force yanked me into its direction. Suddenly I was standing on the third floor of my Winterhold Manor, the entire spell took less than a second but felt like an entire eternity of discomfort. So naturally the next instant I found myself retching in my bathroom. A servant must have heard me and rushed inside, she was one of the more sane ones I took from Durin and gave me a very worried look are you well Sarjo? She asked tentatively. I waved her off, my head still in the bucket. After taking some deep breaths I finally rose from my position and said in a tired voice apparently teleporting from the other side of Skirim on my first time was a bad idea, who would have guessed? please get me some fresh water. She mumbles in of course and rushes to complete my request. It was at the same time surprising and not how loyal and devoted most of my employees were, on the one hand, I saved them either from poverty or torment, on the other I was actually very polite with everyone. Don't kick the ones serving you drinks and all that. She returned so quickly I think I could see a bit of sweat on her brow but water was far more important right now so I chose not to comment. I gulped the entire thing down in one swig and turned back to her were there any problems while I was absent. She shifts a bit and says nothing pressing, but Carsis was complaining about some visitors not paying. Of course there would still be those kinds of idiots very well, I will head his way now, thank you for the help, Alyssa. She bows deeply of course, master. And leaves me. I make my way to the Sea Ghost's respite, receiving surprised greetings of my workers on the way, and enter Karsis' office. Odd name for a Dunmer, but who am I to judge? The older mare is currently scribbling down some kind of letter, as I enter he abruptly looks up and narrows his eyes Ah, Master Revine, I was quite sure you were in solitude right now. Good, he didn't immediately fold. I raise my right hand and summon my rings wordlessly. He quickly nods please forgive the suspicion, sir. I wave him off I am the one that told you to check if things were suspicious, it would be ridiculous if you needed forgiveness for that. Of course Sarjo. He stops writing the letter and moves it to the side I was just about to write about the captain of the Isa Unna refusing to pay for our services. I raise an eyebrow has he made use of said services. He quickly nods yes, he and his crew partook in anything we had to offer and after they were done the captain made all manner of complaints about bugs in the rooms and stale drinks and now he doesn't want to pay up as it were. I hum for a bit and ask he is heading west next is he not? Indeed. 
my smirk turns just a tad feral and form the good captain that he is to pay a visit to the second court mage of solitude when he enters the city to resolve this dispute in front of the court. Carsus seems to get my intent and smirks back but of course, Sarjo. He walks out of the office and I follow behind him while muffling my steps with magic, and making sure I am not seen. He makes his way to a specific table and coughs, getting the attention of a tall Nord and his men. The presumed captain smirks done complaining to your boss then. Carsus nods seriously indeed. You are hereby invited to resolve your complaints with court mage Revine Flame Tongue of Solitude upon reaching the capital. Refusal to do so will be considered unlawful and will result in a bounty being placed on your head throughout Skirim. The captain pales and asks court mage. Carsus smirks indeed, my lord has been inaugurated at a royal banquet four days ago. There is silence for a while and the captain asks slowly and you got his response this quickly. Oh, my lord was visiting his holdings a couple of minutes ago, he just considers this issue below him and invites you to make your way to him as a reward for your insolence. The Nord merely slumps into his chair and wordlessly places a sack of septums on the table. Carsus picks it up, empties it on another table, and starts slowly, deliberately counting the money. Each clink of a coin makes the Nord crew more nervous. After what must have felt like a year of torment to them, and a minute of good chuckles for me, Carsus finally stands up and gives the excess back to the captain. The Nord looks at him dumbly and he says gravely if my lord invited you for a visit, you will make the damn visit Mikhail. The now completely pale Mikhail slowly takes the bag and leaves, followed by his crew. Clap. 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 I exit my little hiding spot and say with a smile that was beautiful to watch Carsus, far more satisfying than bullying my new student in solitude I have to say. He makes an exaggerated bow I live to serve my lord. We talk for a while longer about the more mundane and boring aspects of owning a business. I take the time to ask about every one of my employees and he happily tells me that everyone is doing well. The talk might have been tedious but a happy servant is a loyal servant. After I was done with that I left for the college. Tolfter is on gate duty today and the moment he sees me a wide smile spreads on his face a revine, how nice of you to check in. I hope you are doing well in the capital. I smile back and offer a handshake the capital is far more interesting than I initially expected, it will be quite the fun playground for a time. I notice the slightest furrowing of his brow just make sure to remember what is really important to you and not get dragged on into the petty games of the nobility. I huff exaggeratedly oh please, as if I would ever allow a bunch of entitled swipes to drag me down from the path of magic. Language young man. He says good-naturedly how is Sybil doing these days? I haven't met her in a decade. She seems to have done quite well for herself and looks content. Tolfter shakes his head she always was rather too willing to engage in politicking. I hope your presence might drag her back into studying the arts again. I smile then I am happy to inform you that I already started cooperating with her on some alteration research. Tolfter's proud smile heals the soul only as an old man's pride can I am very happy to hear that Revine, now I am sure you have business inside, there is no need to stand around for this old man. I bow slightly always a pleasure Master Tolfter. My next destination was the wizard's dormitory, used by the resident adepts and above. After a bit of searching I find the suite I was looking for and knock a couple of times. Not long after a disheveled Morrigan opens the door and blinks a couple of times when she sees me. Long night. I ask. She waves me in and takes a seat on a very comfy looking sofa yes, I was working overtime to complete your little request. At first I thought it would be simple to do, but the three weeks I spent on it proved otherwise. Oh? Already finished then. She stands back up and rummages through a safe in one of the walls before pulling out a glowing purple potion and handing it to me this should close to double your output with fire and lightning, it is quite potent so consuming more than one at a time would be bad for your health. I nod you only made the one. She sighs even that I couldn't do alone, I had to ask Hawken for help and he has been insufferable ever since. He isn't asking for anything outrageous is he? I ask slowly. 
She blinks oh of course not, he is just urging me to follow his ridiculous way of alchemy as if preaching some enlightenment. The man can be like a priest when it comes to moon sugar sometimes. I snort maybe they should declare him the next main of elsewhere then. She laughs at that. Are Marwin and Idrasa in? I ask. Morrigan shakes her head no, they were asked to help with the excavation in that farmer settlement you cleared. The college rotates people in shifts as they all get uncomfortable underground after a time, honestly the whole thing would take half a decade without your Anamankali. Well I am glad they came in handy. I say with a smile. After a bit of silence she asks any specific reason you came to the college beside the potion. I scratch my cheek wheel. I may or may not be about to cleanse Adidra's temple in hopes of getting their artifacts so I need to gather as much information as possible. She blinks well, good luck with that. Zero hesitation. A mocking smirk is her only response. We talk about the goings-on for a bit longer and share some gossip for a while, I also give her the high-quality ring of alchemy and after we exhaust all interesting topics I excuse myself and head toward the library. The Arcanum is as silent as always, students are very carefully reading through the priceless tomes, while Yurag overlooks his domain. I approach the old orc and incline my head in greeting. He looks me over appraisingly and nods after a bit flame tongue what do you need today? Anything you have on Mount Kilkriath and Meridia please. He stares at me for a while are you quite sure that is what you want? I shrug already too deep in to back out now. Yurig shakes his head and mutters something about idiotic youths second floor, section D, shelf 11. My thanks Yurig. He huffs just be careful brat. Chapter 87, Chapter XXVIII, Research I found the Didric section of the library without much issue, really it was impossible to miss as there was a rather imposing glowing sign spelling out in no uncertain terms that everyone touching the books contained within does so on their own responsibility, with the usual warnings of what dealing with Didra results in. The books containing information on Meridia were bound in mesmerizingly glowing silver and gold, I quickly found the two I needed and got to work. The first book was a rather small one and was simply named the Kilkriath Temple. It explained that the Grand Temple of Meridia was built long before Reman Siridiel took the ruby throne, upon Mount Kilkriath northwest of Solitude. Most sources agree that the temple was constructed as a covenant between the Didric Prince and the leader of an ancient order of vampire hunters going by the Dongard, the goal of said covenant is widely agreed to be the containment of the ancient Folkihar clan and its influence to a small island north of Hofinger. So the Folkihar are known even in literature? Makes one wonder why they weren't long exterminated if so. The book goes on to state that it is believed that the temple is enchanted by its patron to send a weak but constant wave of solar energies toward the vampiric fortress in an attempt to contain the chosen of Malag Bal. I had to hold back a face palm upon reading this, it was wildly inefficient, but unfortunately that was usually how these divine contests went. The temple was known throughout history as a center of healing and welcoming benevolence in Skirim and was usually left alone by the reigning High King. It is unknown precisely why the temple fell into abandonment and disrepair, but the most accepted theory is that it was some kind of plot by the vampires to loosen the chains binding them to the island. Not too much to use here unfortunately, but the solar aura does give me some ideas. I will have to get to the temple first to try anything, unfortunately. I close the first book and carefully return it to its shelf. The second one is far larger and is named The Lady of Infinite Energies. It is split into two sections, one talks of all recorded meetings with the Prince of Life, and the other speaks of the Prince herself. Meridia is known to be one of the more morally good Didra, usually associated with life and the sun as she is believed to be a fallen Magna Ge, basically a fallen star spirit. The reason she is considered to be a good Didra, if such a thing even exists, is her hatred of the undead and willingness to reward those that lay the abominations to rest. There is unfortunately a flip side to this as she is also known to be ridiculously self-righteous and prideful. Known among her enemies as the Lady of Greed and other less than flattering names, she is known to treat her servants as property and takes any form of defiance very badly. Her servants are also known to be granted a form of immortality, 
only at the minor cost of all their agency and free will, said servants can also be created willingly or not. Thankfully the recorded meetings section informed me that as long as I was respectful and didn't do anything idiotic like advertising just how nice I would fit into her collection of slaves I would be able to get away with borrowing her power to bash some undead, hopefully. That will take some planning and just a bit of liquid courage, but I didn't accept a second life to cower in my tower, this fantastical kind of situation is what I live for. Suddenly I feel the slightest shifting of the air to my right and quickly close the book and position myself. Not a moment later Savos appears, probably hoping I forgot about his shenanigans during my time away. Unfortunately for him instead of a frightened young mare, he is met with my half-lidded stare. Really Archmage? I ask dryly. He ignores my tone and takes a seat while casting a sound isolating illusion spell around us, even he fears Urug, and for good reason. Aaron sighs dramatically you grew up too quickly, you are no fun anymore. I raise an eyebrow I'd hope I arrived here all grown up, but you learn something new every day I guess. Eh, semantics he waves me off. I return the book on Meridia to its shelf and ask anything you needed from me Archmage. So formal Revine. I stare and he waves me off again fine, I heard you came back in and upon hearing what you were doing got curious, that is all. Raii totally doesn't have anything to do with whatever you are planning in the background. I draw. His smile is so innocent the first think I should inform the guard just in case I have not the tiniest idea what you are on about Revine. Why would I, the sole archmage in Skyrim be interested in keeping the province safe and prosperous? I roll my eyes I get that much, just not why you have to be all mysterious about it. Timing he says succinctly. I blink that actually makes quite a bit of sense. Now it is his turn to blink it does? I was not aware you were versed in potential timeline observation. I shrug I don't need to be to understand what you are implying, but do remember I took some of Shalazer's lessons to heart. He nods to himself excellent. That means I won't have to deal with a grouchy kid with too much power in his hands getting pissy with me because I don't give him all the information. How lucky for you I draw but if I do find you kept something important from me and that results in me losing something I wouldn't want to, know that I will be far worse than merely grouchy. He raises his hands in mock surrender I wouldn't dare oh great and terrifying lord of Dagoth. Naturally I say with a raised nose and we both chuckle, after some silence I ask for real now, what made the great Savos Aaron leave his playground today? Savos smirks I have been hiding away in my tower for far too long now, and I will be honest, whatever awaits in those caves is far above what you alone will be able to deal with. The smirk turns predatory so Revine, the two of us will be going on one very enthusiastic walk once you get what you need from Meridia. Oh! Seeing the Archmage in action? I would be an idiot to not be interested well. I guess that seeing what someone can do with too much time on their hands should be interesting. Is what I actually say. Savos laughs and clutches his heart ah, to be underestimated so. I shrug I guess you will just have to prove me wrong then. I notice that it is already very late in the evening, reading through the large tomes wasn't a quick process after all so, when should I tell them you will be coming? I ask as I get up from my seat. I will be visiting the court tomorrow he hums seeing the state of those fools is always refreshing and helps me to remind myself that some lives are worth far less than others. Less than yours? I ask jokingly. For the briefest of moments, I notice the mask fall off from Savos and glimpse the proud and powerful being behind, but he hides it near instantly and pretends to be appalled as if I would ever consider something as sacred as the life of another to be below my own. You wound me. Uh huh I say dumbly and he snorts I guess I will be seeing you at court tomorrow, now time to make myself throw up via mark and recall again. As I am leaving I hear him mumble with my elven hearing did he forget the outer stabilizing circle. He then cackles quietly oh no, I removed those to watch apprentices suffer kakik. I stumble and hear Savos laughing his ass off. I turn around with a lightning spell ready in my hand only to see no one in front of me and feel a hand grab my shoulder. Slowly I turn my head to the side and see a grinning Urug holding me with an iron grip. 
I give him the most innocent smile I can muster but that just makes his own grin widen, the next thing I know I am being launched outside of the library and smashing into a wall. Good luck Brad I hear the orc snort. Yeah, fuck you too you rug. I see the orc glaring at me while his mouth twists into a sadistic grin. I said that out loud didn't I? I ask carefully. He nods slowly. Just I slump just make it quick. He did not make it quick. Chapter 88, Chapter XXIX, Gathering a Party I blinked my tired eyes open and winced in pain, mage, or not pissing off an orc is never a good idea. Even my advanced healing was taking its time to kick in. The worst part of it all was explaining to Davos and Sybil just why exactly I came back to the tower looking like I tried to seduce a troll. Well, at least I looked somewhat presentable after a good night's rest. After freshening up I made my way to the office of Falk Firebeard to inform him of Savo's visit. Upon nearing it I heard him speaking to what I recognized as his son, Ingvar now boy, I need you to remember to recheck the tax reports from the traders multiple times, they make avoiding payments some sort of game and come up with more convoluted ways to do it each time. I had to keep myself from snorting at that. Of course father he responds seriously. I knock on the opened door and they turn to me a high enchanter, I was just about to send someone to inquire about the scroll situation. Fox says. I stop myself from an eye roll just revine is fine steward, I am not so stuck up that you need to title me each time. Fox chuckles very well, then you may simply call me Fox. I incline my head in agreement and ask you two seem to be in some rather hectic preparations, almost as if you plan on joining us in the attack Falk. He nods the king insists on fighting so I must follow him. Well, I am not strictly required to but if he dies when I could have been there to defend him I would not be able to live with myself. I cup my chin in thought hum, and I guess that dissuading his participation is a foolish idea since he does need the reputation. Quite. I turn to Ingvar you sure you can keep up with your father's work and your own while he is absent? He puffs out his chest I will give it my all and I know it will be enough. I chuckle I wish you luck all the same. Fock coughs in his hand while I do not dislike your presence, we do have work to do so if you could please get to whatever it is you were here for. I nod in understanding of course, I am here to inform you that Archmage Savos Aaron will be visiting the court later today to offer his personal assistance with the necromancers. Fox eyes almost glow in delight that is truly great news. Did he say why he is interested in the situation? I shrug he merely explained that I alone will not be enough for what awaits, what he meant by that precisely I cannot say. He chuckles see, now you know why I got annoyed with your coyness the other day. I raise an accusatory finger you would do it too if you could, don't lie to me. I, I would. But I cannot so I get to be grouchy about it. He says fo seriously now about those scrolls. I deposit about a hundred solar magic scrolls of different potency and explain in detail what they do and how they are to be used. We discuss how best to distribute them among the soldiery and most importantly my reward for the work, which was surprisingly generous. I spent the rest of the morning waiting for the court session and relaxing. When the time came we all took our seats as usual and Torridge spoke up while most of the preparations for the coming battle are complete, I am happy to announce that we are going to be receiving some unexpected reinforcements. Before anyone could respond or react a blue magic circle emblazoned with the Winterhold College sigil appeared in the middle of the throne room and a moment later was replaced with a smug looking Savos. Why was he smug? Because he could sense me glaring at him of course. The king smiled as their eyes met Archmage Savos, always a pleasure to have you at our court. Savos bowed ever so slightly in response the pleasure is all mine King Torridge. I have to say I was very pleasantly surprised to hear you will be joining us four days hence. The king obviously wanted to know the reason, but was wise enough not to demand an explanation from a mare that could end entire cohorts on his own. Savos merely shrugged I have been made aware that my presence is required with the help of my dear friend and master mystic Shalazar. Bryling, lacking her king's tact, cuts in from one of the side seats and what were you made aware of exactly? Savos' smile seems perfectly polite to most, 
but to those that met him before it turns ever so slightly mocking that I am afraid is business of my own. As if choreographed Arakur cuts in and how exactly do you justify keeping secrets from your king? Savos turns to him with a cheeky smile and shrugs well I was speaking to your delightful little lover here, not the king now wasn't I? Both the thanes react as you would expect, but before they could blow up we all hear Sibyl laughing it has been too long since I dealt with your shenanigans Savos, and I have to say you are surprisingly tolerable in small doses. Savos beams why if it isn't little Sibyl? You forgot to visit so long I got worried you didn't like us college mages anymore. Sibyl rolls her eyes with you constantly behaving so childishly one would think that the college was on the verge of collapse. Naturally I decided to avoid the blast zone. Aaron sniffs not even a hug and you are already browbeating me. Torage, probably having already had enough of the old mare, says Savos Aaron is trusted throughout the entire province, even among those who despise mages so if he doesn't feel like giving his reasoning for his assistance I find myself disinclined to press him for it. The court grumbles, but with the king's stance made clear there really is no more that they can do but suck it up. We go through some more formalities and the court is disbanded rather quickly, as the less important disputes are shelved for after the king comes back. If he comes back goes unsaid. Savos pesters Sibyl and myself to show him around the palace and we have to deal with his trolling for the next four hours. Finally, after mocking some noble or another he seems sated and teleports back to Winterhold after promising to be there when we are ready to march. When he leaves both Sibyl and I slump onto the nearby stone bench in one of the palace halls. How does he have so much energy? I groan. Sibyl huffs an unhealthy amount of rituals of course. I wave my hand yet I know, the question was rhetorical. My mind cannot comprehend rhetorical questions at the moment Ravine. She says in a dead voice. Ah. After a while she asks so I hear you are heading out to Kilkriath, should I be worried? I shake my head I have no plans on becoming the champion of any Dedra, so no worries. Just don't go scrounging through my things and there won't be sudden solar explosions to worry about. I am old Revine, not stupid. She huffs. I look her over well you must be the youngest old person I know then. Such a charmer she coos but that wasn't why I was asking you about the temple, in fact I was curious if you wanted me to join you on your little trip. I stare did Savo's fooling around damage even your regenerating brain stentor. She tsks I know very well the risks of such a thing but behind all of that hatred and self-righteousness Meridia is not a complete idiot, in fact most of the Dedra aren't. True enough. Besides, having her Omi even slightly will prove useful for what I need. She finishes. I stare at her for quite a while to make sure she is being serious while I would love to have all the extra support I can in there know that whatever happens to you due to this idiocy is completely your responsibility. She rolls her eyes I might not look at Revine but I am an old woman and can look out for myself. I shrug whatever you say oh honored elder, Jut don't expect me to stick my neck out for you if your brilliant plan backfires. Chivalry is dead. She sighs. I smirk yeah, and so are you. The next thing I know I am on the receiving end of a supernaturally strong kick to the shin, followed by a loud snapping sound. After I finally managed to heal up my leg, all while being watched by a infuriatingly smug Sibyl, I decided to agree to her request. If she is so certain she will survive I will accept her decision. As I am walking toward the tower to finish my preparations Marco appears from one of the side passages Ah teacher, there you are. Oh how I love the fact that I made him call a younger mare his teacher in front of everyone. Your eyes appear to be functioning properly brat. I say dryly. His doesn't even twitch at the brat comment. He takes a deep breath and says seriously I want to join you in exploring the temple. No. Be but. He starts. I raise a hand and stare at him I have no idea if I will be able to survive there, and you want me to babysit you. He shifts uneasily I know it is too soon, but I want to start actually fighting. He raises a hand and sparks appear in it I even managed the spell you asked for. 
Looking at the movement of Magica in his hand I am surprised at just how quickly he managed it after getting over the first hurdle. Nowhere near my own speed but still impressive. My long silence seems to unsettle him and he speaks again I don't need you to babysit me, just watch my back as you would any other ally and I will do my best to stay alive. My stare doesn't shift even slightly you do realize that to watch your back as any other ally I would have to rely on you watching my own. His look becomes determined and his voice is filled with conviction as he says if I can never leave the safety of constant protection how will I ever chase my dreams? If I die I die, all I ask is to be given a chance. I remain silent for a while longer, not breaking the stare down. Even after a minute of silence Marco remains determined and I sigh very well, you may follow me. He relaxes but I raise a hand remember this, we will likely be meeting a Didric prince in there the moment that she appears you will remain silent. I say very seriously. For the briefest of moments his eyes turn fearful, but he gathers himself and nods of course, I will not shame you or myself. Doubtful. I snort now go and explain to Viermo exactly what you are doing, I refuse to take responsibility for this foolishness. An annoyed refusal bubbles in his throat but my serious look is enough to dissuade him from speaking up, his shoulders slump and he heads to the Bard's College for what is going to be a very long conversation. Shaking my head I finally make my way to the tower's courtyard, and standing there waiting for me is a very nervous Davos. Is he also going to declare his desire to follow me? Well luckily for him he was going already whether he wanted to or not. Um, boss. He starts you know how I really don't like dealing with Didra and all. I nod. Well. Could I, um sit this one out. Hat. Chapter 89, Chapter Triple X, Kilkriath Temple, Part 1. General POV. Why me? Davos groans as their little group makes its way up the mountain toward the temple sitting upon its peak. Oh come now Davos Revine says cheerfully even the brat isn't complaining. Marco merely grunts, having no energy to respond. You two really should get out more. Sybil adds while giggling coquettishly. How are you not tired? Davos glares at her. One might think it is because she is a woman, but no, she really just looks very delicate, and seeing her walk for hours without problems would confuse anyone. She cups her chin and shrugs I guess I am just better than you. Davos grumbles something about cunt mages, probably forgetting that said mages usually have some form of enhanced hearing. Sybil turns to him sharply and smiles dangerously what did you just say? Davos shivers, but before he can receive a tongue lashing revine cuts in oh cut the poor man some slack, his old bones can't take it. His expression shifts besides. Only I get to bully my subordinates. She huffs kids these days, so greedy. The two non-mages of the group share a tired glance and merely shake their heads in defeated acceptance. After getting close to the temple the group makes a small camp and it is decided that they would take a rest. Going into a fight exhausted was idiotic after all. They set up a campfire and sat around it, well except for Sybil who chose to remain standing so as to not dirty her robes making everyone just a slight bit awkward for sitting down, much to her amusement. Davos and Revine went about preparing a simple meal, as it had become routine on their journey to solitude while Marco took out the lute he brought and started playing a relaxing melody. Davos listens for a bit and says would you look at that, the brat isn't half bad. Revine shrugs met, my own bards are better. Marco looks at him, still playing but slower your own bards. Indeed he preens ever so slightly I do own a rather prestigious inn in Winterhold after all. Instead of the expected curiosity, Marco's shoulders slump, but before he can whinge Revine raises an annoyed hand Oh don't pout, you are a god's damned mare. I wasn't about to pout. And what does being mare have to do with anything? Marco grumbles. With a tired drawl Revine explains you have literal centuries to do something with your life. Just because I got lucky early doesn't mean you should use me as an example. This comment seems to annoy Sybil for whatever reason but she keeps silent. 
Marco on the other hand shakes his head that is your answer for everything don't compare yourself to me. Instead of denying it, Ravine smirks you might not like it, but it is a fact that I have a very unfair advantage when it comes to magic, meaning I have an unfair advantage in everything I do. Marco stops playing and asks what kind of advantage could be so game-changing? Are you going to tell me you are the last blood of the Septims blessed with dragon blood? Davos snorts, and Ravine actually gags a bit gods no, I just see no reason to give you such private information. The resident bloodsucker raises a surprised eyebrow at Ravine's reaction not a fan of the Septims are you? Fishing for information are you now? Ravine's eye twitches and he gives a non-answer they were not well liked by my family. Sybil grumbles oh come on. That sounds like a fun story. Much more interesting than listening to an Altmer brat cry about his impotence. Marco glares at her, but the lessons about lashing out at mages seem to have stuck and he merely seethes in silence. Ravine ignores her and starts eating the stew they prepared and she seems to lose interest. As he was eating Marco once again started strumming his lute, he seemed to be thinking about something, and after some internal debate he asks teacher, I have been noticing something. Hmm. Ravine sends him a questioning look. How do I put this? He mulls over something whenever I play a tune or something, my magica seems to flow just a bit easier. Ravine swallows his meal you are telling me you can already feel a flow difference. Marco nods dumbly but quickly adds that doesn't matter now, what do you think about what I said? The Dunmer mage scratches his chin try channeling some now. He does so and after a bit, tiny sparks of lightning start dancing between the strings. Ravine's eyes widen and suddenly start glowing. The young bard seems uncomfortable but dares not stop, and after a time the glow in his teacher's eyes dissipates. Holy shit! Ravine mutters that is actually quite good. Sybil pipes in and how exactly do you figure that? No longer caring about his secret when faced with such a discovery Ravine blurts I quite literally can see magic, his flowed as well as if a novice used a basic staff while he played. Sybil you can see wah. Ravine's raised hand interrupts her later. She grumbles but relents. Marco took the distraction as an opportunity to calm himself and asks so. What do you think? If he were familiar with the idea Ravine's ravenous gaze would remind him of a mad scientist that just found something very interesting you just earned yourself some extra lessons brat. Oh. He gulps getting a very bad feeling. Ravine's POV. Bardic magic hey? Not all that surprising when you consider the influence music and sound have in this world, but still to be one of the first to actually witness it. Dumb luck or is something else going on? Well now I will have to make sure the brat doesn't get gutted in there, I am not taking the time to actually learn how to play an instrument just for this experiment. I am forced to leave those thoughts for later as we approach the imposing temple, made of pale stone and crowned with a massive statue of Meridia holding up the sun. Still begging Magnus to take you back I see. As we arrive at the peak I signal the others to stay behind and pull out Meridia's beacon. The moment I do so her imperious voice booms out, not damaging my hearing this time thankfully you have come as I commanded. A pause ensues, and I feel as if some force is judging me place my beacon upon the pedestal and hear your task. She commands and I quickly comply. The moment I do so I am enveloped in a bright light and find myself feeling the same displacement I feel whenever Mephila decides to show up, just a lot more resplendent. In front of me floats a ball of light, but I feel the gaze of the Didra behind it. Remembering to be respectful I bow Prince Meridia, I am honored you would personally take the time. As you should be mortal. Her voice implies that there was no other option than to be honored, she looks over my companions and seemingly stills for a moment if you thought that bringing another abomination to my temple would be amusing, know that amused I am not. Damn it Sybil she assured me that she had an offer you would appreciate, but that is between the two of you. Please tell me what I need to do to cleanse the temple. I try and change the topic. I can feel her annoyance at my non-answer, but thankfully after making me uncomfortable for a while she seemingly accepts my words and says very well, I will choose how to deal with her when she speaks to me. 
as she grumbles that out the light glows even more resplendent and her voice turns imperious once more once you descend into my sacred temple my light shall follow behind, lead it to my token of power and slay the necromancer's minions. I nod of course, what should I expect inside? You would ask for more assistance than this. She doesn't seem offended, merely curious. I quickly explain my lady, it is your temple we are cleansing from what you consider to be most profane, you ensuring we aren't surprised benefits both sides. Very well. I feel her haze fall downwards and after some observation she says you will be facing hundreds of shadows called up from the depths of the soul cairn. She seems to glow brighter as she channels more power toward the center of the temple a group of vampires await before my altar. Vampires? Not Makoran? I ask with some confusion. I feel her offense at the name as if it were my own as she growls he has absconded to join the rest of his foolish kind somewhere to the north. Naturally he was too weak to carry forth my artifact, leaving it for his borrowed underlings to guard. Better save the fact that we are about to slaughter all of them for later negotiations, pretending to be pleasantly surprised I ask borrowed from Lord Folkihar I presume. Indeed, the disgusting creature that calls itself Lord Harkon is still trying to escape his prison even after all these centuries. She seems very satisfied with this fact if the slight purr in her voice is any indication. Will this change of occupant make the cleansing more difficult? I ask. No. She states it will in fact make it easier for you as you won't have to deal with a master necromancer. A master? My eyes widen unbidden. I did say there were hundreds waiting for you child, were you not listening? She asks chidingly. I shake my head of course I was my lady, I was just surprised for a moment. I feel some amusement radiating of her as she hums pleasantly so naive mortals can be. Soon the atmosphere shifts and the ball of light glows blindingly bright as she once again commands imperiously go forth mortal. Strike the undead down with mine own wrath. I suddenly feel a soothing yet potent energy enter me, I quickly look at my notifications and then back at Meridia my eyes full of surprise. Meridia's wrath, the Lady of Life commands you to strike down the abominable undead, when fighting the profane creatures you may call upon her empowering your solar magic and imbuing your flames with her light. Fail at your task and be forever barred from her blessing, succeed fully and be blessed forevermore. The ball of light seems amused and the prince behind it even giggles very quietly do not be so surprised mortal, I am not so heartless as to throw you at my problems without some assurance. I take a deep breath and calm down this is rather surprising I have to admit. Seemingly reading my thoughts she huffs in annoyance I know what those fools say about me, there is no need to hide it. I will have you know I am the lady of life, not some greedy child. I pretend to relax somewhat that is good to hear then. All I say is good to hear mortal. I can feel her amusement now call forth the vampire, I would speak with her. I bow and am suddenly returned to Nirn. Everyone looks at me with a mix of worry and anticipation but I merely signal for Sybil to approach. She does so and is also enveloped in the bright light, thankfully not immediately getting disintegrated. She spends a very long time in conversation with the Didric Prince, but after a very tense 15 minutes for the three of us she emerges once again, unscathed. We all stare at her waiting for some kind of explanation but she just walks next to us and descends toward the temple's entrance are you coming with or will you all keep gawking like children? This snaps us out of our confusion and we rush after her. As I approach the main gate of the temple, it opens on its own and I hear the familiar sound of my system. Quest issued, cleanse the temple of Meridia reward, solar infusion, scorch. About damn time I got something for my hawk boy. With renewed determination I take the first step into the abyss. Chapter 90, Chapter XXXI, Kilkriath Temple, Part 2 The atmosphere of the temple is eerie to say the least, I felt as if the shadows themselves were trying to beckon me into their embrace, permanently. For a moment I thought I would have to deal with the uncomfortable feeling the entire time inside, but Meridia came through quickly and a beam of sacred light shot through the darkness cleansing the feeling and revealing the temple's marbled halls. It would have been beautiful, 
had the entrance not been almost buried in desiccated bodies of what looked like merchants and travelers, many of them showing clear signs of soul drain. The moment we saw this Marco started heaving to the side, tears in his eyes. Sybil sniffed so uncivilized. Prefer your bodies well ordered do you? I snark. Her agreement is as swift as it is certain of course, only amateurs pile their subjects up like this. Hmm. Meridia herself did say that the necromancer was a master. I note. She shrugs well then he must have let his apprentices have their way with these ones. Davos cuts in while I understand that this is fascinating and all, can you do this after we aren't in mortal danger? Right. I agree, and look at Marco are you going to continue shaming yourself brat or are we going in? The bard seems to have stopped his little fit and stands up while giving the place another disgusted look how can you look at this and then joke about it? Oh, I am rather disgusted myself make no mistake. I just don't let it take me out of commission for enough time to get killed ten times over. I stare at him judgingly and he winces. Come on boys. Sybil calls from in front of the next door I would rather return to the city sometime this year. We follow her deeper in the light guiding us through a long hallway decorated with carvings venerating Meridia, surprisingly left untouched by the current occupants. Or were they protected somehow? As we enter a much greater hall, likely the place where sermons were once held, the light beam that was guiding us stops atop a pedestal on the other side of the room. While we walk carefully toward the obvious key forward Marco looks around with fear in his eyes isn't it really weird that we saw no trace of the undead yet? I groan you just had to say it. Wah! Damn it brat! Davos spits on the ground. I'm... Foolish boy. Sybil sighs. But I didn't do anything. Any further protests died in his throat when the shadows themselves seemed to grow heavier and press down on the now tiny light protecting us from the unnatural darkness. It didn't end there. Hollow groans and painful screeches echoed throughout the halls from all sides around us. It was time then. Marco in the center, Davos guard his back, Sybil, and I will hold the front. I quickly instruct my allies. We take our positions around the pedestal holding the second beacon, and just in time as a bunch of blackened skeletons emitting some form of dark smoke-like aura enter the light. They seem to be pushed back for a moment, many of them growling in pain but it is for a mere moment as the entire horde charges in as one. Arrows start flying at us and I am forced to cast a wide wind cloak just so we don't get immediately slaughtered. Marco seems absolutely terrified but surprisingly forces himself to start throwing lightning sparks at the undead, doing pitiful damage. Davos, already having gotten used to getting dragged into unholy situations with me merely starts firing off flaming bolts from his now enchanted crossbow. And Sybil. I was honestly expecting her to light the entire place on fire, but what I saw was far from that and somehow more terrifying than the expected explosion of pyromancy. Sharp claws extended from her fingers and her flesh seems to have turned into ebony as a dark cloak of energy surrounded her, draining the strength from the undead around her. She charged into the darkness without a care in the world and a sadistic smile on her face. The moment she disappeared into it I started hearing bones breaking followed by disturbingly joyful laughter. Were all vampires like that? Or did she merely take Faraldas' teachings too seriously? And why, for the love of God did I get a tingle from seeing it? No matter, these puppets won't cut themselves down. I return to the present and decide to try out the new toy I was given. Lady of Life, banish the darkness. I yell out loud because of course a power given by her would require a cringe-inducing incantation, and the moment I do so the same light guiding us inside suffuses my entire being. I feel a pleasant warmth embrace me, making me feel content even in this kind of situation. Forcing the feeling down I summon my familiar who blasts off into the enemy surrounded by a blinding inferno and call upon my solar magic. The spells flow as if I was casting a mere candle light. The light coming off of the uncast spells was blinding, and the moment it appears all undead around me flinch in agony. Giving them no time to collect themselves I start firing sunbeams all around me disintegrating most with but a mere graze, 
some resist for a moment but a moment is all they get as I focus them down. Just when I think this is going to be easy I hear a loud growl behind me and a massive bone-armored hulk exits the darkness, I point my hand at it but another skeleton throws itself at me interrupting my spell. The massive thing swings its club at me and I am forced to throw myself in the other direction, its friend is not so lucky as it gets broken into tiny pieces by the strike. I fire a sunbolt at it, but runes cover the bone armor, and the spell fizzles out. Taking a quick look to decipher the enchantment I noticed that it was specifically made to resist sunlight. Good thing I am not a one-trick pony, I smirk and summon a golden fireball in my hand and immediately launch it at the creature. It doesn't even have the time to flinch as it turns into ash. Seeing the effectiveness of what I am going to call sacred flames from now on, I start bombarding the surrounding area with fireballs, making sure to avoid blasting Sibyl, and the undead assault seems to slow down. Unfortunately, all it does is slow down, as the horde shows no signs of diminishing in numbers. The moment I cut down a group of undead another takes its place. Sybil dashes out of the darkness, her robes ripped and covered in blood, her own most likely, and she takes a position behind me I held them off as long as possible, now it's your turn to enter the meat grinder. She says, all her previous delight gone. Did you at least deal with the archers? I ask. She scoffs as she fires off a firebolt at the head of another larger skeleton what do you take me for boy? A woman irritated that she had to bleed again apparently. I snark while continuing my bombardment. She twitches and I sense her glare, even if she is looking away bleeding women jokes, really. I am adept in the art of comedy. I say in a deadpan voice. I turn to see how the other two are faring, and they are thankfully still alive. Davos just has this dead look in his eyes as he reloads his crossbow at speeds that are most assuredly not healthy for his fingers. Marco seems completely exhausted after casting even the most basic spells for so long, and he stumbles back toward the pedestal we had to our backs, accidentally pushing the beacon within and making it lift and come into contact with the oncoming light. The moment this happens the suffocating darkness in the room is banished by a blinding flash of light and the smoke the undead were emitting disappears in an instant, followed by quite a bit of their power. The undead at the edges of the hall start withdrawing. Press the attack. I yell immediately and start throwing fireballs like a complete madman. The magic off flowing through me starts to feel intoxicating, especially since I have long since crossed the usual amount my body is used to containing due to my rings. The explosions I make start looking like the most beautiful paintings and the feeling of power I get from seeing my enemies turn to ash makes me start cackling like a madman as I charge into the now disorganized skeletons. Davos POV First it is Dragor, then it is bandits, then spiders, and now undead that seem to have crawled out right out of Malag Bal's scrotum. I really need to find a better job. I turn to see my boss cackling like a madman and chasing down the undead that are somehow showing fear. Yeah, definitely need a new job. I look at the other mage, who seemed to have calmed down somewhat now that the undead were slowly retreating, and ask while pointing at Dagoth Jr. Is he going to be all right? She blinks and then looks at my boss. Oh, don't worry, just a magic ah hi. He will calm down after a bit. Are you fu no? Calm down, Davos. You lot can get high on magic ah now. She giggles into her bloodied hand, and what a disturbing sight that is, of course. Just imagine all that power flowing through you. She licks her lips, making me shiver, and do remember that he is currently channeling a Dedric Prince's power. Oh it must be delightful. She moans. I stare at her dumbly and just decide to check up on the brat, I just hope I can save up enough money and escape this bunch of madmen before I join them in their insanity. I hear Revine shout come here kitties, daddy has a present. Followed by an explosion. Sigh it's already far too late for that, isn't it? Revine's POV. I blink my eyes a couple of times and look around. I stand looking at the passage the undead retreated through and notice that I am surrounded by singed bones and weapons. My body feels like it is on fire, and feel most of my magic ah is gone. What an oblivion just happened. Done with your little episode. 
I hear Sybil behind me. What? I ask dumbly. She giggles oh you seem to have gone a bit feral with so much power, it was quite funny to watch you scream obscenities at the dead like some kind of deranged scamp. What? Sigh just come here and take a seat, you need to rest after that. My mind is a bit of a mess right now so I just follow her and slump down next to the pedestal. It takes some time for my wits to return and I look back at what happened. I knew it was possible to get a bit high on Magicka if you really go overboard, but this went far beyond all my expectations, and the worst part is that I felt like I wanted to feel it again. And wasn't that a terrifying thought? Chapter 91, Chapter XXXII, Kilkriath Temple, Part 3 We all decide to take a proper rest after that battle, we might have culled the number of undead but we can't be sure just how many of them await on the other side. So Davos. I hear Marco say to my left why did you get into this business? Davos who seems to be chewing something grunts and swallows you don't survive the streets of Windhelm as an orphan without toughening up and learning to hide from prying eyes. He seems to reminisce for a moment then I guess I just got good enough at not getting seen or caught that I get to be paid for it now. Ah, such a tragic little story Sybil says condescendingly from her position at the door leading forward. Davos sighs what do you want woman? So rude. She huffs playfully I am bored and waiting for you lot to rest up so we can go on is getting very annoying. He glares at her and how come you aren't tired then? I saw you almost fly into those skeletons. I turn just in time to see her lick her lips well that my dear is because the undead don't get tired. Davos sighs and nods to himself, then starts grumbling something unintelligible obviously frustrated. Marco on the other hand looks at her dumbly what do you mean by that exactly? She winks at him and waves him off oh don't worry your pretty little head about it. He blushes, making her giggle. I felt a bit of charm hit the boy, but as long as she doesn't go overboard I don't care. You are one sadistic woman. I say and before she can respond Scorch flies back through the door, sending me his memories of what awaits in front of us. Sybil is the first to ask so what has the little fire chicken seen? Scorch as any good boy immediately flips her the bird making her eye twitch. It is mostly hallways and personal rooms from here, the last one was closed but I expect it is the reliquary holding the artifact we are here for. I explain. You never did say what exactly we were here for. Davos says while cleaning up our campsite. Probably forgot about it not that it mattered for our preparations. I shrug and explain we are here for the sword known as Dawnbreaker, also widely seen as the primary artifact of Meridia. Marco lets out a quiet gasp I saw this sword mentioned in many stories, uncountable heroes are said to have wielded it against vile necromancers. It is surprising it found its way into Skirim. Not really I shake my head Didric artifacts have a tendency of traveling on their own to the place they might be needed. It just so happens that Skirim is going to be the center of many important events in the coming years so it is not that surprising it is here. Interesting. My bardic student mutters what do you mean by many important events? Hmm, the most obvious one is that the conflict between Stormcloak and the King will inevitably erupt to greater proportions, thus leading to many other problems of the less than natural variety rearing their ugly heads all across the province. He pales there will be war then. I nod seriously without question. Why has no one tried to do anything about it if it is so obvious to everyone? And what would you have them do Marco? Ulfric is far too belligerent and ambitious to accept anything less than the crown and killing him will just make a martyr out of him, while the High King is constantly getting sabotaged by the Thalmer, not to mention the other issues he has to face. He stares off into the distance there really is nothing to be done then. I take a swig from my waterskin and say plainly this conflict has been in the making for well over a decade now, all we can hope to do is reduce the damage when it does happen. Sybil laughs quietly come now Revine, why would you care if a bunch of fools decide to slaughter each other? Let them cut each other to pieces I say. Marco gives her a surprised look aren't you the king's court mage? She merely smiles indeed, I am first and foremost a mage. Meaning I shouldn't care all too much about the conflicts of lessers. I snort lessers. 
really. She shrugs I know my place in life, why should I pretend otherwise? I roll my eyes whatever you say. Now while I agree that participating in a civil war would be a massive waste of time and possibly lead to my death, need I remind you of the part where the war will cause supernatural issues all over the province? What could a mundane war possibly cause? She raises an eyebrow. Something like, say. I scratch my chin a vampiric lord finally breaking through the prison that is his home and wreaking havoc on the mortals while enthralling those of his bloodline who previously escaped his clutches. She is in front of me in a split second, but I don't even flinch, having fully expected it, with a threatening stare she slowly asks you aren't playing with me are you now? Because trust me Revine I am not amused. I wouldn't joke about something like this. I say carefully. She throws her hands up in frustration of course this damnable world can't let me have my peace. Just prepare for it then. I calmly state. Her head snaps back in my direction just prepare is it? Do you know just who exactly we are talking about? Someone who bleeds. I say simply. Seeing as I wasn't going to elaborate she asks impatiently your point Revine. I smile simple, if it bleeds we can kill it. We soon proceed deeper into the temple, the halls are far more narrow, making attacking us a far less attractive prospect. Along the way we find more beacons and light them up, slowly spreading Meridia's power throughout the monument. I decide that we would skip pillaging this one, seeing as the resident Didra is literally watching us at the moment doing anything that could be considered a desecration would be a really bad idea. We finally arrive at the entrance to the reliquary and waiting for us stood all of the remaining undead, exactly in front of the final beacon's pedestal. In front of the small army stood what I was certain was an actual Folkihar agent, if his style of dress was anything to go by. The youthful vampire smiled at our approach so the heroes finally descend into the jaws of death. We expected you earlier. He says mockingly. Your friends toss you out here to deal with us alone then. I ask, mocking him back. The vampire snarls silence mortal. A toothy smile is my response or... What are you going to do about it? He turns around and heads to the final door I won't be doing anything. Enjoy the reception prepared for you. The moment he closes the doors behind him the horde of skeletons charge at us, the fight is once again a hard fought one, but this time we quickly retreated into one of the hallways and after a long and tedious process of grinding them down at a choke point, with Sybil and I doing most of the work the undead are all turned to ash. As I am checking for more attackers I hear Sybil hiss and turn to see her clutching her singed arm watch your damned aim Revine, I know you are feeling peppy with your new powers, but I don't like getting sunburned. Maybe you shouldn't jump into my spells like some kind of caffeinated hamster. I snark back. A caffeinated hamster? Really? She deadpans. It sums up your movements perfectly. I raise my nose at her. While Sybil is deciding whether to be insulted or not I approach the two remaining members of our party the two of you should stay behind for this one. Davos immediately agrees as you say boss. Marco, who is sporting many scratches and small cuts at this point, merely slumps onto the ground waiting for the potion I gave him to kick in. After making sure they remained alert I head toward the final gate as Sybil and I get closer to the final fight I ask how strong do you think they will be? She sniffs the air, earning a comical look from me don't look at me like that, if I can make use of my enhanced senses you can bet your grey ass I will. So grouchy madam, does the mosquito need a sip? I snark. The madwoman actually purrs, sending a shiver down my spine don't tempt me. As the madam says. I quickly surrender. To answer your question, none of them seem to be vampiric lords. She says after her some time. Met one have you? It would be nice to learn about their actual power. Now it is her turn to have a shiver run down her spine as she says I would rather not talk about it. Maybe later then of course I not in understanding any advice. Don't die she chirps. With a roll of my eyes I kick open the door and am met with six hungry red eyes. The same vampire that spoke to us outside steps in front of the other two who seem to defer to him 
he looks us over and scoffs I knew I should have killed you myself, now I will have to explain to that brat Makoran that his skeletons got destroyed. You don't sound all that unhappy about it. I say while examining them. He smirks aren't you a perceptive little mortal? And aren't you arrogant for a mere bloodsucker's servant? I say and before he can react launch a golden fireball at him. Without even flinching he dissipates into a cloud of bats and appears at the other end of the room how pitiful. Ahoy! Uh -huh. I say in a deadpan and pull out a solar cloak scroll activating it immediately, and rush toward him. Sybil naturally had the good sense to distance herself and started attacking the other two vampires with fireballs of her own. The lead vampire pulls out his sword what is this? A mage dares enter melee with an elder vampire. I snort and summon my staff while calling him on his bravado oh please, you wouldn't know an elder if you saw one. He snarls and rushes me, his elven sword aimed at my heart. I evade and swing for his leg, but he once again uses his bat teleportation ability to distance himself while patting himself with his free hand due to the minor damage caused by my cloak spell I see you aren't that useless after all, maybe I will make a thrall out of you. You will try. I grasp my staff with both hands and prepare. He wants to taunt me again but I am moving once more, I pretend to go in for an attack but instead summon Scorch who distracts him by flying into his face just enough for me to land a strike on his leg, setting it on fire. Arg! He flinches back you piece of filth. I will have your head. He drops his blade and claws grow out of his fingers, it seems I may have pissed him off a wee bit. Sybil's POV they turn absolutely anyone these days it would appear. The youngling takes a swing at my head but it is so incredibly slow I might fall asleep, unfortunately the other one also attacks so I have to actually put in some effort. Is every vampire these days a damn brute? Do they not have the good sense to use the incredible amount of time they have for anything besides gorging themselves on blood? What a bunch of children! Another quick dodge and another gash in the little pup's side. How very uncouth, let a lady monologue will you. Before the one I wounded can recover I flash to the next one and he alone is nowhere near enough to fight me off. His head meets the ground and turns to ash within moments. I turn to the other one but suddenly a blinding light explodes from the reliquary. What did that foolish boy do now? Revines POV, a bit earlier. The angered vampire flashes in front of me and rapidly swipes with his claws. I managed to block one but the other sinks into my thigh. Probably would have lost that leg without iron flesh being active. The beast goes in for a bite but instead of flinching I stare at him and shout YOL. He dodges rapidly, only getting his skin burned off but keeping all his limbs. He lets out another maddened shriek and somehow grows even faster, this time I don't manage to block any of his attacks and even through my armor I feel the claws rake my chest and arm. Suppressing a pained growl I launch him away with telekinesis and start brainstorming a response, I could bombard the fucker with spells but he will just dodge and single word shouts aren't strong enough. As thoughts race through my mind I notice a dim glow coming from the reliquary and remember the sword. The mad beast dashes at me once more, but this time I look away from him and at the blade I came here for wood. I appear in front of it and almost as if purposely timed a beam of light comes from the other room ending just above the relic. I pull the sword out of its venerated position, just as I feel a shadow come over me, and place the sheathed blade into the light. The moment the handle touches the light beam an explosion of solar energies erupts all around me, launching my enemy away and burning his skin off fully. I quickly unsheathe the sword and am enveloped by the same feeling I got while channeling Meridia earlier just a lot more focused. I feel the blade trying to change me, inviting me to surrender myself over to the service of its master, but after my earlier rampage I have already steeled myself for something like this and I take the power it offers into the iron grip of my mind. The self-proclaimed elder vampire has just enough time to let out a final maddened shriek as I raise the blade up on high and swing down, launching a blade of golden light. The pitiful creature is completely disintegrated and I quickly sheathe the whispering blade, making its seductive power dissipate and turn to see Sybil draining the remaining vampire dry. I blink you sure that is sanitary. She groans and drops him onto the ground you just had to ruin my victory meal. 
whatever, we have a Adra to meet. I wish I bit my tongue as the room shifts into a shimmering palace, and upon the throne at its other end sits a woman of such beauty, one might forget she was a demon then and there. Do not fret, for I am already here children. She says with a smile that sends shivers down my spine. Chapter 92, Chapter XXXIII, Meridia's Games We both stare at her wordlessly, both Sybil and I mesmerized by her aura and appearance. The literal image of perfection, pale skin and blonde hair with bright blue eyes, wearing a gown that is just revealing enough to be seductive yet not enough to be in any way undignified. I quickly snap out of it and discreetly kick my vampire colleague's foot, thus waking her up. Meridia seems amused by my behavior but doesn't otherwise react. After we finally gather ourselves she speaks to me I see you refused my sword's true gift. I hold back a scoff and say while I am flattered by the invitation, I think our spidery acquaintance already made it rather clear what my thoughts on eternal servitude are. A shame. She says delicately you would have done quite well in my auroran host. How arrogant. Why should I let you keep my blade or my blessing if you will not be my champion? She asks after a moment of tense silence. Good thing I came prepared for such questions because my lady I plan on using it to battle the undead all across Skirim, and whether or not I am your champion I would still be wielding your blade. She cups her chin in thought you are of course right, but why would I not simply seek another that would serve me gladly? I hide a smirk because you called for me specifically, and great were the rewards promised to me, is the lady of infinite energies a liar I wonder. The atmosphere shifts and I feel a great pressure slam onto my very soul, but she isn't the only one with unhealthy amounts of pride here so I manage to remain standing. Such determination. She says in what I see as false approval hiding her annoyance I am impressed. Very well, you may keep the blade until I find another champion worthy of wielding it, my blessing however I shall reclaim. Trait lost, Meridia's wrath. I feel the soothing aura of her energy leave me completely, leaving behind a feeling of great loss. Yet it still feels better to me than being under her influence, and I already remember casting spells empowered by it, it is only a matter of time until I steal her blessing back. Five years. I say after taking some deep breaths to calm down. Oh. The question about me making more daring demands goes unasked. I press on undeterred I need the blade for five years, after that I will willingly give it to whoever it is you choose. She looks into my eyes for an uncomfortable amount of time, then she seems to relent and says very well young Lord Dagoth, you may keep my token for five mortal years. Bear it in my honor. Despite her outing my secret and trying to mind rape me, I came here prepared for such things so I bow wordlessly. Still, I will remember her betrayal no matter how minor. Sybil gives me a stare that promises a questioning later and looks at the Didric Prince without saying anything, she knows damn well that her situation is far more precarious than mine. I admit. Meridia begins that I was quite furious when a vampire approached my sacred temple. I hold back a laugh, barely keeping myself from pointing out that there were three already inside. And yet she goes on you have given me a most interesting offer. But that does beg the question, why should I give you what you desire without making you one of my own? She seems unwilling to honor whatever deal they made and I see Sybil start to shift uncomfortably, likely holding back her rage at the perceived betrayal. If I may I cut in, much to both of their annoyance I have a way to sweeten whatever deal the two of you have made. Sybil glares at me threateningly, if I fucked this up she would not let it go easily, or ever. Go on the prince commands. I incline my head and speak the army of solitude will be assaulting a den of undead soon, if say Sybil here were to join such an expedition and dedicate all of those slain by her hand to you would that make you more agreeable to her offer. Meridia seems to be thinking it over while Sybil seems both relieved and frustrated. After some pondering the prince nods to herself very well, you shall slay two dozen necromancers in my name within the next month. If you do so I will grant your request. Sybil schools her features and quickly bows my thanks, my lady. Meridia scoffs you both proclaim me your lady, and yet you refuse to offer your service. 
I might be offended if I were less magnanimous. She waves her hand be gone now. There is a snap and we are back in the real world. Oh I am not like they portray me damn bitch. Both Sybil and I are silent for a time until I decide to break that silence what did you ask of her anyways. She shifts uncomfortably yet still answers I wanted her to mitigate some of the more annoying aspects of my condition in return for helping out her followers from time to time. Told you vampirism was a cheap path to immortality. I blurred immediately. Her eye twitches and it is her turn to pry into my business I know little Lord Ling. Sigh yes I am indeed a little Lord Ling, what of it? Oh nothing. I am just curious why you would go to such lengths to hide such a prestigious background. Prestigious. My eyebrow attempts to escape by head at this point. She smiles why of course, most of the mundane fools consider your proud ancestor to be an evil sorcerer and devil, while on the other hand, most of the enlightened view him as a visionary who went beyond the foolish rulings of mortals. I narrow my eyes at her you are really open about your disdain for them. She huffs you speak as if you weren't disdainful of the plebeians yourself. I give her a questioning look. She starts slowly circling me while speaking they might not notice it, but I do. You look down on each and every last one of them. The way you dare to speak to the king himself without care, the way you drink a noble's poison and call out its poor quality in his face. I could list so many more things but the point is you are no better than me, you merely haven't accepted it yet. As she finishes she places a hand on my shoulder. I shrug I am naturally capable of acting in the wrong. She removes the hand in annoyance what is so wrong about knowing you are better. Because Sybil I say firmly if you underestimate them, they shall surpass you and you will no longer be the better. Would they be wrong then to disdain you then? She huffs such childish notions. Then shakes her head very well, you may believe what you will. I will be there when you are ready to admit you are wrong. I shall consider it a challenge then. I bow dramatically. As we head to the exit she says oh and revine. I turn back and look at her. She smiles gently thank you for your help with the negotiation, truly. We both agreed I would bear all the consequences of my foolish decision and you helped me in spite of that. Maybe I was mesmerized by that bit of charm you tried and made a foolish mistake due to my youthful desires? Who knows? I make a show of checking her out. She waves me off and passes next to me while swaying her hips seductively. Whatever you say dear she says in a sing-song voice and before I can respond she is already out of the room. Damn tease. We rejoin our two other companions who were all kinds of worried while we were inside the reliquary. Marco is the first to speak did you get it then? I point to the sheathed blade resting on my right hip and his eyes widen in wonder. UMM, boss. Davos begins slowly. Yes, Davos. You have a bit of gold in your eyes. I immediately summon a hand mirror I have with me and take a look. Just around my pupils, my red eyes are tainted by a small circle of gold with tiny lines spreading out of it not enough to be jarring or too eye-catching, but just enough to be noticeable. I groan she just couldn't resist marking me could she? Sybil looks ready to make a disdainful comment about her but remembers where she is and literally bites her tongue. After it regenerates, yes she bit it that hard, she says teasingly I think it is rather charming actually. Uh-huh. I deadpan and then my face pales and I groan once more Osavos is going to be insufferable about this. Sybil breaks out into a giggling fit, knowing full well the teasing I am in for. Davos on the other hand merely shakes his head one of these days dealing with Didra will come to bite you in the ass, boss. I shrug guess I will just have to develop Didra resistant at cheeks then. He snorts sure, let's go with that. Our return to solitude was swift and without any breaks, we all wanted to return to the city as soon as possible to rest properly from the day's events. We left Marco at the Bard's College to a very worried-looking Viermo. The old mare glared at me, but he knew he couldn't say anything to me without being a hypocrite so the tongue lashing was reserved for his nephew. Not wanting to go through another long climb at the tower I used a scroll of invisibility and just levitated up to the tower balcony, I could hear Sybil's frustrated facepalm from all the way up. 
The moment I entered my room I threw myself into my bed and its welcoming embrace almost knocked me out on the spot. But there was still something important to do. I summoned Scorch and claimed my mission reward from the system. My familiar looked at me curiously for a moment, but then suddenly burst into flames and condensed into a tiny ball of bright energy, my hand moved on its own and a beam of sunfire connected with Scorch making him glow brighter and brighter. After once again channeling a power that was not my own for some time, Scorch's aura seemed to settle and there he stood, smaller than before yet still imposing for a bird of his kind, but now instead of merely having flaming embers between his feathers he was straight up burning, and his ashen coloring was now that of flaming orange. Summoning Bonds Scorch Solar Hawk, an ashen hawk infused with Magnus Light, capable of healing and able to burn away the darkness. Grants its master moderate regeneration along with greater prowess over flames and restoration. Abilities Solar Flare, detonates its current form in a grand explosion. Solar Cloak a cloak of sunfire that deals increased damage to undead slash Dedra. Soothing presence, its mere presence calms and heals those it considers friends. Healing touch, it heals on touch, who would have thought. Rapid rebirth, after banishment or detonation it reforms within ten minutes. I pat my glorious hawk boy on the head and he drowsily dissipates back into my magicka, and I immediately feel his calming presence relax me after the long day. Unfortunately, I can't sleep just yet. I take out Dawnbreaker and inspect it. Dawnbreaker, sealed the sacred blade of Meridia said to be the ultimate bane of all undead, deals sunfire damage on each strike, disintegrates weaker undead on touch, sealed to deep wound, and doubles, sealed to 50%, their restoration prowess. The blade has been cursed by Meridia to constantly whisper promises of power to the bearer once unsheathed in an attempt to lure them into her permanent service. Goddamn foo at, percent, number percent number at percent, at dollar, at dollar, at number, number at. Sigh calm down Revine, you expected this. It is just a petty Dedra and her shiny toy, there is no need to break anything. I hear a knock on my door and with a groan get up from my bed, Opening it I am greeted by a Sybil wearing a rather, delicious looking nightgown. I raise an eyebrow I am fairly certain that you got the wrong room. She huffs oh don't play coy with me Revine. You didn't think a simple thank you is all I would give for your help today did you? As she says that she enters my apartment and drags me to my bedroom. Maybe this day isn't so bad after all. Chapter 93, Chapter XXXIV, The Birds and the Bards once again I find myself waking up with a tired groan, though this time the tiredness came from a far more enjoyable source than getting beaten up by an angry orc librarian. What was I expecting trying to outlast a creature with theoretically infinite stamina? I look at Sybil who is quietly snoring with a bit of drool at the edge of her mouth. Cute, for a blood-sucking monstrosity that is. Better leave her alone. I don't want to get accidentally slapped by a vampire who doesn't like getting up in the morning. I slowly disentangle myself from her and get up from the bed. Oof. My poor hips barely survived all that, death by snoo snoo is definitely not just a myth in this world if my recent experience is anything to go by. I put on my formal clothes and move to a window and open it wide to let in some fresh air, but he moment I do so the window slams shut pushed by a sudden and precise wave of magicka. I slowly turn to see a very pissed-looking Sybil glaring at me really revine. What? No seriously, what? She blinks what gave you the idea I would enjoy getting woken up by the morning sun. Oh. I say dumbly. She groans and covers herself again, but after a moment sighs and gets up ugh, now I can't even go back to sleep. She glares at me but there is no heat behind it you have to make it up for me. How about some coffee? I ask quickly, ready to spread the belief of the one true drink. I think you know I prefer a different kind of drink. She licks her lips. I frown no. She pouts fie -e -e, I guess coffee will do. And flops back onto the bed. With a quiet chuckle I leave to cook some up while she gets dressed. We spend the early morning talking about insignificant things, 
pointedly avoiding the topic of Meridia, as neither wanted to ruin the other's day by mentioning the cheating bitch. As we finish discussing the finer points of annoying the nobility I decide it is time to ask the question so. She seems to pick up my intention immediately and smirks so. I guess there is no need to beat between the bush was last night merely just the reward or did you wish for something more? She giggles into her hand oh Revine have you already fallen so deeply for my charms? I let out an amused breath I have barely gotten to know you, did I give the impression of a young mare thinking with his loins? How very mature of you! She coos, practically radiating amusement I guess you will just have to impress me again if you want to find out. Right. I roll my eyes at her antics. She gets up from her seat well as lovely as talking to you is dear I am afraid we both have work to do and it wouldn't do for the plebeians to start rumors. I go to respond to her comment but she approaches me with that unnatural vampiric speed and gives me a quick peck on the cheek before disappearing in an instant, likely to her own room, leaving me to my own thoughts. Before my hormones can make me act like a horny teenager again I focus my thoughts on more important matters. The fight against the bone men and vampires on Mount Kilkriath went exceptionally easily when compared to all my expectations, but I was channeling Adidra's blessing at the time so I shouldn't expect a repeat of such an overwhelming victory anytime soon. Advancing my solar magic was obviously a must, thankfully I was already quite far on that road seeing as I did spend the last four days writing down scrolls on the topic. Speaking of solar things. I really should check up on Scorch now that he got the time to rest up. I quickly cast the conjuration spell and summon him. No longer looking as drowsy as yesterday he takes a majestic pose and stares at me. You doing all right there boy? I ask. He tilts his head and much to my surprise I hear him speak in a melodic and chirpy voice since when do you speak bird pops? I blink slowly and then burst out laughing. Scorch just stares at me in confusion and I quickly calm down while wiping away a tear. I smirk at him I am sorry to tell you this Scorch, but we aren't speaking bird, we are speaking elf. He seems stunned and falls over as if shot no. I have been touched by your degenerate ways. SNRK don't worry my boy, you will get over it. He stands up abruptly and points an accusatory wing at me get over it. My perfect image has been ruined. I scratch my chin I think being able to do more than chirp would have done quite well for your image, who would you even speak bird to, other birds? Do they even have much to say? I see him twitch as if struck maybe they don't but I'll have you know bird is a much better language than the gibberish you featherless degenerates love to speak. If bird is so majestic, why does no one take the time to learn it then? I ask. He looks at the ground for a moment and then snaps back to me because you are all too dumb to learn it. Right. I chuckle quick question, how exactly are you able to speak right now? He stares at me as if I was an idiot I always could speak, as I said you are just too dumb. Sigh how are you able to speak Tamrelic Scorch? He shrugs with his wings when you did that weird thing with the nice fire yesterday I suddenly felt like I could understand what people were saying more clearly. I thought the world was finally enlightened, but as you love saying reality is often disappointing. Hmm, so the evolution made you capable of intelligent speech. Rather odd, but not unwelcome I mutter and then look at him again do you have an idea of what you can do now? He bobs his head like a peacock yes, I am much mightier now. Then twitches his head cutely I can also heal you if you are into that sort of thing. SNRK I too can heal but help is always welcome. I look him over what do you think of your new look? He shifts uncomfortably well, at first I thought I became one of those enwas you keep mentioning, but now I kind of like it. He seems very unsure. I burst out laughing again, I have a racist bird for a familiar. With another chuckle, I ask do you even know what an enwa is scorch? He scratches the bottom of his beak with his wing, likely imitating me and says I thought it meant those fools that are too degenerate to have a proper grey colour, but now I am not so sure. After all, there is no way I am one. I face palm well, you see. After educating my familiar, who seemed to consider me his father, not that I minded at all, 
in the ways of Dunmary racism and earning myself some very judgmental bird stares I spent some time listening to him excitedly retell our adventures from his own childish perspective. Well, I say childish but the glee with which he spoke about clawing out my enemy's eyes was kind of worrisome, then again he was a combative creature in nature so it was good. Still though listening to a creature that minutes earlier called you its father talk about how nice it is to pop someone's eyeballs would worry even the coldest of killers. I left him summoned atop the tower and told him he can fly about, but not to bother anyone, and especially not to touch Sybil, I had no idea what kind of reaction that would cause so it was best to err on the side of caution. The mad bird actually asked if she was an Enwa and that is why he shouldn't touch her which almost killed me right then and there. After warning Sybil about burning racist birds in the tower I left the confused vampire behind and headed to the bard's college, it was time to see about that bardic magic. I found my intrepid student leaning against the outer wall of the bard's college with a red mark on his cheek. I look him over and notice a couple more faded marks all over his face failed to seduce another maid Marco. He groans I wish. Oh. I told uncle about our great battle hoping he would praise me for my bravery. He shakes his head in self-pity what a fool I was, the moment I explained to him the danger of our fight with the undead he proceeded to beat me and left me to sleep in the yard. I laugh at him earning a glare what? I told you it was a dumb idea, the fact you are alive should be considered an act of divine favor considering the number of enemies we faced. Yeah he sighs maybe I am not cut out for this kind of life. I visibly roll my eyes already giving up are we? And what am I to do? He rages but manages to keep his voice down enough not to make a scene how am I ever to catch up to the likes of you and Sybil God's damned stentor. You are one stupid mare I hope you know that. I say immediately. If you say don't compare yourself to us IWI he starts but I interrupt him with a huff. You will what? Seeth harder. I ask sternly. His shoulders slump I guess. Now as I was saying, you are a fucking dumbass. I repeat much to his dissatisfaction. Then please enlighten me oh great teacher. He spreads his arms. I raise a finger first, don't speak to me like that if you don't want flight lessons. He flinches and I raise another finger second, you literally discovered a new way to empower magic and you are sitting here crying about your uncle justifiably chastising you instead of spending each and every moment of your time researching the boundaries of your discovery. He raises his head slowly it can't be that powerful, can it? I scoff of course it can, maybe not in the same way my staff is, but that is why we should do our best to discover the limits of what this new branch of magic can do. I say placatingly, and quickly add maybe then you will stop crying like a little girl every time something doesn't go your way. Instead of exploding this time he merely nods, exchanging his self-doubt with the confidence he had when he asked to join me you are right. I should fight on. No great hero is born without hardship. Not to stop your little hype up I say fully intending to stop his little hype up but I have no intention of teaching you so you can be a hero. What? He blinks. Once again I adopt a stern expression heroes are those who sacrifice themselves for others and I will not have my time wasted by suicidal fools. He rolls his eyes you know what I meant. No. I lie no I do not. I just want the glory. He huffs what is the point of earning glory if I die, yes. I let out a satisfied chuckle much better, now let's get moving. I don't have all day. We walked to the palace and I forced Marco to spend his entire pool of magicka ten times over while almost force feeding him potions to keep him going. Davos joined us halfway through to continue his own training in pyromancy but spent most of his time mocking Marco due to his situation. Well until I started throwing undercharged lightning bolts at him every time he interrupted us that is. We found out that bardic spells work best for illusion magic, especially with sound-based illusions as expected, and much to my surprise with an odd mix of wind magic and telekinesis, creating some kind of sound blast. Naturally, I had to guide most of the spells myself as Marco wasn't capable of anything above novice magic so we found ourselves in the awkward position of my hands always hovering above his own in an attempt to accomplish anything. And it did, I got a nice sound blast to the face, 
but it was nothing compared to what I experienced with Meridius so I survived. As I was attempting to guide Marco into casting a muffle spell I heard an amused cough behind me and stopped what I was doing. There in all her smugness stood a very bemused Sibyl who wasted no time in asking not even a day after our rendezvous and you are already seeking greener pastures revine. Yet I don't have the nerves for this after dealing with Marco's constant whining, because of course his determination lasted only until we actually started working on magic, and immediately say I will share my discoveries with you if you never again insinuate what you were about to say. Her smile is brighter than the sun deal. The smile drops slightly as she says old Firebeard wanted us to meet with the legionaries in advance so we can connect with our comrades as he said, the meeting is supposed to be starting soon. Lovely. I say in a dry voice and you couldn't have informed me of this sooner. Oh I would have. She stares at me in irritation had your bird friend not been pestering me at why I flinch at his majestic presence for an entire hour and calling me all manner of uncouth names. I wipe a proud tear from my eye that's my boy. Chapter 94, Chapter XXXV, Legion's Rivals and Preparations After I managed to calm down a very pissed off Sibyl and informed Davos and Marco that they are free for the day, at which point the young bard fell asleep then and there, forcing Davos to carry him off, we headed out toward Castle Dewar. As we were about to leave the palace we crossed paths with the king himself followed by Falk Firebeard and Balgir Bearclaw. Torridge immediately perked up when he saw us all good, I was hoping the two of you would join us. His eyes shifted to my own for a moment holding a hint of confusion within, but he quickly hid it. How perceptive is this man? Sybil sighed as much as I don't like dealing with the common soldiery it is unquestionably wise to reach an understanding with the command structure if we are going to be trusting them to stand between us and the enemy. I chuckle I wouldn't put it in so many words but yes that is pretty much the case. Torridge shakes his head if only everyone could be so dismissive. If only you chose to become a mage instead of a monarch. I say fo sadly woe is you. Falk coughs forcefully and sends me a slight glare. The king on the other hand merely joins me in my amusement true, I should stop complaining. And claps his hands now, off to the castle. He starts walking off enthusiastically and we are all forced to run after him. Castle Dewar is very much built to fit its name, every corner is a kill zone, every ceiling a murder hole. Instead of the dozen or so soldiers I saw doing exercises when I first arrived, the courtyard was filled to the brim with proper imperial legionaries wearing high-quality steel armor and equipped with swords and shields. Most were Nords, but there were a couple of Mare and Bretons dispersed among them. In front of every group of ten was a decanus, wearing more ornate and lightly enchanted armor, but otherwise equipped in the same manner. For every ten of them stood one centurion, a plumed helmet decorating their heads and a respectable aura coming from their more individualistic gear. And finally, above the five century I, there stood the legate herself, Rick if my memory serves. Even ignoring her enchanted ebony imperial segmented plate I could practically feel the danger coming off the middle-aged woman, she would definitely snap me like a twig in a fight. The moment the king stepped into the yard the legionaries moved as one and presented a pristine formation with everyone saluting. Rick stepped in front of her cohort and gave Torridge a shallow but respectful bow King Torridge, the troops are ready for your inspection. The young king's smile was just a bit strained as he said Rick. How many times must I tell you that there is no need for such formality? The legate smirks and how many times must I tell you that the legion must always follow proper discipline or we will no longer be the mightiest force on Nirn? And how numerous is this mightiest force at the moment? I ask hoping to speed the meet and greet along. If it isn't the new court mage himself. Rick looks me over say, you look familiar. I raise an eyebrow I don't believe we have met ma'am. She stares at me no, I am quite certain I have seen you somewhere. Guessing that she had known my father while he was still alive I roll my eyes why are you beating around the bush legget? She huffs it's called being polite, you could try it sometime brat. I stare at her, dead in the eyes, and say with slow certainty no. She actually snorts at this you really are Viren's brat. In the flesh I bow with an exaggerated flourish. A shame he went and got himself killed, 
he was a good soldier and a better commander. She shakes her head, but I sense a tinge of hidden fury. I shrug he chose to make the risk that led to his death, besides the last time I spoke with him he seemed content with his end. Among those present only Sibyl, Firebeard and surprisingly Torridge seem to immediately get what I am talking about, while everyone else gives me weird looks and one of the Auric Share legionaries even takes an unsure step back, likely earning himself latrine duty if his Decanus glare is anything to go by. Rick eyes me weirdly what do you Maya then she makes an O with her mouth and shakes her head I never could get my head around Dunmary rituals. I merely smile, and Rick turns to Sybil Stentor she says coldly I see you managed to force yourself out of your tower today. Rick. Sybil answers with just about the same amount of venom in her voice how unpleasant it is to see you today. It is at this moment that Falk, bless his heart, decides to get between two pissed off women while I am certain that the two of you have much to talk about, please do leave that for when the king is not present. Both of them glare at the brave soul, but he doesn't even twitch and stares them down. After a tense silence they both back down and I sense just a smidge of smugness from the steward. With a contented smile, he turns to Rick now Leggett, if you would answer the court mage's question about the troop count, that would be a good way to get started with the meeting. She grunts of course steward then looks at me and explains we are currently 500 strong, all heavy infantry, with a force of 50 auxiliary scouts and 10 elite spell swords. I am guessing that cavalry would be pretty useless where we are going. She nods with a hint of approval in her eyes yes, we will mostly be engaging in ground assault combined with magical bombardment when possible. I scratch my chin there are going to be three of us, two wizards and an archmage so the bombardment idea should work. Remembering just who I am talking about I quickly add well that is if Savos doesn't have other plans. Yes, we were all quite relieved when we heard of Aaron's participation. She agrees. Now what about? I proceed to ask an obnoxious amount of questions and while it wasn't exactly necessary we did notice some discrepancies in the supply organization and marching order that were corrected thanks to me being annoyingly meticulous which earned me some respect from the local soldiery. After the meet and greet was done Rick invited me over for a drink with the officers and she regaled me with stories of my father's achievements, and if even half of them were true my father was a certified badass. She also made me retell some of my own battles and adventures, seeing as my name was known even here among certain circles. She seemed rather impressed and lamented that I didn't join the Legion to which I simply replied the same way I did to Tiberius or my father when they suggested it. It just wasn't worth it. The Legionaries grumbled but most showed understanding of my views. I left the senior legate in good cheer and returned to the tower. Sybil seemed inordinately pissed that I decided to spend time with her rival or whatever it is they considered themselves what were you doing with that hag for so long? Really Sybil? I ask in exasperation even if it was any of your business, and let me make it clear that it isn't I notice the tiniest flinch the woman just wanted to talk to me about my father and his soldiering days, why are the two of you so pissy at each other anyway? She seems just about to snap at me but catches herself and simply slumps deeper into the armchair I found her sitting in we grew up together. She says quietly after a tense silence we were always in competition with each other, but that wasn't what made me hate her. Sybil levitates a small bottle of wine from somewhere and takes a long swig no, that started when she found out I became a vampire 30 years ago. She found out that quickly. I ask with some surprise. She nods yes, we were good friends then, God enough that she noticed the changes almost immediately. After I was found out she blackmailed me into using my new power for good lest she inform the vigil of Stendar. Cruel. I say slowly but unsurprising, you do realize she was quite merciful don't you? Yes. She forces out she was, and I still hate her for it. Why? What do you mean why? She snaps tell me, why do you pursue magic? Oh? That is a rather odd segue but I do so so I can be truly free. She gets up exactly. And that which denied me my freedom. And are you saying that your current position is not to your liking? It is she sighs but I feel as if a noose is around my neck all the time. 
why not simply leave for the college? I ask. That would be just another prison, just one of my own making. Fair enough, I also left it because it was starting to feel suffocating. I agree truthfully and decide to try and cheer her up. I can't really help you with the legate but I could cook us up something if you are interested. I ask with a smile. Fie and she rolls her eyes playfully anything to get my mind off the bitch. Time skib. The following two days were spent in a rush of preparations, I no longer had the time to waste training up Marco and Davos so they were left to their own devices. Marco grumbled about not being allowed to join the fight this time, but this was an actual battle and he would just be in the way unfortunately. He did promise to write a song for our victory which is something I will hold him to. Davos spent his time getting his gear in order and stocking up on enchanted bolts and scrolls, he would be my shadow in the fight as always. Sybil didn't leave her room at all, and if the aura coming out was an indicator she was going through multiple rituals in preparation. I just hope she didn't make a mistake in the rush. As for myself I was focusing on mastering the next level of solar magic and helping Sorch master his own new abilities. I did visit Winterhold again to grab some materials for a ritual of my own, and I also brought a spider worker with me, just in case I needed something expendable for a cunning plan. The ritual I prepared was one of general magicka infusion and was of a more mild nature than my previous one, it included sacrificing a Varla stone, a rather rare and not to mention considerably pricey item containing crystallized magicka, meant to enhance one's reserves. The reason I didn't do it earlier is that I wanted to grow my reserves more naturally as forcing them to expand repeatedly would just make my spellcasting a complete mess for far too long. This time it was a far more pleasant experience, thank all the gods, and felt like a long soothing bath instead of the monstrous itch that was the saber cat infusion. About the same time I was finished with that I also managed to rapidly cast a solar cloak and a solar burst, making my restoration touch upon the realm of an expert. The morning of our march came soon after, before I left to pick Sybil up I decided to check my progress. STR, 15 equals 16. Dex, 16.5 equals 17. Mind, 23 equals 25. Mag, 300 equals 350. Restoration Adept equals Expert, plus Sun Cloak, Sunburst. Enchantment Expert, plus Scroll Inscription. Seamless runic inscription. Watching numbers go up was as satisfying as always, now if only I could gut Potma and her goons without getting possessed by Meridia. Chapter 95, Chapter XXXVI, March I knock on Sybil's door a couple of times and get no response, getting a bit worried I quickly activate my magic sight to try and peer inside and what I saw made me rather uneasy. The aura in the room was all over the place and with what I felt was a mix of blood, death and extracted life force. This smelled like all kinds of trouble but unfortunately, I couldn't just barge in as the place was most likely trapped to an unholy degree. I quickly went and grabbed Davos and asked him if he knew how to disarm the probably magical defenses. Without responding he immediately got to work and after some grumbling and many broken lockpicks, he managed to get through the door without triggering whatever trap awaited behind. Hiring him really was money well spent. I worriedly opened the door and rushed inside, and what awaited was what looked like the sight of a rather complex ritual with a disheveled Sybil lying in the middle of a pool of her own blood without moving. After a quick scan, I could see that she was still alive, but her presence was faint. We searched the room for wherever she kept her supply of blood and found nothing, it was to be expected as it made the most sense to keep that kind of thing inside of one's oblivion pocket. With an annoyed task, I placed my hand above her mouth and made a cut on my palm, I had to will my enhanced healing to stop for a moment for enough blood to flow out. Some color seemed to return to her face after a while and she abruptly sat up and a pair of feral eyes glared at me, for a moment I expected her to lunge in an attempt to consume my blood but she suddenly slapped herself with one hand and summoned one of her wine bottles with the other. After drinking the entire thing in one gulp, and repeating the process four additional times she seemed to finally calm down and merely sat there in silence staring into the distance. You okay down there? I ask slowly. 
My question woke her up from whatever state she was in and she blinked in my direction ah, yes I am fine. And returned to her distant stare. I turned to Davos and signalled for him to leave us, and then dragged Sybil to her bathroom to at least help her wash her face. As I am getting the blood out of her hair I hear her mutter quietly thank you. Don't mention it. She sniffs I could have died in there you know. You could have. I nod slowly but you didn't and that is all that matters. Her chuckle is a hollow one that is not what I meant. She once again stares at a random spot for a time before continuing if I didn't consume something rich in magicka, like say a bit of semi-divine blood belonging to a certain wizard, I would have become blood-starved and been hunted down in hours. Oh. Quite. She leans back into me as I continue doing my thing. What were you even trying to do that you almost ended up blowing yourself up? I feel some reluctance on her part, but seeing as I did apparently save her life she explains it is a vampiric ritual, involving stealing the vitality of charmed thralls to empower my own. I am guessing it is fatal for said thralls. My hands tense just a bit. She seems to feel it and stills for a moment I assure you they deserved it. I sense no lies but still narrow my eyes right, not like it is my business anyways. But that begs the question, did you know you would end up in such a state? There was a chance. She forces out but it was a risk I was willing to take. Right uh huh, and were you relying on me helping you out if it did? She looks at the ground in shame and nods yes. I sigh look, I wouldn't mind helping you out for something like this but trying to force me by literally almost dying is not acceptable, nor is it fair. Her brows furrow you would have helped me just like that. Well I might have asked for something in return, but yes. I shrug. Each time I previously asked for your blood you reacted rather negatively. There is a question in her statement. I snored I am not going to be your damned meal Sibyl, but I don't mind helping you out. Now you should get yourself cleaned up, we do need to get going soon. I let her hair down and she gets up, giving me a radiant yet teasing smile you came to my rescue once again. I would oh so love to invite you to join me, but you are right that we should get moving. I twitch just a bit due to my cursed hormones and she seems to notice, before she can tease me I smirk back I will hold you to that after we get back then. Oh that. She leans on my shoulder and purrs into my ear and so much more. God. Damned. Hormones. The gathering of the army was still a bit later so I found myself strolling through the palace gardens, trying to relax before I inevitably got stressed out on the march. I get a bit distracted by some servants gossiping about some random rumor and almost bump into someone. I turn and find myself face to face with a scowling Savos Aaron who instead of his usual cheerful disposition is busy giving me a stern look while staring right into my eyes. Oh. I feel a physical weight on my shoulders as he stares at me, though it might have just been a trick of the mind. After an uncomfortably long time he nods to himself a lesson branded in flesh, I guess that I don't need to say much more than that. Then grins maliciously still will though. He fake coughs and the atmosphere shifts once again as he angrily asks what in all the unmentionables of oblivion were you thinking not making a proper deal before barging into that damned temple. I frown I was certain that I did though, she even blessed me then and there. Exactly you foolish boy. He pinches the bridge of his nose she misdirected you by giving you something shiny immediately and you just barged in without any assurances. I face palm loudly fuuuk. Language. I glare at him and he smirks oh don't get uppity with me Revine, you messed up and now you need to take the chiding like a good boy. Why am I getting deja vu? I frown and with a drawl say yes, yes I made a mistake, it won't happen again, thank you for the obvious lesson oh great archmage. He raises his nose it is good that you understand. Then claps his hands and looks at me conspiratio really so, you and Sybil, hey. My look at that moment could have dried the seas themselves. After repeatedly, and with great vigor informing the archmage that no, I do not wish to regale him with tales of my love life, we headed out toward the city gates. On the way there we were joined by Davos and Sibyl, who seemed much more lively than when I found her this morning. 
Aaron looked like he was about to start pestering her but one annoyed scowl from her was enough for him to remain silent. Is it possible to learn this power? There was a crowd gathered on the streets as rumors had, as expected, already spread about our glorious quest. Most of the people seemed more merry at the prospect of a great battle than worried about the horde of undead, almost as if the poor fools had no idea what would happen if we lost. Or maybe they were all just that optimistic. Likely story that, the whole thing was probably downplayed by the authorities as no one likes a panicky crowd, especially since the slums were barely kept contained as is. The legionaries were standing in orderly ranks, with the auxiliaries positioned at the front and back of the formation. In front of the soldiers was a small wooden stage upon which stood the king, wearing resplendent ebony light plate and a crowned helmet inlaid with gold runes. Falk, also reasonably equipped himself signalled us to approach as soon as we arrived and the moment everyone was accounted for Torridge rose his hand and the crowd went silent. People of Solitude, People of Skirim. A foul plague has infested our lands. He trails off holding the crowd's attention necromancers. Gasps are heard all around indeed my good people, these foul blasphemers against the gods are conducting some diabolical scheme even as I speak. The crowd starts shifting as worry spreads among the less confident, but Torridge intervenes before it can get out of hand but do not worry my dear subjects, for today we march to strike down this disease and excise it from Nirn, never to sink its vile claws into anyone else. And just like that the worry turns into fervor as cheers are heard from all round. He goes on about the glory of our brave soldiers and thanks the people for coming to see us off. Thankfully he knows better than to mention Savos as he would probably start a riot if he were allowed to speak for even a moment. Before long we are leaving the city, with horses provided for all of us upper class folk. Thankfully I learned how to ride early in this life so I didn't embarrass myself. The march toward Wolf Skull is surprisingly peaceful, but everyone knows this is merely the calm before the storm. As we travel I notice that the legionaries are big fans of dark humor, the madmen were betting who would die in the most gruesome way and all were laughing at the idea. Torridge seemed to be perfectly fine on the surface, but if the twitching of his hand and the frowns of his closest advisors was any indication, the young man was worried sick. I tried distracting him by teasing him about his crush but while it did make him a bit more relaxed he remained twitchy the entire trip. Savos naturally spent most of his time annoying everyone he could get his hands on, which earned him some ice shards to the face from Sibyl, but that only encouraged him to be more insufferable. Finally, after a day of riding we crested a hill and came face to face with a wooden fort completely covered in skeletons wielding bows and a god's damned zombie giant staring right at us. Well I hear Savo's mutter that is a big lad. Quest issued, purge the necromancers. Reward, the Tome of Shadows. A vicious smile finds its way onto my face unbidden the bigger they are. I say. The harder they fall. Davos pipes in from my left. The easier they are to blow up. Both Savos and I say in perfect sync. Chapter 96, Chapter XXXVII, Battle of Wolf Skull, Part 1 General POV The two armies stared each other down, one doing so without a hint of emotion while the other did so with grim determination in their hearts. King Torridge quickly called for an officer meeting so they could come up with a plan. As the leaders of the attacking force gathered on a small hill overlooking their men, Legate Rick was the first to speak the last scout report came in two days ago and there were no mentions of a fort, much less a giant. With a cheerful smile, not at all befitting the situation, Savos Aaron explained undead are such fascinating creations, my dear Legate. They can work without rest and with surprising precision if properly supervised, it is no surprise that this amount managed to create a fort as soon as they heard of our coming. She frowns and it is utterly impossible to hide a force of this size from a bunch of mages that can use reanimated birds as scouts. Aaron pipes up oh my, I am surprised you are aware of such abilities. The frown on Rick's brow deepens the Thalmer made liberal use of necromancy during the war, you would either learn about or die to it. I just didn't know you could use them to pull forts out of your backside. She quickly sends a small bow to Torridge excuse my language, my king. 
Torij rolls his eyes and doesn't respond. Ravine cuts at speaking of the Enkoff our dear friends from Aldmaris, I am surprised they aren't here and doing their best to help us to our deaths. Falk Firebeard grunts at this they were surprisingly quiet about the whole thing, suspiciously so. He looks at the young Dunmer with a raised eyebrow speaking of suspicious, where is your butler he asks with audible quotations. Oh, he is up and about. Revine merely shrugs with a brilliant smile. Thalmer assassins POV. Lady Elenwen's orders are clear, the human king dies today. I hum out my calming mantra as I check my bow and the special poisoned arrow intended for his heart. The Archmage's participation almost sent our plans into disarray, but the Lady Ambassador managed to procure this enchanted bow from her Dremorum merchant associate that supposedly pierces most arcane shields with ease, something we confirmed after torturous testing. I personally disdain working with such creatures, but if it brings the ascension of Aldmaris I will gladly ignore my own misgivings. Just one shot, and the Nords will be at each other's throats the humans will be all the weaker for when we are ready to strike them all down. I raise the bow and prepare to draw, they are holding some kind of council so it is the perfect opportunity to spread suspicion and discord among their ranks, what the undead don't slaughter they will kill on their own in the confusion. Just as I am about to knock the arrow I faintly see the lesser elf marked as a low priority target known as Flame Tongue among the Nords smile in my direction and wink. What they... Before I can react I feel someone grab me from behind and stuff something in my face, my consciousness escapes me and the last thing I hear before passing out is how the fuck did he even know he was there. Revines POV. I suppress a cruel grin as I see Davos grab the Thalmer agent. Zelzaz really is a godsend. Since I found his scroll in the presumed belongings of a Thalmer agent I have always made sure to place a small tracking rune on whatever I sold him and the absolute madman didn't even care as long as I gave him a bit of a discount. Note to self, check everything he sells you thoroughly from now on. So imagine my surprise when I felt one of my enchantments nearby tracking us, some scouting later and would you look at that, a Thalmer agent preparing to take a shot at one of us. He will make a great gift to Torridge when I am done with him. I notice Aaron looking into the distance from the corner of his eye, he sends me a wink and an approving nod. Really, if he wasn't such an annoyance all the time I would consider him a badass. Back to the council then. An assault would be foolish and you know it I hear Fire Barad say in his usual stern voice. Rick sighs I am aware, but foolishly exhausting our mages before the real fight will just make us easy targets for the necromancers and vampires. Falk looks at Aaron who nods while we could theoretically flatten the entire fort in a minute or less, with liberal use of magicka potions of course, that would leave us weakened and tired enough to be of much lesser use when the real threat emerges. And what is this real threat? Torridge asks. Aaron shrugs oh just the small army of necromancers and vampires waiting inside. One of the centurions, a Breton asks him aren't you an archmage? Shouldn't they be easy for you to take down? Rick lightly palms her face in irritation, while Aaron waves him off fighting a dozen on my own. Sure. Fighting fifty of them with the three of us completely drained and overdosing on potions. He makes a strained sound implying a hell nat. The same officer looks at him weirdly why would the three of you fight them on your own? We will also be there. I cut in yes to fight off the innumerable undead no doubt waiting down there as well. He makes an O shape with his mouth and wisely decides to shut up. Firebeard, always the straight man in the room, claps his hands to get everyone back on track now that that is over and done with, does anyone have any better ideas that aren't, make a ladder of bodies or just remove the walls? I walk up to the center of our group and say excitedly I have a cunning plan. Everyone looks at me expectantly and with a devious smile I begin my scheme. Necromancer Apprentices POV. There they are, arrayed against us. An entire elite cohort and Savo's fucking Aaron himself. What an oblivion is Master Makoran thinking listening to that wench calling herself the Ritual Master. A mysterious woman comes to your lair, tells you to follow her for great power and without an ounce of hesitation you abandon all your earlier plans and rush after her. And of course, it isn't him freezing up here, 
smelling the still rotting giant we raised and looking death in the face just across the damned field. No. It is me and my dear wife. I look at my Anne. Oh, she was so beautiful in life. Even now her dead eyes fill me with warmth. Such a shame she didn't listen to me when she got sick and I said we were going to seek eternal life together. Well she would get it whether she liked it or not. I look at the field again and notice a small dark dot in the distance slowly crawling toward the gate. Is that a Dwemer spider? Made of iron. What? Flash back to the council, Torridge's POV. I really do hope Revine has some kind of idea. Of all the people at court he is the most chaotic to be sure, with all the good and bad that brings. He snaps his fingers and a sphere of iron falls to the ground, it looks like a bulky iron version of the sketches of Dwemer Automata I read about when I was young. Hmm. Falk did say something about that when we were deciding if we were going to invite him, let's see where this will go. You brought a metal ball? How is that going to help? Rick asks irritably. Revine raises an excited finger not just any metal ball. And after a dramatic pause adds a metal ball of death. She frowns explain. Revine merely waves her off just watch and enjoy. He approaches Savos and starts whispering something to him, as he talks I see the Archmage's expression shift to a more and more gleeful one. Without any further reaction Savos summons a bunch of, scrolls? and starts stuffing them into every single spot of the automaton he can. I want to be worried, but their expressions tell me that whatever they are doing I wouldn't wish even on my enemies. Back to the necromancer. Are they sending the thing to bring some kind of message? I mean it's just a simple spider, even if it is impressive they managed to make the thing move properly. Maybe I should grab it and study it it could be the thing that puts bread on the table when Anne and I finally decide to settle down and have our kids. I command the skeletons to go and grab it and bring it to me, which as good little pets they do immediately. Soon I am looking over a bulky Dwemer spider, but before I can examine the thing I hear a distant screech coming from above. Back to Revine. All right, you have stuffed the spider with scrolls and sent it to the enemy. Rick says slowly and then snaps at me how exactly do you plan on detonating them? I smile, Scorch, come out please. With a fiery pop my glorious hawk boy appears on the snow next to me, immediately evaporating it and looking at me expectantly what do you want pops? Once again I am on the receiving end of a bunch of very confused and some scared stares, but instead of elaborating I bend down and start whispering my devious idea to Scorch. I can sense the twinge of sadism he has come to the forefront as he bobs his head like a peacock a marvelous plan, leave the degenerates to me. And flies up into the air. I look back up to the others and see just about what I expected, what I didn't expect was a Savo staring into the distance with a hint of nostalgia in his eyes for a moment. Naturally he regains his bearings almost immediately and says with his usual cheer I see you already ascended your familiar, congratulations. I bow theatrically I live to impress. Back to the necromancer. I look up and see another dot, this time of a bright orange. It seems to be getting bigger, almost as if it is getting closer. With terrified realization I swiftly look back down to the spider and notice a bunch of folded, and more importantly primed scrolls attached to the bottom of it. There is a thud sound behind me and I jerk back to see a large fiery hawk looking at me with what I think might be pity. Hey there. I say slowly. He continues staring. Deciding to try and calm the obviously magical creature and stop it from detonating whatever is attached to the spider I approach slowly while saying it's all right buddy, no need to get scared, I won't hurt you. The hawk looks at me sadly, like he wants to be comforted. With growing confidence I continue my approach and slowly pat the bird's head, as expected not getting burned by its flames there, there. It will be all right. The bird suddenly jerks its head and looks me dead in the eyes with what I swear is a sadistic smile. Bwok bwok motherfu. Boom. Chapter 97, Chapter XXXVIII, Battle of Wolf Skull, Part 2. Revines POV. As we see Scorch land atop the gatehouse everyone is stuck in a state of tense silence. 
The tenseness seemed to annoy Rick who looked at me with a twitching eyebrow. Are you sure this will woe? Boom. A massive ball of fire detonates from the center of the gatehouse, immediately burning everything in a wide circle around it to fine ash. We all stare at the massive cloud of dust and ash thrown up by the detonation, most of us unable to even move from witnessing the sheer amount of destruction before us. The first to snap out of it is naturally Rick who immediately starts giving out orders to her subordinates and charges forward to lead her men. The king and his entourage follow soon after with a battle cry of their own, leaving the mages the last remaining ones atop the hill. I'll say. Sybil says slowly while trying to blink away the flashing light from her eyes even if incredibly crude, that was beautifully done. She looks at Savos and me and immediately rolls her eyes in exasperation at what she sees. A proud tear leaves Savo's eye as he silently watches the destruction unfold. Truly. I begin, wiping away a tear of my own art is an explosion. General POV. The legionaries advance in orderly ranks at the now disorganized defenses of their enemy. The skeleton archers atop the still intact walls try and slow them down with their crude arrows, but the disciplined ranks of seasoned warriors swiftly make a mobile shield wall and weather the storm while the auxiliaries and elite spell swords fire back, dealing considerably more damage. While the necromantic forces of the defenders were surprised by the sudden explosion they were still mostly comprised of reanimated corpses so it took them almost no time to organize a proper defense and call for reinforcements from deeper in the cave system. So as the legionary force crested the small mound of debris left by the demolished gatehouse they were met by a wall of undead staring at them with empty eyes, the zombie giant still standing in all its disgusting glory, even if singed by the explosion. Wasting absolutely no time, all of the officers pulled out scrolls and activated them, sending a wave of solar magic into the enemy ranks, and as if a well-oiled machine their subordinates charged immediately capitalizing on the newly created holes in the enemy formation. The forces of the living and the dead crashed into each other and the merciless grind of war began. Revines POV After we gathered ourselves we rushed behind the formation, some skeletons tried to shoot us down but with a lazy wave of my hand, all the arrows were redirected harmlessly. Whoever was manipulating them seemed to notice this and refocused on other targets. I felt a large welling of necromantic energy somewhere behind the wall and turned to see what was going on, but before I could even utter a word to the others I noticed Savo snap his finger and a massive bolt of lightning strike the exact spot I felt the power was coming from. I hear him scoff really, if you are going to try and reanimate things mid-combat at least prepare proper defenses. He shakes his head in disappointment bunch of damn amateurs. Sybil chuckles as she fires a spear of ice at a rather strong-looking zombie about to skewer one of the legionary centurions Fancy yourself an expert in necromantic warfare do you archmage? He raises a dramatic finger I will have you know before he can go on his finger twitches and another bolt of lightning strikes one of the defensive towers, he clears his throat and pretending nothing happened raises his finger again in a lecturing tone I will have you know I am an expert in all manner of things young lady. Firing off a bolt of destructive lightning at one of the necromancers who thought it a great idea to pop his head out from behind the walls I say loudly while educating us on all your indubitably immense skills sounds oh so riveting it really doesn't I am afraid that giant is about to start bunking the fine men and women of the legion into the ground if we don't do something about it. Savos TSKS in annoyance rowdy youngsters these days, no respect for proper education. And disappears from his spot with a pop. I slowly turn to Sybil I think he has this well in hand, want to clear the walls with me. She coos into her hand already inviting me out, what a gentleman. I bow dramatically, just in time to dodge a lightning bolt heading to my head, and with a twitch of my hand send one back I live to please my lady. She smiles the one that kills the least buys the drinks. I give her a blank stare I am not letting you drink me Sybil. Fainee she pouts and with an unnatural twitch charges up the wall. Well, I hope the legionaries won't mind me doing a bit of levitation, I have a bet to win. General POV The zombified giant lets out a loud grinding roar and charges at the formation of legionaries, it swings its massive hammer at them, but out of the formation charges Rick, her shield glowing in protective enchantments. The hammer smashes into her 
but all it does is push her back a bit. Unfortunately, that stunt seemed to have drained whatever potent enchantment was placed on the shield, and whoever was commanding the giant seems to have realized this, commanding the reanimated creature to attack again. The legionary spellblades quickly commenced a barrage of firebolts, but this was not enough to stop it as it swung down at the formation, ready to reap dozens of lives. Naturally, as it was the most dramatic moment possible, Savos decided this was the perfect time to pop into existence and with a wave of hand summon a pillar of flames, engulfing the giant in its entirety. He turned to annoy the legate who was glaring at him for his dramatics, but the giant let out a pained roar and even while still burning took a swing at the now presumably defenseless archmage. Annoyed that the undead was interrupting his fun Savos waved his hand once again, a green spell circle appearing in front of him and a massive earthen spike erupting from the ground, impaling the giant and thus forcing it to remain in the still burning pillar, sealing its fate. Savos turned back to Rick, but the legate had already charged ahead to help her men. The old mare tsked in annoyance and disappeared once again. The battle raged on, the elite legionaries destroying multiple undead with ease, but their numbers were still overwhelming leading to the deaths of multiple soldiers, some through lucky strikes and others getting literally drowned in corpses. From time to time a hidden necromancer would reanimate some of the fallen warriors, but their comrades cut them down without a hint of hesitation. Torridge and his housecarls found themselves in the center of the battle, Steward Firebeard constantly shouting at his king to retreat to a safer position, but the young man was too overwhelmed with rage at the sight of so many of his people getting killed and desecrated in this manner. At first, he managed to keep his wrath in check, but the more he slew the more that wrath bubbled below the surface and now it was a raging inferno that could only be sated by the deaths of the necromancers. The battle was now concentrated at the entrance of the cave, where the most powerful undead were situated, being led by a heavily armored vampire who was managing to hold back most of the attackers on his own. There was a commotion in the legionary ranks as they split to make way for a rapidly moving figure clad in ebony, being chased by the panicked royal guards. As he reached the front of the ranks Torridge let out a bellowing war cry of Sovereign Guard, making even the undead flinch and crashed sword first into the vampire who was also stunned by his appearance. The troops were stunned for a moment, but then the same war cry spread among the Nords among them and they charged in to join their king. The fighting turned into a desperate grind after the undead converged again, but then the reanimated corpses seemed to suddenly just stop in place, and as if the strings binding them were cut all of them fell to the ground lifeless once more. Two vampires stood behind the formation completely stunned by the development, one of them seemed to realize just how dead he was about to be and muttered well foo. Pop before he could finish Savos appeared behind the two of them and with a mere touch disintegrated them on the spot. He looked at a tired Rick with a childish smile and the poor woman merely sighed and got to work reorganizing her men. The now heavily panting king collected himself and looked at the archmage what just happened. Savos smiled your court mages seem to have decided to explore a bit. Torridge frowned explain. Revines POV, after levitating up the wall. I slowly walk down the path of destruction left by Sibyl. Sheesh, she must have taken the little bet really seriously if the shredded remains are anything to go by, better follow her before she gets herself killed. I follow the mutilated corpses and soon reach one of the towers, hearing the sounds of combat inside I rush inside, only to see Sibyl rip a necromancer in half with her bare hands while laughing maniacally. Damn, that's hot. She turns to me abruptly and gives me an odd look. Realization strikes me I said that out loud didn't I? She nods, making me sigh tiredly. Before I can say anything else she smiles teasingly don't worry, I don't judge. Of course you wouldn't I roll my eyes and then try and distract her in hopes she would forget about this now let's continue clearing this place out, people are dying down there. You are no fun. She winks but I guess we should find the ones controlling the undead quickly. We both turn serious and rush further down the wall. Most of what we find are skeleton archers which we dispatch with ease, but the further toward the mountain at the edge of the wall we go, the greater opposition awaits. Skeletons make way for soul cairn shades, and we are forced to slow our rampage and actually focus on our enemies. 
they too inevitably meet their end when attacked by my solar magic and Sibyl's ridiculous vampiric strength, which seems to have reached a new height after that ritual she performed. At least risking her life wasn't for nothing. Soon we reach the end of the wall and find a small entrance into a secondary cave carved into the mountain, we rush inside while making sure not to trigger any traps and after breaking down a sturdy wooden door with a telekinetic push we come face to face with a gaggle of necromancers sitting around a ritual circle filled to the brim with black soul gems. An old Nord man wearing black robes scoffs in annoyance and without looking at us growls is at Sybil what do you want vampire? We are trying to focus here and have no time to entertain you. As an afterthought he adds and send your thrall outside. We don't want bloodhounds in our midst. My eye twitches and I turn to Sibyl that one is mine. She cups her chin in thought and draws fie and e, but you have to buy me something nice. Before she is even done I am staring at the old man who slowly seems to be realizing that no, we aren't their friends. With a wicked smile, I summon my staff and point at him. He tries to disentangle himself from whatever ritual he was performing causing all the other necromancers to groan in pain, but it is far too late for that as the last thing he hears is wood. Before his head hits the ground. Chapter 98, Chapter XXXIX, Battle of Wolf Skull, Part 3 As the head of the lead necromancer falls the rest are stunned by the backlash of the ritual's power getting out of control, and before they can do anything to save their pitiful lives Sybil and I fall upon them without a hint of mercy. As she rips the heart out of the last necromancer Sybil looks around the room we found ourselves in and mutters I was wondering where they were powering so many undead from. Quite. I say while rapidly gathering the still-powered black soul gems, the souls captured by them were already in the soul cairn so I had no qualms about using them only the greatest of necromancers can actually command an army on their own, and these were everything but great. She nods absent-mindedly while looking over the ritual circle, she hears the clinking of the gems and turns to me with a quirked eyebrow you do plan on sharing those don't you? I shrug sure, if you have a use for them. Just remember you do owe me for saving your ass. She giggles but I thought it was your pleasure to save my maidenly ass. I give her a blank look woman, nothing about your ass is maidenly. Her eye twitches and whose fault is that? I don't know, you tell me. I shrug and say with a cackle. We banter with each other as we continue clearing the entire place out, we knew that with the destruction of this ritual the battle outside was well on its way to a swift end. General POV Under Rick's strict leadership, the legionaries reorganize themselves quickly and get to saving the dying and tending to the wounded. Torridge who finally gathered some of his strength back starts walking toward the entrance to the main cave just in time for Revine and Sybil to land on the snow from atop the nearby wall. You don't plan on entering right now do you? Revine asks him, amused by the idea. The furious king snaps his head to the mage they must all die for their crimes. Raising a placating hand Revine inclines his head I agree, but charging in without gathering ourselves will just make you get killed instead. I the king begins to growl something out in his anger, but Revine raises a hand and hits him with an illusion spell. Balgir Bearclaw who was right next to Torridge goes to grab his blade, but his king raises an arm while taking deep breaths You are right, I was acting foolishly. Balgir is not so easily swayed, however did you just bewitch the king? He yells while pointing at the mage. A simple calm spell, I assure you. Revine draws. Before things can escalate Savos pops up next to them it was indeed just something to calm him down House Carl there is no need for such reactions. He turns to his fellow mages and gives them a thumbs up good job on finding the necromancer's kids. Before they can continue with their conversation Rick arrives and looks at the mages you lot know how to heal. All of them nod and she waves for them to follow her I have wounded and I am not letting them die because you wanted to banter, with me. Sybil starts to fume and is obviously about to retort with some kind of insult, but a hand on her shoulder stops her. Her head snaps to a revine looking at her with a mix of understanding and annoyance You know she is right Sybil, no need to blow up over every little thing. She grumbles, but does follow the legate without further complaint. They are shown to the wounded and get to work. 
Savos works with his usual nonchalance and casually regrows the severed fingers of several of the wounded while healing the rest. Sibyl is a lot more professional and appears almost like a surgeon to Revine. Revine, on the other hand, is holding an unsheathed dawnbreaker in one hand while throwing uncountable insults at a certain Didra under his breath, and is channeling the power of the sword to heal as many as he can. Some soldiers ask him if he is praying, and he barely keeps himself from cursing their entire families. Half an hour later, when they managed to save everyone they could and tally all those they could not, the now diminished force, led from the front by their legate, took the first step into the dark cave and toward the horrors it held. It didn't take long for the defenders to respond to their entrance, sudden collapsing stones falling from above, ambushes by ghouls and skeletons, surprise bombardments by the necromancers, and all manner of other attempts to stall them. Luckily for the soldiers, they were accompanied by debatably the most powerful mage in Skirim, so with casual waves of his hands Savos rendered most of the attacks useless in bursts of magnificent yet efficient spell casting. What managed to get through his protective aegis was quickly dealt with by his students or the legion. After cutting down yet another force of skeletons, the army of solitude stepped through a final opening into a massive cave that looked more like a buried fortress than any natural cave system. Before they could orient themselves a bright blue conflux of magic appeared atop a tower in the middle of the cave and a loud, booming voice rung out Potma, hear our call and awaken. We summon you. Ah shit. Revine he's Savo's mutter and the old archmage's demeanor shifts from his usual temperament to a far more grave one. He turns to the leaders of the army and says with utmost seriousness I need to get up there and stop what they are trying to do, you must all get to me as soon as possible. Without waiting for any kind of response he jumps off the walkway they were standing on and as he falls a massive flaming bird appears below him, carrying him toward the tower. Sybil blinks and turns to Revine isn't that the same? He stops her with a raised hand that doesn't matter right now, we need move. Torridge's voice interrupts any further conversation, and as the young king glares at the tower's summit he shouts R.K. blesses us this day. With me warriors of Skirim. Let us purge this filth from our lands. Not waiting even a second he charges forward followed by his worried guard and the loudly cheering soldiers. Sybil blinks in their direction and mutters since when was he so. Fiery. Revine slowly asks. Yes, let's go with that. Revine takes another look at the tower and starts rushing after the soldiers we can ponder on the king's balls dropping another time Sibyl his staff appears in his hands and the wind around him starts picking up, with a wicked grin he growls now it's time to rip and tear. Savo's POV. God's damned idiots, what are they thinking? Summoning the spirit of a dragon-blooded necromancer and trying to bind it. Might as well just dig your grave then and there you complete amateurs. My familiar carries me to the top of the tower and launches me at the gaggle of dumbasses while he starts bombarding them with firebolts. I waste no time on banter with the glaring leader of the ritual and immediately launch a chaos thunderbolt at her. One of her undead thralls throws itself in front of the spell and I note a hint of disdain in her eyes, that disdain lasts for a briefest moment as the spell detonates blowing up everything around the thrall. As she falls to the ground and the last ritual caster is carried away by my bright burn, most likely to throw him down the pit as he is one to do, I approach the seared corpse of the ritual master. The foolish woman seems to have bound herself to her corpse at the moment of death in hopes of surviving this, I prepare a spell to finish her but the conflux of magic grows unstable and explodes outwards, shoving me onto the ground. I quickly levitate upwards and turn to see the now glowing corpse of the ritual master glaring at me with dead blue eyes. She opens her mouth to speak, but the voice that comes out is not that of the woman I slew, no, it is something far more powerful, something, divine. Have you come to pledge yourself to Empress Potma, Acolyte? The returned wolf queen asks with all the arrogance of a septum and an archmage combined. My lip quirks and I incline my head apologetically I am afraid not madam. And continue with a cocky smile my daughter would have no doubt slapped me for you aren't supposed to be alive, so I will be doing my civic duty as archmage and putting you back in the ground now if you don't mind. The undead queen doesn't seem offended, in fact she is amused as she lets out a dead chuckle I see. 
her eyes refocus on me very well, if thee will not serve in life, thou shalt serve in death. She takes a stance and I see her jaw move in a fashion I have recently familiarized myself with. Ah shit! Fuss ro da! Revines pov! Fuss ro da! I hear a voice far mightier than anything I ever felt echo from atop the tower. Did, did they actually manage to summon her even with Savo's interference? I must get up there, and quickly, or the old man will die. I take out a potion of extra magicka and chug it down, preparing my mind I once again unsheathe Dawnbreaker and charge over the ranks of legionaries battling the innumerable drag and vampires in our way while completely ignoring the panicked yells of my comrades. My frantic charge is slowed down neither by the undead throwing themselves at me nor the constant whispering of the cursed sword, as I rush through the enemy ranks all the legionaries can see are periodic explosions of solar energy and flames happening haphazardly in the enemy ranks. With a final swing and a roar I break through the enemy ranks and rush to the stairs of the tower, but before I can get up fully a tall deathly pale Nord places himself in my way. I see you liberated that whore's little toy. He drawls in a croaking voice. Makoran I presume. I ask while preparing to search my magicka. The old man nods that is indeed the name of your death boy. He opens his left arm toward me but it does not need be so. Give me the sword and I shall make you my prime apprentice, untold power shall be yours. The whispering of the sword turns into a furious howl, but I manage to keep the damn thing from overwhelming me oh I will give you the sword. I say slowly and petulant glee spreads on the man's face straight into your heart. His glee is replaced with fury as he swings his staff and launches a massive ice storm at me. Not wanting to waste time I shout YOL. And disperse it. Unfortunately, he doesn't cooperate and launches more of the damned things, one after another while cackling at my attempts to push through. Calm down Revine, the damned sword is making you behave like a dumbass. I chide myself and take a deep breath while pushing away yet another ice storm. I summon Scorch and mentally tell him to distract the necromancer, I sense his glee as he launches himself at the man while surrounded by a cloak of fire. He appears in front of the necromancer only for the old man to wave a disdainful hand at him and send him crashing through the walls. While he does this I chug down Morrigan's potion, it feels as if my blood itself is set on fire but I grit my teeth and persist. I start channeling a massive beam of red lightning at him with both hands, focusing all my power at once. At first Makoran keeps his disdainful look as he summons a grand ward, the disdain changes into horror as he feels his ward pushed back. He quickly drinks a potion of magicka and prepares to launch more spells at me, but before he can do that a battered looking scorch rushes through the hall in the wall and passes near him while clawing at his throat. The old man is stunned for a moment as he clutches at his severed arteries, but a moment is all I need as with a great push of my will I force my spell to break through his defenses and ram straight into his chest. I take deep breaths and start downing potion after potion, no doubt overdosing already. As soon as my legs stopped wobbling I rush up the stairwell, once again picking up Don Breaker, whose whispers had long since turned into a cacophony ringing against my mind. I burst through the gates leading to the apex of the tower with a shout and am met with the sight of a lich glowing with the sheer amount of magicka it possesses, battered in many places standing over a equally hurt Savos who seems to be lacking an eye in his left arm. General POV, Savos battle against Potma. The moment the shout leaves the dead queen's mouth the archmage blinks to another spot atop the tower. Without even looking at him Potma waves her hand and a veritable sea of wind blades flash at him from every direction. The old mare grunts in pain as one of his eyes is caught by the spell and destroyed. He pulls out a staff tipped with a beautiful red rose and starts channeling magicka into it, causing large Dremera warriors to rip their way onto Nirn. The wolf queen, not willing to be outdone, summons her own thralls in the form of skeletal behemoths and liches. What was moments ago a duel between two mages turns into a full-blown battle as the veritable armies of summons start butchering each other. Taking the opportunity Savos teleports behind Potma and claps his hands, sending an explosion of thunder and pure force at her. Potma grunts in annoyance and whispers tired clo all. And while suddenly moving far faster than was natural or unnatural, 
pulls out a wicked sword and swings for Savo's head. The Archmage is saved by his familiar appearing suddenly and pushing him away, getting cut in turn and making its master only lose an arm in the exchange as Potma takes another angry swing before her shout loses power. Their dance continues as the armies bellow continue their battle. Savo's POV This cannot go on the thought strikes me as I wipe the blood from my mouth. She is far too powerful for me to kill without having the time to prepare, the only thing that can in this situation is Meridia's artifact but I don't know if the kid will get here in time. I look at my remaining arm and with a twitch summon my staff into it, the Wolf Queen is distracted by the last Didra I could summon with Sam's staff. Too bad I had to waste it all here, it was a really handy walking stick. As the last Dremera jumps at the Lich Queen I focus all my remaining power into the staff. She swats my summon away, banishing him back into oblivion and shifts her dead gaze at me, but it is already too late as I push my staff forward and launch a massive beam of lightning at her. Let's hope this stuns her at least. As my spell dissipates the damned Lich is still floating there, now glaring at me due to her heavily damaged form. A wicked smile spreads on her face I guess mere servitude will not suffice for thee she spreads her arms rejoice mortal. For thou shalt eternally suffer at mine feet. It is time to use that then. I prepare to pull out one last trump card but then I see Revine explode from the entrance to the tower's summit, no doubt thrown forward by a shout of his. Potma, whose pointless posturing cannot hide the damage I dealt to her, glares at the new arrival. Before she can say anything, my eye meets Revine's and I send him a mental image of my plan with a handy illusion spell. His nod is barely perceptible, and as Potma opens her mouth to say another MO I focus all the magicka I managed to regenerate into my staff and yank Revine with a grand telekinesis spell, pulling him toward the Lich Queen. His sword finds its way into her heart and with an unholy scream she explodes into searing light, her soul annoyingly escaping eastwards. With a frustrated grunt Revine throws the sacred blade of Meridia onto the ground and spits at it. Maybe I should help him out with that now that he has learned his lesson. I go to make a snarky comment, but all my strength leaves me as the battle ends and I fall unconscious. Revine's POV I quickly go to check on Savos in hopes he might help with chasing the Mad Queen down. Aeon he is out cold. I feed him a potion and take a deep breath, finally calming down after that rush. I turn to see a rather worried Sibyl soon followed by the king and Rick all staring at me. I wave weakly at Savos he will live, but we have another problem. Chapter 99, Chapter XL, The Solitude Catacombs General POV Explain. Commanded a frowning Rick. After taking one last look at Savos and confirming that he was no longer bleeding out Revine started pacing around to calm his nerves and spoke. Unfortunately it seems that the spirit of Potma these idiots summoned was not completely banished to the afterlife when I destroyed her body, she is likely reconstituting herself within her resting place and if we follow usual Nordic traditions she is most likely already raising the followers that were buried with her. A nervous torrid shifted uncomfortably you are certain that it was Potma. Revine raises a tired finger highly proficient in the Thursday arm then another they were quite literally calling her out when we entered. And one final finger a lich so powerful it laid Savos on his ass. The king sighed and nodded with a grumble yes, that doesn't leave all that many options but her. Pretending not to already know Revine asked where was she buried anyway. Torridge cupped his chin in thought and after a moment answered with fear in his voice I do believe she was still given the honor of the solitude catacombs, even after her crimes. We need to get there yesterday. Revine said immediately. Torridge paled you don't mean. Yup. Revine nodded with false cheer Ole Potma is probably resurrecting herself in one of the greatest concentrations of powerful remains in Skirim as we speak, and if we don't get there quickly there won't be a city to come back to. Rick's almost perpetual frown deepened it would take at least a day for our tired men to reach solitude, and that is if we left the wounded behind which is not happening. There is a way to deal with this. Revine's tone was grave if we were to get there quickly enough we could interrupt her revival and stop her from unleashing whatever she would do in her maddened state. Sybil could see where he was going with this and sighed deeply. 
Torij looked at him oddly we already established that it would take us a day to get there. Yes, it would take you a day to return. Rick rolled her eyes just get to the point vy cough revine. Chuckling at Rick's slip of the tongue Revine pointed to Sybil and then to himself the two of us could get there very quickly and gather a force to enter the catacombs, we would need written orders from the king to expedite things, but if we were to leave now we could get there in time. Torridge didn't even wait for a further explanation and immediately commanded Falk to bring out some parchment and ink, which he carried with him for such situations. Revine blinked in surprise and while he was waiting for the king to finish his work he felt a cold hand grasp his shoulder and turned to see a somewhat annoyed Sybil giving him a half-lidded stare how nice of you to volunteer me for this little quest. She drawled quietly. He merely huffed oh come off it, you know damn well that if that city falls and Potma of all damn dragon bloods gets to live again we won't be just fucked, we will be he goes on to describe in great detail the depths of depravity only imaginable in a hentai. Sybil blanches. Making him laugh quietly you rip a man's heart out with your bare hands, but a little degeneracy is what makes you flinch, eh? She gave him a disgusted look that screamed the question a little, but then her expression shifted to a more mischievous one as she purred into his ear Is this what you fantasize about whenever you stare at me? Of course not woman, I am a man of culture, not a degenerate. He huffed in faux offense. Her look was now stuck in a transition from amused to completely baffled, and before she could ask what exactly he meant, the king was done with his work and handed a sealed letter to her show this to Ingvar, he should get you the plans of the catacombs and gather the thanes and guards to follow you down. She nodded and turned to Revine, who was busy feeding another regeneration potion to the unconscious Savos. She rolled her eyes you said it yourself that he will live. Why waste the potions if he can just regenerate himself whenever he wakes up? He shrugged and continued with what he was doing and me helping him out with it could be the difference between him being in time to help save us or being too tired to move. Sybil blinked that's fair. Once Revine was done with Savos he got up and clapped his hands well, enjoy the trek back to the city kids, I am off to possibly die and become an eternal slave to a mad queen and with a loud pop he disappeared from his spot. Sybil giggled at this and looked at the now baffled group what he said. And also disappeared from her spot. Falk grunted in annoyance this is why I hate mages. Rick chuckled you are just jealous you can't do it yourself. Before their banter could go on a cough from the king we should get back to the troops, they might be weakened but the vampires and necromancers could still push us back. Rick looked a bit ashamed at this and quickly rushed downstairs. Falk however, stopped next to Torridge and placed a hand on his shoulder your father would be proud if he saw you today. Torridge smiled melancholically he is no doubt in Sovngarde, feasting with the great heroes and making jokes about the foolish mistakes I made. The steward chuckled no doubt with a proud smile the entire time, now let us get back to the fight, eh? With a determined look. The king once again unsheathed his blade and headed back to finish calling the undead. Revine's POV. With a loud pop I appear in my room atop the wizard's tower. Thankfully after Savo's little slip up I made sure to add stabilizers to the marked spots so I didn't have to spill my guts this time. I made my way to Sybil's room and knocked, she quickly opened the door now dressed in completely new robes. I give her a blank look we are in a rush and you had the time to dress up. She scoffs we are about to descend into the lair of Potma, if I am to die I will die looking good. I roll my eyes and head to the tower's balcony, not caring one bit about the dumb law I levitate down to the bottom end, followed by a Sybil who simply jumped down I rush to the throne room. As we rush through the palace, the servants and guards step out of our way almost on instinct after seeing us, and we quickly find ourselves in the throne room, where the thanes and palace steward are gathered for an evening meeting. Everyone's gazes shift to us and the surprise turns into confusion when they remember where we are supposed to be, before they can start questioning us I rise a hand and say long story short, we won but Potma Septim is about to revive herself in her catacombs, we need maps and we need men, now. It takes me a good five minutes to calm everyone down, but after I explain the situation in more detail and Sybil shows them the king's message we quickly find ourselves standing in front of the Temple of the Divines followed by a troop of palace guards and house carls, 
before a very worried-looking priest. What do you think you are doing, bringing armed men to this sacred ground? The same old man I met when I first visited asks, offended. Without a care for propriety I grab the man's shoulders and stare him down we need to enter the damn catacombs now old man or the entire city is fucked. I can't just let you in. He stammers. Holding back an eye roll I take a deep breath if I am wrong, may the gods strike me down, we don't have the time to bicker so, the key if you please. Now. The bearded old man stares into my eyes, looking for something, after a while he nods gravely the first time you came you did pay proper homage to the gods, and you seem burdened with purpose. He untangles himself from my grasp with a huff and waves at me to follow very well I will take your oath seriously. He lets us in and shows us the way to the entrance of the catacombs. If you truly are right and the city is in danger, then may R.K. sharpen your blades and Stendar embolden your shields. The priest prays as we descend, as I am about to enter myself I hear him say and may kind grant your her breath. General POV The group of guards and nobles trudged through the ancient burial grounds with unease, none of them expected to be forced into a fight today especially not against a foe this daunting. Eric Hoor was a perfect example of this, as the twitching Nord Thane made sure to place himself in the rear of the formation, even behind his pet mage, and armed his shaky hands with an expensive-looking crossbow, made more for decoration than combat. Bryling was another story, she bravely and boldly walked at the spear tip, followed by her own house Carls who, much like her, were armed with grim determination and heirloom blades. The two court mages and palace steward were busy looking at the map and directing the formation toward the correct tomb from its center, one mistake here and they could get lost for days. After almost an hour of uncomfortable silence and shifting tunnels, they found themselves before an iron door, engraved upon it was a crowned wolf, bearing the symbol of the Septim dynasty. This is definitely the place Revine muttered even without the iconography, the aura practically screams big bad lich bitch. Eric Hoor shifts uncomfortably and hisses are you sure you should be joking right now, she could hear us. Revine lets out a hollow laugh my good man, I just stabbed the madwoman with Meridia's sword, if she needed a reason to be angry at me it surely wouldn't be a bit of mockery. Oh. A tale worthy of song, if true. Bryling says, doubt lacing her words. As Revine is pushing the doors apart he shrugs well to be fair. Good old Savos did batter her and practically throw me at her, but I did end up stabbing her so it counts. Before she could comment, and the moment he opened the door a wave of dread spread among them, it wasn't a spell or a curse, just the pure feeling of death and power waiting inside. With false cheer Revine clapped his hands well ladies and gentlemen, time to die a horrible death. And with a cackle rushed into the damned tomb, leaving behind a bunch of scared Nords. Sybil rolled her eyes and followed him while muttering that damned boy will be the death of me. The rest were stunned by the mage's nonchalance, but quickly collected themselves and rushed in. Revine's POV. Whew, if I wasn't about to be buried down here and have my corpse molested in all manner of uncomfortable ways I would consider the place to be beautiful. White marble all the way holding statues and engravings of past deeds and accomplishments, even a plaque begging the gods' forgiveness for the queen's deeds. I do slow down for the rest to catch up, going in alone is idiocy. As we go deeper, the marble halls make way for grey stone, slowly shifting from a work of art to a classic Nordic burial ground. And as the look shifts, so does the magic, and the moment I stepped into the next level a wave of necromantic magic exploded and we were met with the growls of Dragr. Here we go again. Chapter 100, Chapter XLI, Defiance Not long after the deathly growling started, the first drag made its appearance. Unlike the previous ones I fought in other burial grounds, these wore armor in an older yet still recognizable imperial style, embossed with septum iconography much like the tomb's entrance. I was not left with much time to ponder the artistic taste of my enemy as mere seconds after the rest of my party entered the lower tomb dozens of the damned things charged at us. With a furious battle cry, Bryling led the countercharge, followed by her house Carls and the palace guard, their enchanted weapons doing considerable damage to the horde. 
The rest chose to provide ranged support, as one would expect from Arakura's goons. Seeing as the Dragor were handily being dealt with by our companions, Sibyl and I chose to conserve our strength for the moment and merely launched a fire or sun bolt here and there when our formation was put under pressure. As we followed the winding paths, covered in some very annoying and potentially deadly traps, the constant assault started taking its toll on our group. Three palace guards and two housecarls lost their lives on the way, and I was forced to start providing greater support, while Sybil was focusing on healing the wounded. The closer we got to our goal, the more oppressive the atmosphere became, and the more powerful our enemies. Thankfully there were no tongues waiting inside, as during the period in which they lived the way of the voice was very much a thing, otherwise we would have been neck deep in shit by now. We reached a sealed gateway controlled by different levers and decided that we would be taking a break here, as everyone was dead tired by now. As everyone slumped down I summoned up a bunch of the lesser potions I had with me like the damn hoarder I was, and offered them to those most in need. Just as I was about to sit down and relax myself, a loud, cold chuckle reverberated throughout the tomb foolish mortals, so swift to rush to their deaths. The voice sounded amused. I then felt the presence focus on me tell me little godling, what reason doth thou rush so boldly to fight for these fools? Leave them behind and swear thine self into my service, and I shall forgive thine earlier transgressions against me. As some very confused stares find their way to me I scoff and roll my eyes you just had to fucking say it. Why deny what thou are? Potma tittered why settle for serving those so far below thee? A hollow laugh left my throat without any prompting from me so you see yourself as above me then? A mere lich? Don't make me laugh. Thou did not deny my claims. The voice echoes calmly, but this time with less patience. I raise a middle finger in the general direction of where I presume the deeper tomb is now listen here you damn bitch queen, I know how these things go so stop your damnable chittering and let me rest before I am nice and ready to skewer you once more. I feel her growl more than I hear it thou would deny thyself mine power over a temper tantrum. What childishness! I now openly laugh at her as a fury that was not mine seems to overcome me for a moment what a grand and intoxicating innocence. Deny myself your power? I spit upon any false power that you might offer Spectre. Now be gone to your hole and wait for your end like a good little dog. There is an explosion of power as something attempts to pierce my mind, but I have long since trained myself to fight against such things and repel it with ease. After a final thou shalt regret thine words soon mortal. Potma retreats to her sanctum. During my rant, I seem to have stood in front of the sealed passage and have been yelling at the stone like some kind of loon. Without turning around I scratch my chin in thought well if she is trying to buy me with promises of power it means she is desperate, good. I turn back to the rest and see them all staring at me with a mix of awe and confusion. What? I ask dumbly. Sybil laughs but doesn't comment. Bryling on the other hand gives me an approving nod you are either the bravest or stupidest mare I have ever met. Ingvar Firebeard however seems to be stuck on something else he heard, he stares at me with some suspicion she called you a godling? Why? I wave him off if I wanted such things to be known, they would be. He grunts I am pretty damn sure that we deserve to know who exactly we are fighting with if we are to do this. No. I am pretty damn sure that you do not. I say firmly all you need to know is that I am a powerful mage, anything else is private and I am under no obligation to explain myself. In an attempt to no doubt force me to explain myself, he gives me a firm stare and says the king will hear of this. I snort at his attempt and shrug my shoulders and when he learns the truth he will no doubt agree that such things are to be kept private. I turn to the rest now if no one else is about to question me about my family line or threaten me with snitching while we are neck deep in drag or, we really should move on. There is some grumbling, but they all know we are here for more important things and after checking everyone for wounds one last time we activate the levers and step deeper into the catacomb. The halls that follow the sealed passage are eerily empty, for what felt like minutes there were no signs of drag or, merely carved halls leading deeper inside and with every step we took the presence pressed down harder and harder. As we passed through one last door, 
the feeling of foreboding reached a crescendo, and the sounds of multiple coffin lids being blown off reached our ears. Inside awaited, sitting on a lavish throne a man looking old for even a vampire as that was what he obviously was. He looked at us with amusement and slowly got up, while a veritable sea of drag restarted entering the room how kind of you all to join me for evening supper. I roll my eyes really, vampire food jokes. Without a hint of offense in his tone, he chuckles hey if it works. I give him not a moment further to distract us and launch a burst of sunlight at him, but as expected he dodges near instantly. There is a moment of tense silence as our two forces stare each other down and then with a load roar from one of the more powerful drag where the silence is broken and the messy battle begins. The fight starts off well in our favor, as the men that came with me were without any doubt elite warriors, Sybil is able to hold back the vampire with her own improved power and we start methodically cutting through the defenders. Just when I am about to relax my strained mind, like some cosmic force was waiting for it, an orb of blue light bursts above the undead and the foes we put down start slowly raising up again. Potma's voice echoes once more none can pass through mine inner circle, thou have all come here to die. Before panic can spread through the Nords I yell while channeling a bit of my Thursday um don't listen to her. She must be using a lot of power to bring them back. This seems to thankfully embolden them enough not to immediately break. The grind continues, and I see a couple of palace guards fall, no doubt getting caught off guard due to the exhaustion that was setting in. I knew that we would never be able to outlast a force of the dead, endless endurance is their greatest advantage after all. So the time came for stupid decisions. I turn to Sybil and yell I am going to cut off the head, you protect the rest. And before she could even protest I levitate above the formation, swatting away a couple of rogue arrows with my constantly active wind cloak and look to the gate leading to Potma's chamber. I take a deep, calming breath and shout wood. Launching myself across the battlefield. As I cross the precipice to Potma's sanctum, the sound of battle quietens down. In front of me is an opulent throne made of stone and bones, and sitting upon it a dark purple specter bearing a crown and wielding a staff. Potma stares at me for a while in silence I see that thou hast chosen to sacrifice thine companions to slay me then. Oh come off it bitch queen! I retort immediately and venomously no one is buying into your royal vs and thou s act, now as I said be a good little dog and die for me. And without waiting for a response I start barraging her with solar magic while summoning Scorch. The royal specter growls in irritation and starts swatting away my spells, but her power is greatly diminished from when she fought Savos and I stabbed her with the ultimate weapon of undead slaying, so even now she seems to falter. A couple of soul cairn mist creatures get summoned but Scorch turns them to ash with gusto, all while laughing maniacally and for some reason imitating a chicken. He really needs some friends. I deflect an ice storm thrown by Potma and with a wood. Appear next to her with an unsheathed, and loudly screaming, Don Breaker aiming for her head. But foolish I was to expect I could outdo a septum with the voice, as she whispers out tired and deftly dodges my attack. Before I can even react she shouts fuss. At me, sending me flying into a wall and swinging her own spiked staff for my head. As the spike is about to pierce my left eye I pull myself downwards with telekinesis, her surprisingly firm weapon cutting my ebony mask apart and leaving a long gash across the left side of my face, but thankfully not reaching its original target. Before she can pull back I take the opportunity, and with all considerable strength boosted by a rapid and costly cast of giant's might, ram Don Breaker into where her heart should be. She screams in unimaginable pain and her spectral form erupts with magical power, leaving only her crowned skull on the ground. I quickly down a healing potion just in case and go to destroy the skull and finish this, but an odd feeling stops me. Her soul is still inside. I could make something ridiculous with it. I drop Dawn Breaker on the ground like the piece of cursed junk that it was and immediately pull out my carving knife and start drawing containment runes. Her soul screams in pain, but I have no qualms torturing creatures like these, so after a minute of some very careful bonework I have in my hands an item of such great power, kings and emperors would kill for it. Dread soul, a potent soul with a hint of draconic power, 
stronger than any black soul gem and almost truly permanent in its application. I pocket the desecrated skull, only to note that I am no longer in the burial ground but standing once more in Meridia's projection. The Lady of Life stares at me judgingly, fury practically radiating off her form what are you doing with that soul? I tilt my head taking it for my use of course. She grabs the edge of her throne in anger that soul is meant to be mine. Unleash my blade upon it now. This damn bitch, you know what? I am done. A cruel smile spreads on my face no, I don't think I will. Sybil's POV As the undead all fall to the ground with their strings cut and Potma no doubt killed for good, I rush into her chamber while paying no mind to the celebrating Nords. The moment I enter I once again find myself bewitched by Meridia's projection. I find her grasping her throne while glaring at a Revine, who is smiling at her mockingly. He spits on Meridia's marbled floor when I first came to you I came with honest desire to work with you, but no. You just had to play your damned games with me. He kicks Don Breaker toward her well I am done playing. Take your damned sword and shove it where your sun doesn't shine. The impotent Didra, for they cannot ever cause harm in these projections due to Martin Septim's sacrifice, seethes in fury and turns to me you. Slay this insolent fool now and I will grant you the perfect immortality you desire. I feel Don Breaker slide into my hands of its own volition and turn to Revine who is still smiling mockingly at Meridia. The thoughts of what it would feel to be truly alive again assault my mind unbidden, to feel the sun on my skin once more without being stung by it, to not need to feed on the life force of others. Maybe. I look to Revine who has by now turned to me, he doesn't say anything just continues smiling mockingly while now pointing his open army to Meridia, almost as if that itself was the joke. God's fucking damn it! With a deep sigh I look to Meridia who is staring at me expectantly, and with venom in my voice I say first it was B.A.L., and now you. Truly you are no better than the rapist himself. And with all my might I hurl the sword that singed my hand halfway through my words, at the now seething Didra. She grabs it without issue and it disappears. Meridia stares at us both and her presence starts pressing down on our very souls I will remember this betrayal mortals. My servants will hunt you down and you will fear my name. The presence becomes overwhelming as she continues seething and when I finally have your souls in my hands you will beg for a release that will never come. Her fury reaches its peak as her true power starts seeping into the world, I feel my skin starting to burn and Revine does as well if his smoking form and pained grunting is anything to go by, but by the covenant of Akatosha Didra cannot enter Nirn and Meridia is banished back into her domain. Finally, with a flash of light I find myself back on Tamriel, and standing in front of a madly cackling Revine holding some kind of tome in one hand, and the bound skull of Potma in the other.